Just a few months ago, we were crowning our 2022 world champion in Atlanta, Georgia. From one end of the U.S. to the other, the Brawlhalla team is hitting some waves this weekend in San Diego, California, kicking off our Season 8 roadmap. 150-plus competitors are here, ready to duke it out for their shot at an awesome trophy, bragging rights, and, of course, their take of the $70,000 prize pool up for grabs. Welcome, everyone. My name is Wynn Ann, better known as White Sheepy, and I'll be your host this weekend as we bring you all the crazy and intense Brahalla action live. Um, so, um, I can't do this alone. I mean, well, I could. I guess I could do it alone. But wait, you, know, I, you guys wouldn't really have anything to do here. So let me welcome Sparky the Legend, Duke the Wise. Guys, <laughs> we made San Diego, California, how are you guys feeling? Uh, you know, it's been a blast. Of course, we got here early, got to experience some nice San Diego action, got to enjoy that weather, eat some great food. Yeah. And then, of course, come here and see the competition, see these players come out, already seeing some upsets happen. Again, it's always great when we get to come together in person, meet these players, and just chat with them and say, like, hey, how are you feeling? How's things going? What's something cool that's been going on in your life? It's a, a wild ride because, again, I'm still, like, very new to this, and someone coming up and asking <laughs> for my picture still just, like, makes me go, like, what? I'm just a guy. Like, are you sure yeah. you got the right person? Reason. Um, so that's always a, a really fun time. I'm really glad that now, given that this is an open LAN tournament in-person event, now we're kind of seeing essentially the iteration that we're going to do throughout the rest of the season where we have our seasonal championships that exist online. That feeds into who gets to go to the seasonal royale, which is an invitational only in-person event. And then now we have our open tournament. So we have like each phase of the Brawlhalla competitive season and all the variations that those have with the onlines to the in-person invitationals and now to the open event that you at home could be here doing. So you better come out <laughs> to the other events that are just like that, the rest that happened this year. This is a really special event. I'm really excited for it because it's the first one and it's open so we get to see everybody. Well, let's honestly, let's just right, let's get right into it. Let's talk about it. Let's take a look at our schedule for this weekend. So starting off today, we got our doubles competition and then we'll see more doubles tomorrow on Saturday, but we'll also actually get to see some singles action as well. And then, of course, wrap it up this weekend with Championship Sunday, seeing our top eight for both singles and doubles. So that's what this weekend is looking like, boys. It's going to be a busy weekend. We've got jam packed things going on. Um, but not only do we got some jam pack, action pack, tournament, Brawlhalla players going at it, let's talk about some exclusive stuff we got going on as far as merch goes. Guys, yes, we got some merch. We've got even more merch here. So live right now on Brawlhalla.com, you can grab an exclusive San Diego t-shirt or hoodie to remember the event. So. You know, be sure to support your favorite game and grab yours before they go away because this is exclusive, exclusive for this event. Um, and, oh, also some nice news here. Of course, for our international family, our partners have released a new update giving out those outside the U.S. the ability to get shipping at a flat rate No way. Cost. That's huge. Yes way. Yes, wait. So you know what? Scan that QR code right now. You see it on the screen. Hurry, hurry before it goes away so that you can grab this exclusive DreamHack San Diego um, merch for, for the Brahalla event, all right? Um, so talking about the action, talking about the tournament, let's talk about the prize pool and how things are shaping up here, how it's all going to be split out here. Um, so it's going to be, a, of course, a total of $70,000 between doubles and singles. But here uh, for the top 32 earnings, you can see first place here for, for doubles. Like, what is that? Nine, nice excuse me, $9,000. That's a, a deposit for a very nice <laughs> car. Okay. 
Um, and then you can see we go all the way down to 25th place. Yeah. So the, the, the prize pool payout is grand and big, and it goes all the way down to yep. top 25 so here. So if you make it into top 32, you essentially got your DreamHack ticket paid for. Yeah. Definitely definitely nice. And of course, that's only for doubles. We got singles yes. tomorrow as well. So lots of opportunities to get a nice chunk of change, get some, some pocket change. Maybe you can get at least a meal paid for if you're uh, strong enough to get into the top 32. Hey, there's nothing wrong with getting your meal paid for. Like, Dude, you come I love out a here. free meal. I'm not going to complain about free meal. Right? Yeah, I'm just saying. There's nothing wrong with a free meal. That is totally okay here. Um, I actually want to also kind of take a look at, like, just a, a roadmap of, like, all the things that we've done so far for year eight of Rahala Esports. I mean, starting in, in February, we started with the Winter Championship. And then look at all the different things we've done for now. We got the Winter Royale, the Spring Championship. That, that was not even too long ago. That was literally a couple last weeks weekend. ago. That was last week. <laughs> last weekend. Yeah, I'm yeah, sorry. Last week yeah. And, and the weekend and before. The weekend. You're also correct. I'm correct. You're like, correct. It was the weekend before as well. And then here we are. The first open LAN event in the West Coast, DreamHack San Diego. So, I mean, some of our players have definitely gone through this little journey here with us, and there's still so much more to come, as you can see, all the way up until PCX in November. Uh, so that's exciting. Uh, you know, let's kind of talk a little bit about um, some of the players that we actually can see here today okay. who have been, you know, Doing all these different, doing they've been doing all these different they've championships the and royales, and they are here live right now. Yeah, literally in the pools yeah. playing here. Um, let's actually first uh, talk about one of EU's. I, I definitely think one of EU's very long-standing, strong teams. Uh, Duke, tell me about Acno and Blaze. Okay, Acno and Blaze, definitely a, a well-known team. If you've been watching Brawlhalla Esports, you know this EU team. One of only two European teams to ever go home with a gold medal over North Americans. That was at DreamHack Rotterdam yes. in 2019. Yes. Is that right? Um, and so definitely a very well-established team. And again, one of the longest standing teams as well. Huge pedigree on this team, but also coming in here, not the favorites of the European region. They've, had, they've struggled a little bit inside the European region, but still, just the fact of the matter is they have that pedigree, they have that experience, they have LAN experience, which is something that not a lot of these players have to date. So definitely a team to watch out for. They're feeling very comfortable. I talked to Akno uh, right outside of the restroom earlier today, and he said that this tourney is kind of looking free. Those are his oh. exact Ooh. words. Oh my gosh. Okay. He said okay. that NA is not looking that strong, and that's when I told him, yeah, but like, look at Luna at the Winter Royale. Started off a little bit shaky, and mm -hmm. didn't seem like the man was going to do it again. But then, of course, NA always wakes up, and it, Luna did it again as the representative for NA at the Winter Royale. I think that could be something here, but I do like seeing Akno and Blaze coming into this very confident, because they kind of played second fiddle to Godly and Fozy for a minute now. Yeah, and I'm I'm just looking at their stats here. I mean, you you can't deny like they are such a strong team and have been for quite some time. I mean, they they've been around. I mean, look at all these different placements and things like that. Uh, but moving on, I want to go across to North America now. Probably one of my favorite teams I'm looking out for here. Um, but Sparky, I want to know what your thoughts are about the legendary names of Boomy and Sandstorm. So Boomy and Sandstorm were not able to play in the spring championship for doubles just a week ago because Sandstorm was sick. He has since gotten over that sickness. He's feeling better. He's here. And uh, as you may see me mention later, I think there is a real chance for Boomy and Sandstorm to place really well. But one of the problems is going to be in the top 32, they're going to run into Godly and Fozy very early on in that bracket. So that's going to be essentially possibly a grand final caliber match that early in top 32, which means one of those two teams has to go down into the elimination bracket after that, which means there is a potential, honestly, for either team, but we're talking about Boomy and Sandstorm here, to make that elimination bracket run, but it's going to be a long one. Going down in like round one of top 32 means you got to go through a lot on the bottom side of the bracket. Who's going to be the best at that? That's going to be Boomy and Sandstorm. They have the endurance. They have all of the experience from all of the tournaments that they've won. One of the best, if not the best 2v2 team that we have ever seen pick up the sticks in Brawlhalla. You can never count this team out unless they happen to get sick and get dq out <laughs> of the tournament. Like, that's the only time when it's okay to count them out. I mean, yeah, I, I, I want to see how far Booming and Sandstorm 
go. But this next group of players here, you can't forget, because I feel like sometimes we do tend to forget. We don't mention them enough, but these guys are up and coming North American players. Made and experienced. Duke, how do you feel about them? Made and experienced coming hot off the win in the Spring Championship just one weekend ago, beating out one of the more uh, favored teams here, like Luna and Snowy. Definitely a very strong team. One of those teams that I think has a lot of fire underneath them. Really young guys, uh, kind of burst out onto the scene, winning in the mid-season Invitational continued to do relatively well, but haven't seen that gold medal until the spring championship just one weekend ago. But that's a really recent win, and that's a really nice win for this team. But I mentioned the fact that they're really young because I think there's a lot of emotions that run really high for this team. Uh, I see very frequently the tweets come out from experience where he's talking about how people kind of downplay them. They talk about how they haven't been doing very well for themselves or like people think they fell off because they got one gold medal and then didn't continue to get those gold medals. But still a really strong team, one of those teams that you got to keep your eyes on because they have that power to kind of sneak by a lot of other people. One thing that's really going to help them for this tournament is they're coming in at seed number three and that's due largely in fact to them winning the spring championships just a week ago. If take spring championships out of the equation and look at what they did at Winters, they were seventh. They were barely inside top eight. So if they came into this without spring championships, their seed would be knocked down seriously when you bring in all of the other regions and all of the other teams. So them being able to kind of slide in here last minute, seed number three is gonna be huge for them in bracket. Yeah, I can't, I, that's a great spot to be in. Now I'm gonna jump back to over the pond to EU here and talk about some of some, some OGs here. Definitely this name has been around for quite some time as well. Uh, Sparky, I want to know your thoughts on, on Heisen and Simple. Heisen and Simple, it always seems like they surprise me. They're right there. Hey, what's up, guys? Oh, <laughs> I'm waving at Heisen right now. Simple. <laughs> he he's heard not his name attention. and started walking over like, hey, yeah, what are you going to say about me? They're a really interesting team because like they were like one of the main teams in EU. They were like a top two or top three team. And then they kind of took a step back for a little while, weren't placing as well. But all of a sudden here recently, if we look at the Autumn Championship at the end of last year, fourth place in that. If we look at uh, the Winter Championship, third place this year. And then even if we look at Springs, like they didn't top three, but they still got fifth place. So they still show themselves as a serious threat as a team, even though we aren't necessarily always talking about Heisen and Simple anymore. Yeah, it's it's fascinating to me because I feel like there's so much potential within this team, but it doesn't always come to fruition. It's one of those things where it's like, because they're in such an incredibly uh, skill-dense region like EU, where there's so many strong 2v2 teams, that you're comparing them to the likes of Akno and Blaze or Godly and Fozzy, and you're like, well, they don't always stack up the same way. So people kind of underthink about Heisen and Simple in a lot of ways in that regard. Yeah, they are definitely a threat that I think players should be definitely looking out for today. All right. Now, I'm actually going to go back to you, Sparky, um, about this next EU team because they are definitely looking good. They are up and coming. I'm also really hyped to see how they do. It's Godly and Fozy. They're going to be coming into this one number two seed right behind Luna and Snowy. They feel confident that they're going to come out on top with this tournament. I would not be surprised if that happened. I asked Godly, how are you doing today? He said, I'm doing good. I'm going to play well today. And I said, okay, how are you going to play tomorrow? He said, I'm going to succeed tomorrow. And I said, all right, what about Sunday? He said he's going to succeed on Sunday. That's all three days. He was very confident at the Winter Royale and didn't quite end up placing where everyone expected him to place. So I think he's coming into this one Again, with a chip on his shoulder, I think he wants to prove that he is a top player, if not the top player in all of Brawlhalla, and I hope he can do it this weekend, because I know it's around the corner. Yeah, definitely a strong team. I think a, a lot of people have kind of realized Fozy is one of the best 2v2ers in the European region. You put him up alongside someone like Godly, who is one of the best in the region, period. And you have this really strong team that has shown a lot of potential. And the fact of the matter is, they're the only team that's still together that got the farthest in the World Championship. They got second place at the World Championship and they're still together because the first place team split up. So there's a lot of potential here on this team of Godly and Bozy and it helps that they're sticking together. Well, the thing is that this next group of players we're gonna be talking about, I'm actually gonna give it to you, Duke, because I know you're a big fan of one of these people here. It's gonna be I like Luna. Both. I know you like them both, but I know you're a huge <laughs> Luna fan. So tell me about Luna and Snowy. 
Yeah, uh, again, uh, some monster players. It's so fascinating because, again, Snowy and Boomy are the ones that won the World Championship, and then they're like, all right, peace, we're not going to work together. Instead, it became this team of Boomy and Sandstorm and Luna and Snowy, and Luna and Snowy ended up looking really strong again. They won in the uh, Winter Championship, and they're coming in here hot. They're just, they're just looking so stinking good. You can't go wrong when you got someone like Luna on a team. Of course, he's been amazing in the 1v1 space for North America. Then he's doing well in 2v2s, and then you put him alongside Snowy, who's been looking amazing. His Onyx has been looking so solid. He's been doing so much work, and he's able to kind of shoulder those burdens sometimes because uh, you love a good team where each person can kind of take the reins and be that kind of carry force. And a lot of times people look at Luna and be like, okay, well, you're amazing 1v1s. We'll just keep eyes on you. But then Snowy will like sneak off and just like 1v1 someone and just completely demolish them and be like, oh, my bad. I was looking at Luna. So you talked about the World Championship winning team. Of course, you're talking about Boomy and Snowy breaking up and then Luna and Snowy getting together as a team. They've only played six tournaments together, four of which they have won. Four of them with gold medals. The other two, Moose Wars, King's Crusade was a third place. And then, of course, the North American Spring Championship just a week ago in second place. So that's a pretty good record. It's not quite that strong in official tournaments, at least in terms of getting that actual gold medal rather than just top three. But still, a lot of people's eyes are going to be on Luna and Snowy to possibly come out on top. I think most people would put them either first or second with the majority of people putting them first. Wow. All right. I mean, hey, that's legit and that's very valid. Now, one last team. I want to highlight here with you guys, um, and I'm going to give it to Sparky here. Um, tell me about this team, Meg D and Radish. I never know how to feel about them. <laughs> I'm, I'm just, I'm just going to be very honest, because if we look at their placements, like they haven't even really been playing together as a twos team that long. If we look at them in Spring Championship, they're fifth. So they're outside of top three. Right before that, Moose Wars, King's Crusade, fifth outside of the top three. At the Winter Championship, they're ninth. They're outside of the top eight in that one. Then if you look at the World Championship, they were 17th. So I'm going backwards in time, so you could look at that in one way, if we're, if, we're, if we're being optimist here, see, it's trending downwards. It's getting better. It's going from 17th all the way to 5th, and now if we're at DreamHack San Diego, we could see them break into that top three. But I just really never know how to feel about Meg D and Radish as a team. They're always a big question mark to me. I think one of the things that makes them such an important talking point coming into today is the plays that Meg D was making last weekend in the spring double space literally made it so that the three of us who were on the desk talking about them were like, all right, Meg D might legitimately be the best 2v2 we're playing today. And that, the fact of the matter is Meg D is playing 2v2 in a way that he has not been playing in the past, and that bodes really, really well. The question mark for this team for me is Radish, because Radish is playing 2v2s the way that he's consistently been doing, and he's not really playing alongside Meg D, but Meg D is just like sheer power as a 2v2 player, I think is starting to come through. And the fact of, them, uh, the fact of it is, he did well in 2v2s, he did well in 1v1s, got his spot in the Spring Royale. So I'm looking forward to seeing what this team can do, personally. Now, I didn't realize this, but we actually got one more team to look at here, and that's my bad. But this <laughs> last team, uh, I hey, I want Duke, your opinion about Pugsy and Blazy teaming up and how they're going to do. I'm going to say something really mean. And oh, it's, um, come on, man. Oh, yeah. come on, they're, man. they're already in the elimination side of things. They're struggling a little bit. Um, I, I think it, it's, it's fascinating in the way that, like, Pugsy and Luna were such a strong team in North America, and then Luna teamed up with Snowy, and you're like, okay, that makes a lot of sense. But then Pugsy kind of got left on the wayside. Like, I didn't see any other strong North Americans, like, chomping at the bit to team up with Pugsy, which is really uh, a weird thing, because, uh, again, I, they've shown how strong of uh, players they can both be in their own right. Uh, but this is a really interesting team of Pugsy and Blazy because I, I personally haven't seen too much of it. I don't know how strong it's going to be once they start playing together. And right now it's not looking too hot because, again, they, they already took an L to what was XJ, Cool J, and, and Demir, I think, and are in the elimination side of things. So if there is any tournament for Blazy to come out here and pop off, it's going to be DreamHack San Diego because he's a U.S. West player. So normally tournaments are played mostly unless, like, both – uh, players agree to play on US West, it's played on US East. So he's having to deal with that lag that just comes from any generic online play. That's totally normal. But here on LAN, one, it's kind of in his home turf. I don't know exactly where he's from, but at least he's a West Coaster. So the fact that he is going to be playing here on LAN, 
He's been a longtime player, so he probably has a relationship with Pugsy like most longtime players do. There's probably some solid chemistry there. I look forward to seeing what this team has. I don't think they are going to be the ones at the end of the day on the podium, but I think there is a good chance that they could shock a lot of teams going into this one, especially if you find yourself down in the elimination bracket early alongside them and think like, okay, well, you know, I'll have a few rounds that I can cruise through while, uh, with the rest of the other like players who are going to go one and two, maybe two and two in this tournament. I think Pugsy and Blazy, they have a real shot at upsetting some serious teams who maybe make a mistake and go down too early. Wow, yeah, that, now that you put it that way, you paint that picture and I'm like, oh my goodness, yeah, there's some things at stake here. All right, y'all, so we've heard about the players and I know we're excited to see them show up and show off this weekend, but now let's hear what you guys think about your favorites to win. We gotta talk about predictions, come on, y'all. So. Um, Duke, I want to know what are your predictions first. Okay, um, uh, in third place, I'm putting Made in Experience. Again, really strong team. I think one of the things that bodes really well for them is their path through the bracket. Um, it, it it's going against a lot of international teams. They, I think they're running into more South American teams than anyone else. Which, again, South American two v twos is it's, it's in a weird space that you don't see do as well. Like just in terms of like performance, you don't see too many South American 2v2 teams go that far. One of them in particular uh, did well at the mid-season Invitational, but guess what team beat them? Made an experience. So I gotta get them up there in the third place spot. The only reason why they're so far down on third, uh, to third is because they're behind Godly Fossey. Again, one of the best teams in EU. An absolutely monster team. And I can't, lit I literally cannot. It's like a curse. I can't not put Luna in the top. So Luna Snow, <laughs> I gotta put him in that gold place spot. Again, a really strong team. Uh, very fascinating to see how everyone's gonna do today, because again, it is uh, a a land event and you never know what's going to happen. My third place, my bronze medal is going to be Fiend and West. I think South America is going to go home with the bronze medal for this tournament. I think the strongest South American team here, even though I'm a kind of fan, I think it's still going to be West and Fiend. That's the gruesome twosome. In second place, I am putting EU, their greatest, their strongest team, Godly and Fozy. And then in first place, I'm going to agree with you. I'm going to put Luna and Snowy there as well. I think they have the strongest chance in my eyes of taking home the gold medal here. Snowy seems confident, Luna seems confident, Godly seems confident, and Fozy seems confident as well. So we'll see if that ends up coalescing into a grand finals between those two teams. But my predictions have the like top three most competitive regions, one from each, South America, EU, and North America. Well, that is, I mean, I feel like y'all's predictions are like, so different yet so similar. I mean, you guys have made some good points and uh, I also want to make sure that chat, y'all get a chance to get your predictions out there. You know, you can vote in the channel, you can tweet at us, whatever. Uh, hashtag BAG Sports. I mean, BAG hey, Sports. hey, we want to know your predictions as well. And then as for me, of course, I think a lot of people might know that I'm a very big Boomy fan. So I got, <laughs> I've just, that's my first place. That's it. That's that's it. I'm, my sights are set. Okay. <laughs> That's it. That's all we need to know anyways. So, okay. We got a lot of things going on. We got a crazy weekend we have in store here. So we're just moments away from kicking off our first open LAN of the season. Kicking things with, I think, our first match is going to be Murr and Perplexity versus Mitchell and Sandwick. Ooh. Ooh. Sandwich. Sandwich. That's, that's gonna, yeah, that's sandwich. Sand, I think it's the sandwich that we know and love that helps us with these productions yeah. sometimes. Yeah, but that will be our first match. So the stage is set. The players are gearing up. And when we come back from a very quick break here, uh, we're going to have Taza and Duke uh, right here calling the action. So stick with us. We'll be right back.
What is up, y'all? It is now time for the action to kick off. Of course, it's DreamHack San Diego. Doubles action is already underway. Taza, you were talking about it right before, uh, well, I guess during the break. There's already some upsets that are happening as well within today. Yeah, uh, the double scene here is particularly interesting because we have basically the amount of players from Europe and South America that could make it. And so we get some interesting pairings, right? We got Faze on and Use that are teaming together. And then XJ Cool J, who had his teammate of Pavelski, is not here. So he's teaming with somebody else, and yet still making up sets like over teams like Pugsy and Blazy. So the top three two that we're going to be getting into here really soon is going to be really awesome. Yeah, it's going to be good. Again, we're just starting off with a pools match, and then we're going to get into some of that top 32 action. So we still got to find out who's going to get into that top 32. I believe we're kicking it off with Marilene and Perplexity, and they're going up against... Oh, I believe it was Sandwick. Oh, yeah, it's yeah, Sandwick. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Sandwick. He ended up winning at game five. So we're going to be having Sandwick up. So just Sandwick does so many awesome things for Mahal <laughs> yeah, in general. Right? And we don't really get to see him on stream too much, even though his placements have been getting better and better, like... Actually, Samwick's been on the grind in both ones and in twos. And he's going to be teaming with Mitchell here to go up against Marilene and Perplexity. Uh, and like you said, this is the uh, one of the finals pool matches out of the lower rounds of pools to make it into top 32. So this is going to be a really interesting best of five. Ooh, and also looking at some of these flags here, we've got some international teaming. We've got Marilyn coming in with that, jo uh, sorry, Germany flag, uh, and then going up alongside Perplexity with that, of course, American flag. Then on the other side, Sandwick with the American flag, Mitchell with the Canadian flag. So we've got a lot of international representation in there. Uh, we see four people. I know the bottom left one is Sandwick. Yeah, and I think that the way the guys that, um I'm pretty sure if they're facing the same direction on the same team. So I think in the top left, they might be Mitchell, but I don't even actually met uh, okay. the players yet. You know, that makes a lot of sense because I yeah. think the top right guy yeah, is yeah, like yeah, yeah. teaming like head -head. with the guy underneath him. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. that's Mitchell top left, Sandwick bottom left. Yeah, and then Marilene and Perplexity on the right. Yes. There we go. All right, I'm excited to see what this match is going to turn out. I know that Sandwick's a big fan of Scythe and Guitars, but I'm not really sure what he's playing in twos because whenever you talk about either one of those weapons, and twos typically it's just not really played unless it's like played by people who main the weapons themselves. So this is really exciting. And it's been a bit since we've um it's been I guess since BCX, but like we it's a bit. It, 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 in online championships uh -huh. or at Royales, mm -hmm. sure. we're kind of already skipping right ahead into the top three and two into the top eight. Yeah. So we don't get these pools experience matches like we're getting right now. It's like one of my favorite parts of lands. Like we we're, we're going live now. Um, uh, here, at least in, in, on the West Coast, so the left is 3 p.m. Pacific time. Um, but the tournament has been running for a few hours now, yeah. and we've been going through a lot of different pools, and players have been fighting their hearts out in all these best of fives. And it has been so awesome to watch. It's been um, super cool. I mean, I even, like, I, I walked through uh, kind of our, our section a little while ago, and there's people already doing that whole thing of, like, crowding up behind people because they want to see their favorite players, see how well they do. But we're getting into it, and like you said, Sandwick's going to be on some guitars. He's got the Lucian pick, Mitchell over to the Nash. That's that Shovel Knight crossover. And then Perplexity on the Zariel, and I think that's Mayor Lean onto the Sidra. Yeah, already opening up right here uh, with two side lights coming out from Sandwick and this best of five coming out through here. So nice job for Marilene getting the combo, hitting his Whoa. teammate with the anchor. Actually, that went from like acceptable friendly fire to <laughs> some really, uh, really tough damage there. And the blue team's actually taking a uh, advantage of uh -oh. that. Oh, wasn't ready for the team combo there, but Perplexity with a nice turnaround gets that side sig to take down Mitchell and Sandwick gets disarmed by that uppercut coming out from Perplexity. Blue team, they had some great damage built up, but they just haven't been able to finish off these stocks this red team just yet. Yeah, there goes the recovery. Sandwick off the top. Red team, despite that friendly fire, we have still with the anchor coming out from the Citra, uh, has managed to bring it back, taking the lead here. And like you said, the blue team can't get some stocks. That down six. Oh, the save! That, that, that was a incredible save opening up here. And that neutral six, not even enough to take down Merlin. There, finally, the Sarah Edgar comes through. And there's a d double D-Light Cider on the left side of the stage. And we, I was talking about Sandwich's guitars play, seeing the loser come out here is really interesting to see indeed. And now, here we go. Even game on stocks with the blue team uh, hurting pretty bad. Nice yeah. team combo. <laughs> I was going to say, Mitchell definitely the most hurt one. He's getting into the orange already. But that team combo making things a little bit more doable. Instant team combo after the down six. Side sigs come out. Sandwich survives, but damage is being done. 
Yeah, perplexity going off with that ground pound there. Recovery hit uh, by Mitchell. And a deep combo setup into a dodge in read from Perplexity. Oh, Doesn't quite hit, and Sam was going for the edge guard here now. But the neutral light takes him off stage. And Mitchell's going to be careful about the 1v2. No, it's like a disjointed off stage edge guard into Perplexity holding on to the stage. Oh, there man. We go. Perplexity with the edge wow. guard. Mitchell Safe. gets taken Is out and the save off the Nair okay. Sandwick has to 1v2. Four stocks left on the red team. Blue team is struggling. Yeah, that was an impressive save. It was like a combo of the getting the chase dodge off of hitting his teammate into getting Cannon Nair and then the friendly fire not knocking him off the top. And we're still playing with that stock here uh, after that save. Really well played by the red team. Sandwick's going to try to take down the stock of Marilyn, get it to final stocks here. Sticking with those guitars. Guitars, not too many long active frame things, but here's the side. Oh. Doesn't hit it! I don't know if that was the timing or the spacing there. On that it looked like spacing. Right yeah. All uh -oh. the, the downlight recovery off of the bow side light was pretty impressive, though. And Sam with the recovery. That's two stocks that he's got okay. here on this one stock and this 1v2, but uh, he's got to play perfectly. He's not going to hit by two players, <laughs> yeah. and that cannonball hit him in the face is not a great start. Blasters, they tend to struggle in this 1v2. He's likely going to be looking yeah. for an opportunity to swap off. It has to dip low here, but Marilene's down there. That dare puts him into the red. Sandwick running out of life to play with. Yeah, there's very few moves uh, that Blasters can use. Nice finish there from Complexity. Uh, that won't lock you in place. Like, you use Blasters down air when falling. Mm -hmm. Well, now you have to wait for that animation. Neutralize the same case. Down light. You don't even have to hit it to be stuck in the animation in that case. So it can be really difficult to play with that weapon. Guitar is a big You don't really get to choose what weapon you play with in the 1v2. You're kind of just happy that you have one yeah. at all. It's better to have a weapon than no weapon, although I don't know if that's always true. But, man, that edge guard from Perplexity really set the tone and gave them such a massive lead. Uh, I'm curious what the blue team is going to adjust with. Oh, yeah. I mean, they might just run it back with the same exact team composition, same map, everything like that, right? Because the beginning of that game, I don't feel like momentum was stolen away from the blue team in any dramatic way. Uh, so I'd just like to see them play that again, see if uh, they can adapt how their opponents were playing as we get into this game, too. There you see in Sandwick, very stoic. Um, surprising lack of like conversation between him and Mitchell. Like I think a lot of people in that space are like trying to talk it out and trying to be like, all right, here's what we got to do better. But they're just like, you know what, we know. It's very, I think it's very specific to the kinds of teams that you have and the play styles of the teams that you yeah. have. Like if that was Cody Faison saying right there, I absolutely could imagine Faison just like headset off, talking over to Cody for the full 30 seconds yeah. in the match. Um, but sometimes you just look at each other, you know exactly what you need to do, what you need to adjust, and you get right into the next match. You're just kind of like, okay, I see what we get up late there. Let's get into it. And they have a lead here in game number two, the blue team that is. And a D-Light recovery punish off of that gravity camp of sides like, is huge for Sandler. Yeah, unfortunately, it is Lucian, not the highest force character, but a great pickup from Mitchell after Sandwick got everybody with that side sig, and Mitchell was ready with the reaction. So blue team going to take the lead here in game number two. Yeah, really nice lead. This is what we saw the red team have in the previous game, but this time around, it's the blue team, the anchor that time, not hitting his teammate, hitting uh, Mitchell, taking him down, and now this could be a stock for perplexity. Goes for the dodge read on the recovery, doesn't hit it. Uh, let's see where the game started here. That side six is going to punish quite a bit. Sam was actually pretty uh, aware of that attack coming out now. Oh, oh no <laughs> pick up off the weapon throw, though. Just a wake up side sick. Here comes the team combo. Mitchell gets out of that one. The side air from Marilyn does not connect. Oh, and nice neutral lights. Like he gets the recovery. Clashes with the dare of the hammer from Mitchell, I think. And oh, that no. D light side air not interrupted. Didn't team combo, but you still get the damage there. It's pretty nice. And no punish coming out from Mitchell. Saw that side sick go through. Uh, Nash signatures, in this case for the Shovel Knight. Uh, so strong because of how much force Nash has. But Nash goes down after getting dunked by Zarya on that neutral signature. And they can have a team combo on Sandwich here. Blue team's not gonna stock since the very beginning. There we go. Okay, another opportunity. And yeah, Sandwich oh. gonna get the double blue team with the slight lead, but eyes are definitely on Mitchell. If Mitchell falls, Sandwick's left to that 1v2 again. Yeah, that was a really nice double knockout coming out from Sandwick on the Blasters, getting that D-Light dash to recovery so integral. And the friendly fire from Perplexity and Marilyn is actually good. It's, it's a pretty big deal here. They have this 1v2 against Mitchell, and they are taking oh, advantage oh. of it, but Perplexity a little too close on the team combo gets blasted by the cannon, giving Mitchell a, a, a second chance at his stock here. 
that is something that this red team is going to struggle with is because of course they are international they have they don't generally play with each other so they don't have the practice of a team combo the way that some of these other teams are going to have yeah you could play with each other technically but the ping difference is so big that somebody's suffering at some point yeah. in that case right so seeing them here on land environment oh! mitchell sniped out of there and sandwich stuck in a 1v2 once again much more doable than the last one but if they have their team combos on point here uh sam we could see himself going down in really that's a burn dodge fashion. nice side sig send sandwich and disarms and merlin a little bit <laughs> a, little, a little too celebratory with the friendly fire there that could, that, no. that could Dude, that's the fastest way to get your teammate over there Wait, just side sig them <laughs> yeah. Yeah, name so. a faster way to send your teammate uh, over there let them dash jump i think <laughs> pretty fast already uh neutral light and not a side sick there, although it was a good attempt. Sandwich still fighting with the guitars. And that's going to be it. Eli recovery takes him down. They go up for a 2 0 lead here in this final match in the pools. Winner of this best of five is getting out into, into top 32. Uh, so, a lot on the line here. And Sandwich taking a moment to think about this because they had such an amazing start. And then I feel like they focused down Mitchell. And Mitchell's stocks did not last long enough. Like, look at that. Gets that first strike. The follow up that came up from Mitchell afterwards. The dare over there to get Merlin down on his last stock. And then. That's a that double. And then Mitchell just goes down. I think, I think it's a little bit more complex than just saying, ooh, Mitchell cringe bad. It's like. <laughs> Sandwick, okay, so what So what happened was, okay, obviously their, their stocks are decent. Sandwick it was like orange second stock while Mitchell was on his last stock. Yeah. And so Sandwick went down yeah, first, point. and then they went for the 2v1. It wasn't just like Sandwick watched or Mitchell like got caught out, and per se. And that's something that's really important in Brawlhalla because the, you're not sharing your stocks at any point yeah. in time, right? Somebody could go down to zero stocks, your teammate has three, you still can't play. Uh, it, it, the, you were talking about the disjoint, right, of the stocks going away. Really good teams will sometimes, even to a certain point, coordinate when they're losing their stocks yeah. to see if they can get them to lose together. That way there's not that 10 to 15 second buffer time of coming back to the stage, looking for a weapon, while your teammates running away trying to survive because of how deadly 1v2 uh, team combos one, can be. Wrong. And I think you're exactly right. When Sandwick was going down, Mitchell was already severely damaged, got caught in that situation, which a lot of players do, and that's what happened that too. So let's see if they can keep their stocks uh, uh, aligned here in this game number three, because they're at match point. If Marilyn and Perplexity with this. Uh oh, Mitchell. It's going to be it, yo, but yo. the edge guard of perplexity, that's a huge start for Mitchell. And Mayor Lee not able to convert that into a trade. You saw him try to go over there. Oh. Sandwich with a follow up. Recovery. Oh, no. Gravity cancel afterwards. I don't not know if he had damage. it. Not enough damage. But that was such a great team combo. The recovery and the recovery. And Sandwick with the blasters. D-Light there tries to Ooh. go for the. That, that's a tougher one. Not always true, but the chase dodge recovery off of the D-Light when you're in the air can still yeah. connect from time to time. Uh, and the neutral light game, that spot dodge read means uh -oh. the blue team is running away with the lead here in game number three. Yo, but it's not over yet. They had the lead in game number two, and the red team managed to take the dub. Downlight recovery, down Light recovery, still no stocks taken by the red team just yet. What wow. a move was, from yeah, that, Mitchell. That was, I love that D-Light into like that. Uh, oh, the interrupt. The chase dodge fast fall. Okay, the board's being cleared here. Mitchell, the one with the most stocks on the field. Could go down pretty quickly, though. Merlin was able to react oh. to that. Nice job. Picks up the cannon, gets Mitchell drifting towards the stage. Evened up four to four with perplexity with a little bit of damage on Yeah, I think the most critical thing here is that the blue team didn't get perplexity into the orange. If they had gotten more damage before losing those initial stocks, I think blue team's health. But yeah. right now, this is very doable for the red team as the end light comes out from Sandwick onto two people. Yeah, they've had so many of these very awkward, like, team combo-ish setups where one member of both teams is stuck in it. So both players are kind of like, how much does this uh -oh. benefit me? Perplexity gets the side stick here. Edgeguard and Mitchell can he babysit with the stair. Sandwick okay. goes over to help his yeah. teammate. Critical. Mitchell could have gone down if Sandwick didn't apply that pressure. And now that D-Light sand... Okay. Oh! Amazing job from Mitchell into getting caught in the air. Didn't want to combo. combo his friend. And that neutral stick... Thankfully, missing for Sandwick. Perplexity can't get that edge guard just yet, but it could come soon. Man, the turnaround from this red team. They go down early, but they are so good at stealing back this lead. Oh. Mitchell can't save. He didn't want to risk it. Perplexity, the first one to fall, is still sitting on his second stock. This red team is taking this win. Yeah, Sandwich's got to go for that weapon. Beautiful spawn. Gets a falling there on Marilyn. I don't know what they're focusing on right now, but I bet they want to clear Perplexity off the board so they can get the team combo Marilyn. Already good damage coming in through so far, though. Oh. Blue team is taking control over center. Oh, oh, oh. Mitchell, sometimes you just got to go for that, I feel like. that would, If he got the knock, out off that recovery and perplexity, the team damage would have been good. Yeah, I mean, you would Oh, no, he's yeah. oh, 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 that's a dare. That's, that's his recovery. Oh. Sandwick with the save attempt, but it's just a trade-out. Can he at least take Mare? No, he can't dodge. chase dodge. Oh. 
Perplexity it. and Marilyn close it out 3-0. They're going into the top 32. Top 32 for Perplexity and Marilyn. Well played and really clutch actually coming out there for Perplexity at the very end, uh, getting that stuff recovery into the double dare, forcing Sandwick to basically realize that if he didn't go down there for Mitchell, there, yeah. there's just no way that they were going to be able to win that game. And then turning into that edge guard situation where Marilyn was able to keep up, come up on top, even though the chase dodge came through, was, uh, was a fantastic display. And that means that Sandwick and Mitchell are out, but uh, Perplexity. Well, they're not out, out. That's uh, Pools' that, top low, side, right? It was lower round. Oh, is that lower? Yeah, I think oh. it was like the last match Gosh. of Pools. Sandwich. I'll get confirmation on that later. But I think, because after this, I believe we're straight in the top 32. Um, yeah, because Pools have been grinding away for quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, look at that. So many amazing moments. And the blue team just couldn't get their win. Here it is at the very end, right? No. Let's find out. That was a double from uh, game two. Game I, two. I do want to give a lot of credit to uh, Perplexity in this one, just because, like, again, that game three situation, like, it, that could that could easily have snowballed Perplexity into got a massive Perplexity destroyed thing. by Mitchell off yeah. the side of the stage. Really early stock, stuck recovery effects, right? Yeah. And then didn't lose a stock for the rest of the game until, like, Pretty much. They, until <laughs> they, he traded it, right? So that, that was huge. And there's Perplexity just being like that. Yep, I yeah, traded that stock over there. We got a shot of everybody playing for a hole. Holy cow, there's everybody. On screen, Everyone. on the screen, I can see. Spot your favorite pros. You can see a lot of them right now. Shoutouts to the ones with names, because that makes life really oh, easy. Oh, it's like on their back. Yeah, yeah. zooming in. Wait, wait. Oh, oh. Say it. Oh, we've got some people waving on stream. Yeah, this is yeah. DreamHack San Diego. Lots this is, of people uh, playing. First land of the year. Yeah. And everybody's here. Everyone showed up. Dude, it was First incredible. open land. First open land. That's true, yeah. Uh, it was kind of amazing. Doors opened, and I think all of the setups in <laughs> Brawlhalla were just filled with just doubles filled players. Just try to get as many games as before pools, because once pools started, we just have too many teams yeah. entered to even like have room. There's no like free play because we were just like we yeah. gotta use it. Yeah, no, it's been fantastic, and everybody's just playing against everybody. It's yeah. been so much fun to meet and see a lot of the pros that we already know again. Um, S-Grape is here, was at BCX, is here now after qualifying for the Spring Royale oh, in singles yeah. as well, so I got to beat him for the first time. And we might be seeing him a little bit on stream later on today. Well, that'll be fun. I yeah. think there's definitely potential. Again, more action uh, as we get into the top 32 of things, and now things get a little bit more exciting. Mm -hmm. As we start to get a little bit more familiar with these names, no offense to the people we just watched, Marilyn, Perplexity, Mitchell, and Sandwick, but maybe these are some names that are a little bit more household yeah oh definitely there's going to be some winners round one matches in top 32 that you're going to be like like why real is this why is it here? happening right like, now if I take a, <laughs> it'd, it'd be interesting to take a look at what the bracket looks like but i'm pretty sure sandstorm boomy versus godly foes yeah, is a round that's one round one match and that's how it's turned out to be and everybody's gonna be like what that's just how many teams that we've got here the, the seating here is really interesting because there's a really big focus on getting as few region team kills as possible. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of ways where it's like, okay, we got the best players, the best teams from North America, Europe, and South America stacked so that they're all kind of fighting somebody from another region yeah. in these round ones and round twos before we get into that top 12 and that top eight. It is, it is always like a, just a not enjoyable feeling when it's like, oh, I have to get through everyone in my region before I get to play against the other right. regions. So well, and that's like, why we're here in these lands to yeah. be able to see this. Right? Yeah. We have, we, I don't think we've ever, uh, besides BCX, we've never really had so many representatives from the three major regions. For sure, like I had one land. I, I we have like three full South American teams here. I was trying to like list out all the South Americans, and I was like, whoa, there's there's more. Every yeah. time I was yeah. like, oh wait, wait, I forgot, you know, like views. I'm, I'm I forgot. casting Second Vecina in North America. Yeah, <laughs> like that's that's so incredible to that's, me. That's that's so cool. Um, yeah, no, it's gonna be a lot of fun. I can't wait to see those matches. I think coming up next, if I remember correctly, we got Java Fakey but I don't remember who they're playing against. I just remember check. being very excited because Java Fakey was this team that I hadn't really thought about going into the spring yeah. championship. And then Flambeau was like, yo, y'all got to know about this team. And I was like, oh, I now know about this team because Java popped off with the Bodvar at spring championship. Yeah, and I'm thankful that he's playing the Bodvar again because he, he took a hiatus under the spear when Hammer was understandably not very fun to play for a little bit. And Hammer's been getting some things back to it, a little bit more drift, a little bit more hits done here and there. Um, and then Java and Fakey did phenomenal in the Spring Championship. I know Flambeau had them predicted at second place, but still getting as far as they did in top eight was really great. And I found out who they're going up against. It's Heisen versus Simple. Ooh, so that's a really, okay. that's going to be a really close matchup, actually, because Heisen and Simple, while not seated 
you like in the top top tier echelon of all the EU teams mm -hmm. that are over here are one of those teams that I expect to go far just because of how much experience they have with themselves. And Simple is kind of a monster on land when it comes to making sure that he gets to those top threes. And Heisen's been fantastic in doubles for a long time too. This is a matchup that I think will be first of a kind. This will be really interesting because um, also there's the potential after uh, a big hiatus from all the Bodvars for a triple Bodvar match. <laughs> Because you, you think have, that's what's going to happen? No, absolutely not. No, I, okay. Heisen's probably going to come in with a Val. But I'm just, you know, fingers crossed. We yeah. could have a triple Bodvar match. Because Simple Heisen used to be a double Bodvar team. I, and then Java, of course, he's kind of carried the mantle of the Bodvars in North America for a hot minute here. I don't know what it's going to take to make Simple pick up the, the Bodvar again. A handshake? Maybe yeah. some some affirming words? And I think it's going to take a, a lot of buffs, hug, to be quite honest. A lot of buffs? <laughs> <laughs> That's what he's going to need to see. I think he's too comfortable with what he's been playing. But good, it would be man. so cool. <laughs> it would be cool, so cool to see. Yeah. I would absolutely love that. Uh, I think, again, uh, this is one of those things, like, if you've never watched a LAN, maybe you've watched a lot of our online stuff, you're not used to this, like, why are they talking so much? It's because they have to, like, literally walk on stage behind yeah. us and get ready and plug in their stuff and then put in their con keyboards and mm -hmm. then be like, oh, my keyboard, it didn't work correctly because I'm, And then sometimes know. it just goes perfectly fine. Yeah. And then that's good. I think we have schedule. I'd like to be able to see what's coming up next. Let me take well, a up next there. is that. Oh. Heisen oh, yeah, Simple versus Java Fakey. Okay. Yeah, so we were just talking about that. Yeah. We went into a lot of detail about it. Fakey being uh, the spear player in that 2v2 team composition. Uh, really fantastic on the Atori is what he was playing with. We got Java and Fakey uh, on screen right now. There's Java. Check him out. Fakey looks like a baby. And then Simple. Wow, yeah. He's, he's, They're so young. Dude, I, you, okay. This I is feel like you're, and there's Heisen. This is a weird thought, is but just I, I realized my car is older than some of these guys. Yeah, we, yeah well, your car is older than Brawlhalla, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, my, my car is, like, older than some of these people. I was like, what is going yeah, on? Yeah, no, there's some, there's some really young pros here in Brawlhalla scene. Um, and this matchup that's coming up is pretty exciting. Because Java, Java I think... Um, as far as the North American pros that have breakout performances, never really found a staple teammate for a long time. I think yeah. Fakey's is the closest that I'm like, okay, this could actually go the distance. This is something that I tend to wait for for a lot of pros who show an interest in the double scene, but then don't really have that consistency because in order to have consistency, you need a consistent teammate. Um, so this is really cool. See, I don't, I don't recall if they teamed for BCX, but I'm excited to see how this performance is gonna be going up here. We got the crowd there again, once again. All those matches happening on pools. Yeah, like still pool a stations. lot going on back there. Uh, somebody messing with uh, Steam on that one. Setup number two. Uh, oh, yeah. Admins, y'all want to go uh, I mean, that's ban some people? I mean, oh, wait, just, oh, that is the really staff. Okay, <laughs> he's doing it. All right, good job. <laughs> Proud of you. <laughs> yeah, there he is. Keep it up. Shout outs. Okay, I, I was talking about this with Sparky. Yeah. Is um, This is something that, again, I've never experienced, is the people who are wearing the BCX jersey here today. It's like a really cool, like, Oh, oh, you're yeah. one of us. You're wearing you're, you're wearing the Brahalla uniform. I recognize you immediately as a Brahalla person now. Yeah, you, and it's, you just it's really cool. It. Yeah, yeah, no, it's fantastic. It's like, like, not exactly. There's many reasons why we wanted to do the jerseys. Mostly because it's just it's cool of to have, yeah. have jerseys. And people but they, like but having then, like, jerseys. But then like noticing just like the return. Yeah. Return fans, return competitors, being like, okay, that was the start of their BCX or their Brahalla land journey, not the end, mm -hmm. right? Even though BCX tends to be the end of the competitive year, that's just how. It's worked now yeah. since we've come out of the past few years. Um, it's really cool. It is. Uh, and we've got even more, like, as, as we're rolling forward, because that, that jersey was, like, the first style of unique merch. We've got even more merch. We've been, more. Doing, we've been doing, doing unique merch per event. And yeah. we've got some unique merch for this, for one, this one as well. And it ends on Thursday. Yeah. Brahalla.com had a link. Um, I think you just go. To, you could go to brawler.com slash merch. Yeah. You can also visit Spring Merch from before. But no, there's this one. Or you could do the QR code. Yeah, QR code. That That's was the probably easiest the easiest. Way. Like you just zap it with your phone, and you could get these amazing Brawlhalla at San Diego uh, hoodie or T-shirt right now. It's exclusive, and by exclusive that means not going to be around forever, right? It's going to be happening here. It, it literally ends Diego Thursday. It li sale ends Thursday. There yeah. you go. You've got a week, less than a week. Yeah. Six days. But here are some of the matches we're going to be seeing. Of course, we already saw Marilyn and Perplexity go up against Mitchell and Sandwick. Up next, we talked a little bit about it. Heisen and Simple going up against Java and Fakie. After that, a very exciting match. Godly Perplexity 
No, wait, that's not right. That's Godly Fozy yeah, yeah, yeah. in Sandstorm and Boomy. Uh, Plexi is just is on two teams at once. Dude, he's just excited to play. <laughs> yeah. He's happy to be here. <laughs> and then, yes, yeah, versus Sandstorm and Boomy uh, on the other side there. Sandstorm uh, having a conversation with me a little bit before this, saying mm -hmm. that he's after after the unfortunate Arcadia Downsick nerfs, which, yeah. yeah, you know, it's justified. Yeah, yeah. It's something that happens. He, he, he's still really believing in the spear, okay. but the uh, adjustments that he's gone to He's been really feeling the Mirage, and he's, uh, he's, yeah. he's, he's thinking yeah, yeah. Mirage is like one of the best characters in the game. It doesn't know why people aren't playing it, and I'm excited to see him prove that. Uh, he, going into this, going I, think, I don't think he's doing it for doubles, but yeah, in, in singles for yeah. sure. Uh, he he more than I think a lot of players likes to find something new for an event, mm -hmm. and you know he'll he'll do it and he'll be really successful, and suddenly everyone goes, why weren't we doing this? You know what I mean? Like he put yeah. Zol on the map, yeah. he uh, like helped Boomy put Petra on the map, things like that. Like he's just yeah. one of those people who just kind of has this like ability to find the hidden deck in the game. And it's it, it's similar with the other teams that we'll be seeing further on into the year like in combos like made an experience where it's like experience believes in canon even yeah. though they weren't getting the win on canon for a very long time they finally did in the spring championship and now they're here really highly seated at san diego yeah um Third. And, then, and then other players like it's weird to say that picking bodvar is brave and innovative <laughs> but, <laughs> but it kind of is at the moment after a whole year of bodvar trout um java really and, and even beforehand when Hammer was arguably the best weapon in twos or whatever, Java was still pushing the way that Hammer yeah. was being played further than anybody else. So that's more of like a specific weapon thing. There's a lot of different players that are doing that. But yeah, Sansa in particular, Three, much two. more on to the Let's character. Get into here it. we go. All right, Simple is on the Valance. Heisen over to the Olgrim on the other side, of course. We talked about it. Java on the Bodvar and Fakey onto the Hatori here for game number one. And Heisen already getting some damage put out onto Java. Java's struggling a little bit against this uh, Olgrim Lance. Yeah, trying to get back on the center stage, stabilize there. Nice neutral light off of the cider. And Fakey following up right away with the alley oop. And there's a big Oof. amount of interrupts on each player's team combos there. Um, but something that I think we'll see. Combo! Oh, team combo and the fully charged on the neutral signature. And they go right back over to Heisen. Not even concerning themselves with the edge guard there because they want to make sure that they're together and they're getting the player that's going to be accessible the fastest, right? Like they hit Heisen off, they know that it's going to be three and a half hours before he touches oh. the stage, but simple match is to get through the pressure and get the side sick anyway. Yeah, I mean, those 1v2 situations, you'll see so a lot of top 2v2 teams where they'll just launch someone far enough that they go, okay, here's our opportunity to go for a quick 1v2. Oh. Works very well. Fakey with the ground pound gives the blue team the lead. Fakey got the double. I like how much Fakey makes spear ground pound look good in the way that your silver brain thought. <laughs> you know, like, like he makes the ground pounds off state because he really specifically timed and spaced that to get around Simple's grip before Simple could commit to a move with the weapon that he had. Oh, nice recovery from Java. Um, but yeah, Vicky just doing so well in the spirit here. Simple and Heisen uh, at a deficit. Vicky still on three stocks, dude. Yeah, I mean, uh, coming in here, he's like the less known name, but he's definitely performing alongside Java. Definitely a very strong player. As Simple comes in, down light sider, Java with a fantastic punish behind him, but unfortunately did not lead to the KO. Yeah, didn't want to go off stage there in that 1v2. Gets hit by Simple's Darren instead, and doesn't fall for the alley oop on Fakey's sider. Yo! Isis just doesn't have enough jump to make it back, and Fakey oh. doesn't dash forward for the down light, so he doesn't punish Simple for hitting his teammate. It's a, a, a small lead for the blue team. If Java goes down here, you could say that it's almost arguably even until Simple goes down, but simple survivability is usually amazing. If it weren't for Fakey slipping in with the D-Light Slider, and Java trying to stay stacked horizontally with Fakey on that edge guard. Yeah, Fakey doing a great job boxing out, getting damage put out onto Heisen, and made sure there was enough room runway for Java to get back up to that wall safely. And Java still holding on to that second stock. It means blue team has so much potential here to run away with this. Oh, and nice oh, there. Java, where are you going? Up. Okay, he was having trouble holding on the side of Apocalypse there. He just actually goes down, and Fakey now having to recover by himself. Gets a neutral stick on the simple decider. He might just do the edge guard all by himself, honestly. Can Java get a weapon here? Gets the side air, simple jumps right through, and Heisen ends up hitting with the side light air down air. So much damage coming out from Heisen's old room. Yeah, he's doing very well oh, with no. this axe in hand. Fakey gets launched to the left side. Blue team is split. This might be what the red team needs as they get the big side air onto Fakey, but Heisen's running out of health as Java not able to hit them with the weapon. Oh. Simple gets a ground pound. Ground pound and a team combo goes for the weapon throw. I thought he would dash forward with the side light. That ground pound could have ended oh. Java's stock, and he interrupts with the recovery. Simple and Heisen are clutching this one, dude. Game one would be huge for them after this deficit, but the neutral signature does spike Simple, and Heisen gets double knocked out on the left side of the stage. That was all six knockouts for Fakey, and two of them were double KOs. And look at Java smiling, being there like, yep, that's my teammate. Got a good <laughs> Teammate, I picked the right one. 
man, the tournament nerves coming in though. Again, this is our first uh, open LAN of the year, and I saw Simple drop a down like ground pound. He did down light into disco on the stage, and I was like, oh Ouch. no, Ouch. that hurts. Yeah, because yeah, because if he got that, that would have put Java potentially out of the game, and then in, uh, they could have run away with it. But instead, they oh, blue team held on. Yeah, we get that edge guard there where that ground pound came through. This is where I thought they could do it. Yeah. But Heisen did that dash forward uh, weapon throw. Didn't lead into a satellite in air, so they couldn't do a horizontal weapon, uh, team combo. And then Fakey just cleaned up right afterwards. The second he got back on stage with the weapons, neutral sick one way, side and the other, and that was it. Um, we're going to game number two here. We got Fakey getting ready for this Three, on, on two, the small fortress one, of Lions. Four. As Simple and Heisen are down a game. But I think that this set is still going to be rather close. Uh, Fakey, I think, ended up putting in a lot of work uh, for Java there in that game one, which went over to them. But now that we're here in game number two, I'm curious to see if Heisen Simple, like, after one game, we're just kind of like, okay, this is how Fakey's combo. playing. Oh, the team combo, though, and then Ooh. the sides are getting both of them. And Simple goes down. Heisen could go down as well. I mean, they both got hit, but so no. much more damage on Simple was there, so he just gets knocked out by that team combo. I love the decision from Java to position for a gravity cancel side sig there. I think a lot of times you'll see people go for like a sword recovery or go for the uh, GCN sig on the boat bar, but the GCN sig's a grab and the sword recovery wasn't going to KO, but the side sig had the force and got them that stock advantage. But the yeah. side air from Heisen makes this one even. Oh, and they could have uh, went for that recovery combo on the Java as well. The Java goes down a little too far. Nice ground pound and a chase dodge. Yo. Fakey cover the edge of the stage with the ground oh. pound and a pogo. Fakey's pogos are so good. We haven't seen it yet against Simple and Heisen yet, but I, I feel like Java and Fakey are better than anybody else are doing these vertical team combos where like mm -hmm. Java hits them with hammer recoveries and then Fakey pogos them to send them even further. Uh, we, ha we haven't seen it yet, but look for it because Fakey is so good at following up on Java's hammer. Java's still on three stocks. Simple on one stock, dude. Dude, this is a very bold statement, but I think Fakey might be one of the best spear edge guard players out there. <laughs> He's been so good at spear ground pound and spear dare. Yeah, that's uh, it is a bold statement. We're only like, we're only yeah, I'll just say, I'm calling he, it he, out. He's very good at it, and I think a lot of it comes from the team dynamic that he has with Java. Ooh. Nice team combo, though. Gets the spike, and Heisen goes all the way out there for the edge guard. Tries the to get the spike, and Java? Java destroys Heisen. We're even thinking about edge guarding Fakey like that. And then he gets the ground pound, the simple. What a, oh, that was huge. Java took one look at that and he went, are you serious? Are you going that far off stage against my the teammate? disrespect? He, he doesn't even bring the hammer for it. He goes in and look at Fakey with a double D-light side air pogo onto Heisen. Java and Fakey are running away with this game number two. You saw there the setup, the team combo, the oh. side sig, Java and Fakey. That knocked out. Five stocks left? Yeah, that was brutal. Excuse me, was sir? Was it five? I thought it was four. I don't know. What? That was a lot. I, th I think, I mean, it was a lot. Yeah, yeah. Java was on three stocks for most of the game. A lot more than zero. Um, that, was, that was destruction. And what happened there was game one was Fakey completely destroying the enemy team. And then game two was like Java being like, okay, Fakey, let's actually do some teamwork things. <laughs> let's let's <laughs> do some team teamwork? combos. This edge guard over here was so fantastic. Heisen got an amazing team go, uh, team combo finisher on a Fakey, but then he chased out just all the way off stage to the point where it was unsafe. Java double dive kicks for him unarmed, and then he gets the the, the, the double knockout onto Simple in the meantime. And that side sig at the very tip, perfect damage there to get the edge guard. Their team combos were phenomenal. Yeah, four stocks. Look at Java's grab. Left. Oh my goodness! He only he like narrowly got any damage. That was basically a five star. So, yeah, yeah I mean, like I was like when you said it, I was like, I think you might be right. If it felt like a five star, got hit twice. <laughs> but man, simple wow. got hit, like I don't want to be too mean, but like he got beat in yeah. these edge guards by yeah. Java multiple times. We'll see how well this swap from Heisen over to a Val alongside uh, oh, his teammate Val. will work out as we get into game number three, currently tied one apiece. Yeah, the, the Val was what you were expecting Heisen to lock in at the very start to yeah. begin with. Um, the, the reasons why you don't want to typically go for double legend combos in Brawlhalla is because the way that directional influence works is that while you're in hit stun, if you get hit by the same move twice, even if it's a, you're like if you hit with sword side air and your teammate hits with sword side yeah. air, because you got hit by the same move twice, you can dramatically change the angle of knockback. So when you do a double legend composition, if you try to do these team combos, not only are both your weapons the same, all of your signatures are the same. So it can be a lot harder to follow up. Uh, Heisen ends up going down during all of that, but it will be interesting to see if they can make this double valve work despite that that uh, that weakness. Yeah, I mean, uh, they have a good weapon set, right? Like. It Everybody knows Sword, Sword gauntlets. and Gauntlets are great in two space. We've seen double vowel work a lot of times, but the clash Ooh. out, Fakey can't touch. Java tries to convert that into a trade to keep that stock count. He uh, could still ahead. do it. Okay, nice. yeah. 
I think, so, so that was smart by Simple, even though it looked like it's like, why didn't you drift towards the stage? He was expecting Java to go off for a hit, so he faded back with the Nair. If that Nair hit, he would have gotten the chase dodge, but he goes down instead, and Java gets oh even and even. Gosh, Heisen. And Heisen gets uh, decimated there. Uh, oh, Combo. and the Sider to stop Sarah, and Fakey was right with the side stick. It doesn't go through, but that was six clean hits on the, on the Simple's second stock. I mean, this is this is obliteration, dude. Yeah, blue team is, the, the, they they won game one with Fakey getting six stocks. They absolutely decimated game two. Game three, still looking kind of decimating. Even though the stock counts 4-3, it's close-ish, but really if Simple loses it, now it's 4-2. Well, and what's so terrifying is that Java and Fakie with like relentlessly will take down the 1 in the 2v1, yep. even if they're off stage. We're seeing that Java and Fakie has not really stopped pressuring Heisen ever since Simple came back to the stage. It was only when Simple picked up a weapon, they were like, okay, I guess Fakie. we'll Fakie. Fakie's gonna get oh. it. Java with the unfortunate mishap there, misspaces the side air, ends up taking Fakie up the side of the stage. He's like, let me make up for it. He's trying to go for a hammer combo here, doesn't get the recovery. Tries again. Will Heisen or Simple go for the bait? No, they won't. They just go over to fight Fakie. Yeah, they back away, try to take what little damage they did onto Java. They also know if they take out Fakie, 2v1 City is on the route. But man, Simple is taking damage now as that recovery from Fakie hits him. Yeah, Java keeping Heisen off the side. Stomp scoop, nicely done. Goes for the Sair. Heisen avoids one. Fakie just staying grounded. I mean, the pressure hasn't really gone away from Blue Team's favor at this point. Sair maybe bounces off the stage, but that just means Heisen has to survive a 1v2. Oh, All oh, the recovery. Oh, wait, the Sair? Sair? He's still living. Heisen's in position. Sweat beads, the pogo misses, but Simple is just taking damage now. Side say connects. It's all left to Heisen in the 1v2. Oh, and then the weapon throw dare. I mean, that Fakie's really good at those double knockouts, right? We talk about how teams try to sync up mm -hmm. their they, losing their stocks. Well, Fakie just actually <laughs> wants to take he, he, he just wants to take them at the same time. That, that was like three or four double knockouts in three games, winning that best of five, 3-0. Java and Fakie playing phenomenally over Simple and Heisen. And much to my surprise, it was not as close as I thought it was going to yeah. be. Game one was like, okay, I could see this going either way. We're seeing the very end of this, where it's like if Java went down, maybe you see one one city, as you said, would happen. But then after that, with team combos like that, Java and Fakie, they just had nothing to worry about. Great control coming out from this team of Java and Fakie. One of the reasons, again, why Flambeau was so adamant that people needed to keep their eyes out for this team. We didn't get to see, like, the big vertical plays or, like, the, the explosive hammer plays that we're used to from Java. But really, this is just kind of an affirmation that Fakie's a really solid team player. He's a really good person to put alongside Java in a way that, like, I think a lot of people weren't sure. Because yeah. Java's a known entity. We've Fakie seen him do uh, well. Fakie's Fakie. proving himself. He's getting good fast. Yeah. Um, and it was like a thing where I wasn't really certain what to think about Fakie until Springs. And even then, I was just kind of like, well, maybe Java's just that good. But it's becoming more and more evident to me, especially here on LAN, um, that Fakie's powering up. Like, we, we got to see that warm up happen in real time into that 3 0 being more and more dominant until the, you know, it happens. That was uh, really well played by Java and Fakie. What are you looking at? I don't know. I was trying to see if the guy who's like got his arms folded is watching from the audience, like he's watching Brahala yeah. or not. I can't. Yeah, I mean, it looks like they're just staring right at the camera. Yeah. There we go. Anyways, Java. <laughs> 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 He's like, yeah, hey, we're on the jumbo track. <laughs> the match that's coming up next is the one that I think a lot of players are looking forward to yes. and are also saying, why is this happening so soon? And that is the Boomy Sandstorm versus Godly Fozy. Not Godly Perplexity. No. That's, that's the but joke. still, it's 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 two like powerhouse teams. I think in a lot of regards, mm -hmm. this could easily have been a winner's final match. This could potentially have been a loser semifinal match. The, the they're, inter they're super strong teams. The interesting thing about the Boomy Sandstorm team dynamic and it's like why this is happening so early is because they didn't get to enter in Springs for any of that mm -hmm. data because Sandstorm was sick. And then before that in Winters, they didn't quite place up to where I think a lot of people would expect them to place after what happened uh, with BCX with Boomy and Snowy. Yeah. And it was a, a, a big surprise to a lot of people, I think, at least to me, that Snowy and Luna took that winter championship so handedly. Um, and then made experience take the spring championships, right? So the North American teams that are actually the talk of the town right now, at least in the current meta, is not Boomy and Sandstorm. Boomy and Sandstorm have quite the legacy, but they still have a lot more to prove now that they're back together as a team. And fighting against Godly and Fozy and getting that win in this best of five, I think would be a very big win for them. But at this, turn, uh, at this current time, I think a considerable upset with how good Godly and Fozy have been playing. Yeah, it, it's it's so fascinating because like if you look at the, just the raw numbers at this specific time, Sandstorm's PR 21. 
But at the same time, there's so many people who have been watching Brawlhalla Esports and are like, that's the GOAT. That's the guy, who, the multi-time 1v1, 2v2 world champion, Sandstorm. You gotta put respect on the name. And then you look at the numbers, you're like, bro, he's not even single digit PR. Like, cringe, what is he doing? Well, we'll find out how that matchup's gonna play out in just a little bit. We're gonna go to a short break, and right after that, we'll be back with more Brawlhalla 2v2 action.
with more Brawl of 2 action. We've got Godly and Fozy versus Sandstorm and Boomy kicking off with winners round one of top 32 on stream next. And this is going to be an amazing match, too. Yeah, we said it before in the break, but uh, again, this is happening so incredibly early just because Sandstorm has taken a long break from the 2v2 space. We haven't seen yeah. him competing. His PR has dropped out of the single digits. So he's coming in here. And it's, again, like this like super established legacy team. Briss is kind of the arguably strongest EU team right now. So mm -hmm. it's one of those things where it's like, is this a chance for Boomy and Sandstorm to kind of reprove themselves as the best in the game? Or is this going to be the EU team kind of being like, hey, y'all, you know, you had your time in the sun. Yeah, and that's what we need to find out, right? Going into 2023, I, well, actually, if we took it the fan vote, they probably still would be saying yeah. Boomy and Sandstorm <laughs> were ready to prove it. <laughs> but like, like, for players that have been watching the scene and have been following along, I would be saying that the North American teams that we're really rooting for are, are Luna, and snowing mm -hmm. and made an experience mm -hmm. to be in those top three spots, even high contenders for winning uh, San Diego. Um, but this is the matchup that's going to set the tone of the tournament, right? Are yeah. Galdi and Fozzi just going to 3-0 through Boomy and Sandstorm? Is this matchup going to be really close? Is the elimination bracket going to have to be terrified of one of these two top tier teams top being down 32. there way sooner Absolutely. than they expect? Let's find out. We're getting right on into it. Game number one. And look at the picks from Boomy Sandstorm. It's going to be the Shell and the Reno going up against that Dalsim and Black Knight from Godly Fozy. I am very, very interested in this team composition. OK, so Godly and Fozy, this is what we saw them do so well in Spring Championship with Godly getting those two gold medals in both singles and in doubles with his teammate Ooh. Fozy. Um, but Boomy and Sandstorm, like we were talking about before, Love having these really unique picks that they bring up for specific tournaments. And Sansom on the shell, uh, which Ooh. is Tesca, and then Boomy on the Reno, which traditionally we only see him play in singles. Gets the D-Light recovery, gets the first strike on the Fozy here in game number one. As they're setting up for a team combo on the Godly, oh. doesn't even need to pick up recovery. No D-Light before, it doesn't matter. Two knockouts going out to Boomy's Reno here, right at the beginning of game number one. And Fozy not able to hit the dare, trying to trade out the side air. Still not enough to take down Sandstorm here, but the recovery off of Godly still not enough enough red team can't finish stocks oh man yeah that cider comes through and it's still Bro. not enough boomy makes it back on demon island gets the nair gets the recovery and sandstorm up there with the alley to get the uh, uh, the the boots nair onto him finally boomy and sandstorm are wiped off the board and even though they got a lot of extra credit it's not so dire that godly and Fuzzy can't bring it back and they see boomy letting go of his iframes there with an attack right away damage him several times gets the cider brings it back on the stage and godly looking for that neutral light to continue the damage and godly and boomy are both fighting into the skies okay they just both agree to disagree on that team combo starter there <laughs> That's the polite response to that one. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll agree to disagree. Weapon Toss comes out from Godly, trying to stop that oh. from being too much, but Fozzy gets caught by the end sig. Boomy sets up. Sandstorm not quite able to hit that recovery, but Blue Team still managing to keep this damage lead as Sandstorm is basically untouched oh, here. Oh, he clears everyone off the board with a double knock on the neutral signature. This is a super popular thing that's very specific to Reno, where off of Blaster, Sidelight, or Neutral Light, you could go for a hard dodge in place read if you just put the neutral sig out at a slight delay. And Boomy's already succeeded with that twice now. He does go down. They could get Sandstorm here. Fozzy repositioning with the Lance Side Air. They go back over the Boomy instead of edge guarding Sandstorm there, and some damage comes in on the both the blue team's members, they're still keeping this close. Yeah, I mean, red team definitely knows that if they can get this team play up on the Boomy, then they have a real opportunity to bring this one back, because right now, if they focus down Sandstorm, Boomy's just going to run wild on top of them. Neutral light sets up. Fozzy's doing a great job getting these follow-ups off of Godly, but they're not quite leading to much. Yeah, that Cider ends up hitting Godly. Godly goes super deep into the red. And Fozzy, I mean, we know that he's incredible in the 1v2s. Uh, oh, and there's actually oh. a good chance here because Boomy's as vulnerable as Godly is right now. Downlight and a neutral light, and that's not going to lead into any knockouts. And Boomy does outspace one attack, but not the second side signature. Sandstorm gets deep combo. D-Light, Cider. Godly goes up for the edge guard. He's going to trade a stock oh. for this, and he doesn't even have to. D-Light ground pound means that Godly and Fozzy have the 1v2 against Sandstorm, but the damage is in a way where I feel like it could be either team's game still do. I mean, it's Sandstorm we're talking about. Again, one of the greatest Brawlhalla players of all time, but he's got a 1v2 against Godly and Fozzy, who are at their peak. They've got all the weapons. They've got all of the control of the stage, and Sandstorm's got nothing to his name right now besides a wall that he's managing to get away from. Oh, and Godly wakes uh -oh. up the dare, gets the stuff uh -oh. recovery, the ground pound from Fozzy clears the side of the wall, and Godly and Fozzy bring him back from a game that by all means, they were at a deficit with the entire time, and much to my surprise, those damage numbers, they were quite low for the blue team. I think Sandstorm had 362 on him. Um, and even though they were really far ahead, those stocks were being taken really early. Yeah. Uh, I think Boomy got all four of the knockouts at the very beginning of the game. They were 
incredibly efficient with getting those stocks taken out, right? Like, they were not struggling at any point. Ooh. You see the red team starting to get into the red, and the blue team's like, all right, time to get that KO. Meanwhile, the red team struggled a little bit. You're going to see those numbers be a little bit higher as they were trying to take down these stocks off this blue team. But at the end of the day, like, once they started realizing, you know what, we got to just go for this follow-up game, let Godly do these setups, and let Fozzie go for the follow-ups, they started to really find their footing. I really loved how relentless Godly was with the pressure there, really trusting that Fozzie was going to be able to have his back, even if that offstage engagement went wire. Uh, and, and, and look at that, Boomy doing the most damage for his team, but also like burning out the fastest on his team as well. They're going back to Demon Island for game number two here, and the team compositions are exactly the same. Let's see how this plays out here, because if Fozzie and Godly start off with a lead, I worry that Boomy and Sansom are even going to be able to take a game off of this team. Well, they're definitely going to try as Godly starting to get some Axe damage built up. Definitely looked like a, a, a very gauntlet-heavy game in that last one, but Axe time. Neutral C catches Boomy. Just a slight misposition. Nice neutral light, but punished by the falling stare from God. They mean Sandstorm has to play help with this edge guard here. Boomy goes into the ground pound, and Fozzie goes right around it. But nice recovery into recovery. Sandstorm following up off of Boomy's wins. Can Godly get this knockout here? Everybody's taken to the skies. And that Whoa. falling, that fast fall into the down stick actually gets clipped, and Boomy barely makes it back. Side stick from Sandstorm thrown out. No punish, no hit on either side. Lots of people getting into the red. Who's going to get the first stock? It's Fozzie. No, it was Godly with that recovery. Oh, nice spot side dodge oh. side sick, but that's that's the weakness of Tesca, right? You hit yeah. these moves, you have all this time for that active input, but in a doubles environment, that's that two seconds that your, your opponent can react. Get that axe side light, stop you from getting the knockout. And Fozzie's still surviving after that unarmed nair comes through. Fozzie's still holding on. Both red team members deep red on their initial stocks. Boomy, first one to fall, but he'll take down Godly now. Nice. Another one? Yup. Double falling stare on both sides. Godly and Fozzie going for some high risk, high reward plays, but the risk mitigated by the fact that they were so far ahead in stocks. Now evened up, Boomy has to avoid this 1v2 and a nair to recovery means that he's already in red, dude. Side stick hits, and another one of those coming through means Boomy might go down to one stop. They don't care about Boomy, though, as they go for the handoff to the left side, just jump roping over each other. Pogo from Fozzie doesn't hit the stair, but wow. Godly with the recovery keeps that stock advantage for the red team. I would believe that Reno has three defense after watching how fast damage do is be being a bug. up. But, uh, yeah, it's just, it's just it's been really rough for Boomy here in this matchup as he's been doing a an explosive amount of damage, but also his character's just been exploding on the screen. And Sandstorm now, uh, he won with two stocks on the team. Boomy already in orange. Oh! Nice job with the dunk, with the neutral signature, Follow not going to have enough spike. Okay, gets the knockout on the other side. Golly does make it back. Can they clean this up? Nice recovery. Okay, it is the most tentative of leads, Duke. It's all about Boomy. Can he hold on to this final stock? Because Sandstorm, he's got a second stock to play with. He's good. He's living. Boomy starting to get some double neutral lines out. Is Sandstorm playing that 1v1 against Godly on the left side? Oh, man, it's Sandstorm. Yeah, winning that 1v1 too. Boomy falls with the side air. Strong hit, though. He's supposed he could go for this down sig. Dash from ground pound. Switches right over to Godly. And Godly gets the Sair. Boomy can survive zero more of those. Oh, nice dodge. We can't touch! But it forced him so far under Demon Island. They never touch the stage. Godly with the down sig for the double knockout. You get hit. That's the perfect spacing on that down signature there to catch Sandstorm off guard. We just saw two examples of Fozzie and Godly take take combo. Oh, combo. D light side air. Oh, where oh, are you going? Godly dodges through it. It doesn't finish it. <laughs> Fozzie was literally punishes him for it. He's, he's, like, like, hey. he's like, we just, we just got a double knockout of the best highlight receipts, ever, man. and now we don't even get it on Sandstorm of all players. That would have been like, oh, would have started his YouTube channel. <laughs> my, my clip. <laughs> <he ruined. laughs> my Down light. Oh, oh, man, Godly starts, dude, Sandstorm could bring it back if Godly and Fozzie keep dropping this. Like dude. I was kind of goofing around, but yeah. uh, okay. We're good. There we We're go. Good. There we go. Godly gets it. Gets the falling stare. Boomy and Sandstorm now at match point here in this winners round one. And Godly and Fozzie are one game away from moving forward over a team that maybe a lot of players were worried about would be upsetting them a lot earlier in the bracket than expected. Because Godly and Fozzie are the two seed going into DreamHack mm -hmm. San Diego. Yeah, I mean, I, I, again, like, it, it cannot be understated the legacy that Boomy and Sandstorm have. Again, multi-time world Three, championship two, 2v2 team, one, and yet... They're kind of getting handled. Got the Infosi currently up 2-0. Yeah. The fact, like, I, I think most people would have expected this to go to at least a game four, maybe a game five. But right now, Godly Fozzie about to put this one away. Right. Nice dive take to punish the downstick. The, the thing that's happening through here is that um, 
Sandstorm's just being put in these 1v2s way too soon. And Boomy fighting off stage here. Let's see if he can do it. Dodges through the ground oh, pound. And Godly coverage. covers it with the Sair. That was brilliant. Save? And Sandstorm just has to make it easier for Boomy to be able to make it back oh. to the stage. And that's the second time that the Demon Island Walls Come betrayed on. Boomy. And the neutral oh. signature after the D-Light side air perfectly timed means that the first strike, despite it being the second stock, goes over to the red team. Yo, but the blue team tries to triage there. You saw the setup, caught both red team members, and Sandstorm comes in with a recovery. It just wasn't enough. Downlight recovery, takes one, oh, takes the second one. Sandstorm actually covers Boomy's back with yeah. the gauntlet recovery there as Godly was trying to interrupt that, save his teammate, and Sandstorm says, no, you don't. Evens up the game and signs of life with the blue team. D-Light, sidelight one direction, Darren the other. Boomy putting on a ton of damage onto the red team's new stocks. Yeah, I mean, it's signs of life, but they need a lot more than just one single heartbeat per minute. They need so much more right one, now. One, one, one heartbeat BPM. per minute. Just a little one bit. BPM. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, well, we'll have to wait for the next match for the next one. No, that's a little bit better than this, I think, because this game state is better even than, like, um, if it was like one and what two versus spot. one and two. Oh no, Boomy, can you make that back? Hand up. Oh, oh God, he doesn't get it. He makes it back. Can Sandstorm get this edge guard here? Puts up the downlight. Down Sider would have done it. Oh, oh and it's not going to be enough because of the bounce. Yo, but he still gets the recovery. Blue team starting to take the lead here. All right. It's a, it's a small Sider? lead, though. Sider gets it. And Godly somehow. Oh, this is the combo. Has amazing survivability. Not enough to make it back. Boomy's dominating. Godly realized if I put all that effort into coming back, Fozzie might go down mm -hmm. while I'm spending all that time recovering. Uh, gets a fresh stock here. It is very close still. Uh, Sider comes through, edge guard into the down air here. That's going to be it. No, Mosey barely misspaces the side air and Sandstorm. Any damage Sandstorm gets here is like really, really great for the team. But at the same time, he's in that spot where like he's going to get launched by every single big hit. But oh, what matters is he takes he, out Fozzie. I mean, it doesn't matter if you get launched by every single big hit. If you're just getting Fozzie's last stock and then he falls to the nair, ends up hitting it. Okay, that's twice that he misses this too late. Come on, Sandstorm. No, he's, he's, he's a 1v1, uh, all right? He, he yeah, won his yeah, 1v1 right. against Fozzie. He's okay, like, I got okay. mine. I'm good. I got mine. All these team combos, we don't need to hit them. Well, you got to be careful because it's Godly. If Godly hits, uh, well, actually, this is just a rough. It's going to take a lot. It's, it's going to take a bit. Yeah. Sans, uh, Boomy's really great with these blasters, edge guards, too. Sandstorm dodges in place. Downer hits. That's not enough knockback, but the yeah. weapon toss will be. And Boomy and Sandstorm keep their heads in the game as they take game number three and avoid a 3-0 uh, uh, defeat against Godly and Fozzie. Yeah, this one is still a uh, very uh, tense one for Boomy and Sandstar. I'm so used to like, you know, we've been watching these guys for so long and after a set or after a game, they're like laughing, they're having a good time, they're just chatting it right. up. But like right. right now, this is probably the most serious I've seen Boomy and Sandstorm in the middle of like a winner's round one well, I mean, top it's 32 it's, match. It's Godly versus Fozzie. Yeah. Everything that they're gonna have to fight against this is going to be incredibly tough indeed. Um, and, and I feel like that entire match was actually won off the fact that they didn't finish that Sandstorm edge card, right? Yeah. Sandstorm came back, we were like, he's one hit away. Fozzie gets hit five times by Gauntlets and then loses that stock. Uh, he just finally, goes, don't get hit, forehead. We're, we're finally changing the playing field here, and I think okay. this is much to the benefit of Boomy, because Boomy's now had two self-destructs mm -hmm. to the wall on the left side of Demon Island, which is a lot harder to do on the Fortress of Lions, not to mention that gives them that platform to play on, and you have that benefit of getting D-Light recovery knockouts there, and Godly and Fozzie are actually playing on that platform, and Boomy takes advantage of it, downline side hits. Godly takes damage down around to Fozzie. Godly tries to go for a punish, and I think so far working out in the blue team's favor, although it is close. Yeah, no huge swings just yet, but blue team does catch both red team members. Nice side sig from Boomy as the immediate swap over to Godly for the 2v1, but Godly ends up getting a nice punish onto Sandstorm. Oh, Sair hits. Falling Sair into Fozzie. No, Fozzie drifts underneath Boomy. Very smart there. No one doesn't come through, and Ooh. that's just going to do oh. it. The strong hit of the down sig into the double knockout onto Fozzie. One for each of the blue team members. Really nicely done. Yeah, that down sig on the boots from Sandstorm. I wasn't sure if he was going to try to throw it back or if he was going to go straight forward, but ended up going for the bounce and led to the KO. And now blue team with the lead here over the red team, and they've got enough health that they are not going to get taken off oh. just yet. That neutral signature Ooh. gets interrupted. Just nice kidding. and done. Gets him out of the neutral light from the gauntlets, uh, which is now more of a combo starter at any, any damage amount than ever. Uh, recovery hit's not going to be enough to take down Sandstorm, but one more hit might do it. And they might just focus over onto Boomy. Uh, yeah, well, they definitely will now. Godly takes him off stage. Pogo hits, no recovery. Uh -oh. Ground pound hits again. Godly dodges in place Movement. to mix up the second ground pound follow up, and Boomy survives. 
And Sandstorm comes in, puts some threat out onto Fozy, but decides to try to stick around Boomy there instead of trying to go for that quick edge guard onto Fozy again. Neutral air from Boomy, keeping himself alive, but you can see he knows he's the target as he gets a Sare. Follow up doesn't need it as Sandstorm takes down Fozy. I swear that signature is like better if you don't spike with it. <laughs> yeah, like, like, that like is, actually, yeah. <laughs> that is incredible because we saw that neutral signature. We were like, that's it. And he just moved nowhere. Uh, but then you bounce off the stage and all of a sudden you are flying. It's four stocks to two, dude. And yeah. it's a two-to-one two stock situation. Who we could go down to a Sare here if he doesn't jump. What's going to happen to Sandstorm? Manages to avoid the follow-up from Godly. You saw the sideline Nair come out from Fozy. There's a setup. There's the Sare from Fozy. Another one, oh. but he's a little too high. Fozy dropping a few of these so far. The ones that are connecting are going a long way, but this is one of those situations uh -oh. where I'm like, if Boomy gets the stock with that drop conversion, that's that's what the game was decided off of, right? Because Boomy holds on to those weapons, holds on to that stock. He can play so much more aggressively. Oh, Godly and Fozy both want to punish the same SIG, and it actually saves Boomy a little bit longer. But he finally goes down. Now Sansa has to avoid the team combo, but he gets hit. Neutral into Sarah. No! Fozy doesn't get the follow-up once again, and then just some friendly fire. The wires are getting crossed for this red team. You're not seeing those consistent team combos that they likely have practiced instead they're just kind of jumbling up on top of each other lots of spaghetti coming out in the red team they're still holding on i mean godly's deep red on his last stock but there's still that small chance that they close this one out yeah sans from nearing deep red at this point in time Fozy not damaged enough for me to be oh, too concerned whoa. for the red team sarah comes through no alley oop from sandstorm but he's gonna go for the edge guard on a godly perhaps i don't know boomy keeping Fozy off the Ooh. guard okay nice recovery you have to be super damaged for fruits to do that neutral light into oh we tried to dashboard weapon throw but sandstorm gets in the way falling dare the weapon throw up can Fozy make it back he can't that's gonna be game and boomy and sandstorm bring it to game five here in winners round one against Godly and Fozy. This is what we wanted. This is what we expected. Two top caliber teams coming at each other in winner's round one. And now you've got a game five situation and potential for that upset you were talking about yeah. of, God, uh, of Godly Fozy going down real early. The stats on this is interesting, though, because Sandstorm's damage was 287. Yeah, that was real and low. And Boomy was like at 640 game something, five. I think. Like, that was, it's been quite the interesting dynamic for this team because Shell has a eight, eight force on the stance, right? <laughs> so it's like he's not really hitting many attacks, but I guess he's doing what he needs to do to be able to enable Boomy because as, as fast as Boomy's been getting knocked out, Boomy is destroying his opponents when he's putting out those attacks. Here we go. Game five situation. Godly Fozy. We start to see the spaghetti come out at the tail end of the last one. Hopefully they can clean up their plates, but damage being done. Fozy smacking Godly around again. Yeah, nice side air there off the side of the stage. Fozy trying to burn Sansom on the landing, but Sansom just drifts away. Boomy getting so much damage on the Fozy and Godly out. now deep in the red. Godly and Fozy might be going down into the elimination Ooh. bracket at this rate, dude, because Godly has disappeared. Side light into neutral stick, tries to go for the rebounds again, but Fozy's smartly dodging oh. down now. But Fozy's still not hitting those side air follow ups consistently off of Godly's setup. And Sig, not enough to take down Boomy. Yeah, hit that inner angle, like right above the blast, that sends you a little bit up in diagonal. Oh. Less force. Boomy does go down, however. And now they're focusing on over, over on the Sandstorm. But Sandstorm ends up just getting an attack, punishing Fozy for going for an early sword or uh, spear down light. Yeah, and you saw Godly back away. He's like, you know what? I'm not going to challenge the 1v2. I'm going to just wait it out, wait for Fozy to come back, comes in, gets the recovery. Sandstorm still living side light. It was all a bait for Godly to come and hit the recovery, but Sandstorm is still living. Yeah, Godly putting out these side lights, trying to get some kind of combo starter here. Stuff recovery effects because Godly's Godly! done for, and that's going to be it. A dare. Godly doesn't drift into the, the stage, and Boomy with the ground pound punish means Godly's on his last stock. Sandstorm goes down to his second stock. Right? That, that is incredible coming out from the blue team. They have completely figured out how to fight Godly and Fozy. And Fozy has got to make a miracle happen at this point. Yeah, this has to be the biggest clutch of all time if Godly and Fozy want to close out game number five. Godly being on his last stock so stinking early is so bad for this red team. But Boomy comes in, starting to put that damage onto this final stock. The blue team knows if they take down Godly, this one's basically in the bag. Godly has only been getting hit on these landings here. Fozy and Godly takes center stage for a moment. Sidelight oh. Nair, but he misses the sidelight Nair, Duke. That's huge. Boomy ends up dodging oh. out, gets the knock on to Fozy, and Fozy realizing how dire the situation there is. He adjusts Whoa. his headset. 
Last stocks here for this red team. The EU favorites might go down incredibly early. Godly takes one, but right side, Sandstorm really trying to take down Fozzy. Ground Pound doesn't hit. There's oh, the Nair. Oh, the Nair He's going to go for more. Because the Ground Pound is be huge. Another edge guard here. Sandstorm does sweat, but he dodges back to the stage, but no resources left available. Godly avoids his one Ground Pound. Okay. Hits Sandstorm. If they can get the 1v2 on the Boomy here, it is possible that they win. This is how they won game one, Duke. They need it, but Sandstorm's back. Godly trying to find the opening on the Boomy. Boomy goes for the wake up dare. Oh, and the recovery hits, falls to the down air. Boomy with the blasters, dashes off the platform. No, okay, the neutral oh, does no. hit, but Sandstorm's oh. not in range to be able to get the Fozzie! follow up. Daylight recovery, and he oh! drops the daylight recovery, and Boomy gets hit. The turn the daylight now, oh! and Fozzie gets Boomy off the top. Sandstorm now in the 1v2 after an incredibly clutch turnaround. You drop one combo, and Fozzie punishes you for it. Deep. The team combo, daylight, no! now he drops the You stare. can't afford that drop. You cannot afford that drop. Sandstorm oh. gets a second shot a, at life. He gets the side air. They're strong side air. And Fozzy off of the drop is now in a 1v2. Oh! Is that it? The Sarah hits it. Sandstorm clutches it. 1v2 after Fozzy almost brings it back. And they knock Godly and Fozzy into the elimination bracket. That was so clutch on all sides. Whoa. So close. But oh. Sandstorm hits the Sarahs oh, they no. needed. And Boomy and Sandstorm knock Godly and Fozzy into I... the elimination bracket. In top 32! I can't. I all. Taza! Dude, Fozzy dropping the D-Lights there. That was it. That was it. Sansa was done for. That was Tur it. Tournament nerves. I know. That They're is real. That is the, the, so the clearest. Real. That is the clearest visual Look of at the tournament giant nerves. Look spike in damage that Sandstorm had on that last stock there after how early Godly got it with the ground pound. That was it. Boomy got destroyed the, off the top. Look how much damage that he had. He died off the top, Duke. That was because <laughs> Fozzy, after the D-Light recovery, Boomy steered him up all the way and then didn't actually get the, the knockout because of how much he drifted in to avoid Godly hitting him. And then Fozzy turns into a gravity cancel deal that recovery. Uh, wow, he was sweating. I couldn't believe it. We have so many replays to look at here. Here we that go. That was uh, an impressive game. That game five, you could not have asked for it better. We wanted it. It looked like it, looked, it was so close to being a godly Fozzy wash. And then Boomy Sandstorm were like, all right, time to clutch up. We know what to I... do. Start picking apart Fozzy. And then they took it to game five. When they went back to Small Fortress Alliance, I was like, this is a big risk because that looked like a Boomy Sandstorm map. And yet, I guess, well, I guess it was, because they, they won. <laughs> I mean, I was convinced that that was how Godly and Fozzy won game one. It was in that exact same scenario. Yeah. I mean, it, it, they, they get that early stock onto Boomy. Oh, and look at that, all right? It was, it was such an, an intense game five scenario. We've been going through all these replays here. There's that side sig was able to get that knockout. It was really fantastic. Um, that, that moment was huge. The edge right? guard. Boomy, Boomy had lost two stocks on Demon Island to that same exact scenario, and then at that time, Godly just didn't drift hard enough to the right. And then this 1v2, we didn't get to see the moment before it, and I'm glad that we did it. We, you, can look, <laughs> you can look back at the VOD if you want, but Godly gets the perfect setup with the Axe neutral light. Oh, and oh. that pop-up for Boomy. What a, what a deserved... Uh, reaction to yeah. that situation. Yeah, I, I because, would, I would be there I, too. I imagine I that you're that sitting too. there, you see your teammate get hit by Axe Neutralite in a 2v1 against Godly and Fozzy, and you're literally already packing yeah. up. You're like, you're like standing up, getting your bag, walking away, and then he goes, wait a second, he's still on the field? What? He hit two boot stairs? We won! There you go, and that's the 3-2. What a set. Uh, that delivered better than I expected. That, that was amazing. Uh, Wow, that was a, that was such a fantastic set, and of course, okay, we still got that was that was just top thirty-two. Yeah, winners round one. We yeah. got a lot. This is more. what happens when you have the best four teams from four regions, and they're all like actually really really good. And yeah. that wasn't even like Sansom Boomy's not even one of the top four teams in NA right now. Well, I mean, I mean, they could change. They could I, change. Yeah, I think that a lot of people's opinions changed, but uh, man, what an impressive set! Boomy and Sandstorm continuing on into the top sixteen of things. Something that, like, not a lot of people were sure was going to happen. Again, Godly Fozzy is, it, they're the favorite of the EU teams. A lot of people put them in their predictions for one of the top three teams. And the fact that is they, 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 they went down early. Yeah. They went down very early. Yeah. Um, and that was the risk of this run-in here, right? It yeah. was one of those things where we were looking at it. It was like, okay, well, somebody, somebody's got to go down the elimination bracket. Is it going to be Boomy Sandstorm or is it going to be Godly Fozzy? Uh, the winner of that, actually, so the, the matchup, uh, that took place in pools mm -hmm. was Laura's Kiner versus Megdi and Radish. Okay. So the winner of that matchup is going up against Megdi and Radish, who did win 3-0 over Laura's and Kiner, which is actually 
a surprise to me yeah. that it was that dominant. Flores and Kiner were somebody that I looked at that team and I was like, okay, this team I'm expecting to go a little bit further. Um, so that'll be fun to see later on. But what we have coming up next is very exciting. We've got Boy, Akno yeah. and Blaze Ooh. versus Dog and Cutie. Oh, so that, again. Yeah, that's that's going to be exciting. Yeah, so this yeah. is this is a, a very, I, I want to say it's like relatively similar storyline of like you have this strong legacy mm -hmm. team and then you have this kind of new blood team. Although I will say Akno and Blaze don't have the like quote unquote fall off that a lot of people were wanting to give to Boomy Sandstorm, After right? BCX. Yeah. yeah. But uh, but the but uh, Acto and Blaze looking really really good as of late, but they're not quite the big EU team. And then on the other side, Cutie Dog, they've been on the come up. They're this team that like in NA, people keep going like, oh, they don't really matter. And then they how many upset top threes? A lot of people. I remember we were talking. Yeah. We were actually talking about yeah. this at Spring Championships, and I, I literally asked the question. How many top threes do Dog and Cutie have to get to on winner's side before people start putting them predictions? And I think you, they top and, three here. And you said, you said, and I actually believe this, they need to win a tournament before yeah. people start talking about yeah. them. And that's what hasn't happened yet. And so many times Dog and Cutie have smashed their way into the winner's side of a top three uh, uh, North America tournament, and they get double eliminated, right? They go, they go into the, the elimination bracket and they get third. This has been happening a lot. They're such a fantastic team. Dog has been a player who has been like recognized vocally by players even like Sandstorm on Twitter mm -hmm. about how good they are at playing in, in, in 2v2s. And Cutie is a player who's become phenomenal in 2v2s as well. So them as a staple team has been really exciting to watch. Akno and Blaze, however, like you said, they never really had a fall off, right? EU just kind of got more good teams, so they stopped <laughs> winning every tournament, right? Oh, my 18th gold medal did not become 19 gold after my a while. Win but streak. but uh, they've never, barring like, literally like they physically couldn't be there, they have always teamed together when they can. Um, and they have stuck together that entire time through, doing it amazingly. Oh, and even Blaze, like, despite him being such a twos-focused player, has even had really crazy singles results, like having bracket wins over players like Godly, even his own region. So really, really amazing players coming up against Dog and Beauty. It's It's cool. Um, maybe this is my nostalgia kicking in, but I think... When, when I talk with other casters and whatnot, they tend to give Blaze the most credit as a potential 1v2er. Like, when, oh, yeah. whenever we're in a situation yeah. where it's a 1v2, it could be one stop well, left to four, and people are like, Blaze has done this I before. I think it's because we have the evidence. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's, that's the thing. It's like Blaze is, is in this really weird state where it's just kind of like, well, he's fighting for his friend. <laughs> that's what happens there. I also really like the attitude that Akno and Blaze have for each other, which is that we, like, Way back in 2019, I'm sure they still share this attitude. If you ask which one of them is the better player, they'll always say it's the other one. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not even any question. Even though Akno has, like, like objectively more singles results than Blaze, yeah. he still thinks Blaze is the best player on the team. Um, and Blaze the same way for him. So they're really fun to watch in terms of just being really great friends and really great competitors. Yeah, and now, of course, the uh, pressure of being the top EU team kind of falls on them. They had to watch their EU brethren fall a little early. And again, you, you got to acknowledge the fact there's this really deep rivalry between NA, EU, and maybe now South America, where EU has only taken like two medals over NA in any in event, lands. and it's always yeah. in doubles. Um, but here you see, and up next, we got Akno and Blaze versus Dog and Cutie talking about that. But after that, we got Made Experience versus Fiend and Wesley. All right, so we're getting a lot of North America matchups against other regions. Fiend and Wesley will be the first South America team, fully South America yeah. team that we're going to be having here on stream. And Made and Experience is our favorites for top three. I think they're the third seed yes. going into this bracket. So. Really a, a second seed's out uh, down in the elimination bracket. So yeah. what do, do y'all know? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, <laughs> I, I guess so. I mean, I'm a, <laughs> don't give me that. Look, <laughs> it's fine. Acno and Blaze is coming up here. Yes. Uh, a European team going up against Dog and Cutie. So uh -huh. really excited about this. It would be, I'm like a little hesitant about this because I'm like, uh-oh, are we reaching an all North America top Four it's happened side because I think it can happen. Mm. Like Luna Snowy, Java Fakey is one of the matches yep. that's happening in, off off the stream right now. Yeah, to get into top. And then eight. if Dog and Cutie win that, and they made an experience win that, I think. Oh yeah, they would just be all NNA. So the, the, there's one team left. Okay. For Europe and one team left for South America in the top side. Winner's side. In the top I, side. In elimination bracket, I haven't looked. I'm sure that there's a bunch of crazy happenings down there too. Of course. But on the winner's side. The teams that we're about to see are the final defenders, at least when getting in the top eight here in winners' quarters. Well, of course, uh, there you're seeing some highlights. Akno and Blaze, uh, I would say, if if you're ever looking for a team to find highlights of, they probably have the most. 
<laughs> oh, just like historically? <laughs> yeah, just like there's so many because they've been playing so long. They've gotten to they've gotten so many gold medals, which means they've been on screen so often that I think like it, it's probably really easy to find some highlights for Hackno and Blaze. Yeah. I mean, this is, oh man, this this one's bringing me back. When Blue was still playing Koji. <laughs> I think Machete had locked in Jayun for that one. As Blue Insider, all the highlights are just Blue against like every one of the EU players that he's teamed <laughs> with over time. Who is, there's someone in EU who's like always posted in like the 1v1 clips and he's like, come on man, why am I always the, the one who's getting clapped in a 1v1 clip? Oh yeah, it's, I know what you're talking about and I don't remember who it is. It, it feels like it. that, where it's like, we just, we gotta have a 2v2 clip of uh, Blue getting clapped, but here you're seeing, like, in terms of legacy, Akno and Blaze have so much legacy. But again, Dog and Cutie, they're they are this team that's on the come up. I can't believe I was really right about, well, about the 18th gold medal. Because I said that just like, I just was exaggerating. Yeah, you're just throwing a number, number out. And it was literally like, this would be their 18th gold medal. Yeah. Wow. If. That's a lot of medals. If. If. I mean, 17 golds is not bad. <laughs> it's cringe. 17? <laughs> what? what do you mean it's 17? Oh, well, it got on the left. Dog, uh, top left. Cutie, bottom left, and then on the other side, Blaze, top right. Akno, bottom right. Mm -hmm. uh, going against each other head to head, I think. I don't know, but I think that Dog and Cutie are higher seated than Akno and, and Really? Blaze. I they guess might, that kind of makes sense. It might be wrong. I might be totally wrong. Whoever's on the red team is the higher seed. Okay. So we'll find out in just a little bit. But it's, a, it's, a, it's pretty. I think it's pretty evenly matched in terms of recent placements in the region. Okay. But I don't know how evenly matched it is when it comes to just being really good at twos on land. I think my gut gives Echno and Blaze the favor. I yeah. Think. It's really tough because, like, again, like, we have so much, like, information on Akno and Blaze. We've seen them make it to the Grand Finals. We've seen them compete. Again, they're one of the two teams to ever get a gold medal in 2v2s in a land environment over North America. So you give them a lot, but at the same time, like, again, Dog and Cutie, they're on the come up. They've been doing really well yeah. in North America, and it's just now that opportunity to go North America to EU. How, how does it cross over? Yeah, I'm really excited to see. I mean, that's what that's what all the matchups that we've got coming up, right? Because we've got the North America versus EU. How does the matchup cross over? Well, we just found out that Boomy and Sandstorm, I mean, that was so close. That was like, it was too close for me to be like, if it was a it, dominant victory, I'd be like, yeah, it is. It was, it, it, it's weird because it's like, if 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 Fozzie was at home, he he hits that 100% of the time. You know what I mean? It's That was 100% oh, yeah. tournament nerves that I mean, hit him right I, at the I last minute. I was ready to call the, yeah. the, the, the event. The he second got, he event, got caught there. The we were like, the uh -oh. hit, I was going to be like, that's it. Sandstorm's gone. And then he drops it. And I go, oh, no, that's it. <laughs> like, yeah, like, uh -oh. in the other, other direction. Boots are actually so fortunate and that 1v2 scenario because you can steer Top your cider well. forward to get out of the way yeah. or Two, use the strong one, knockback. Anyways, one. here we go. Cutie and Dog running the team composition that they had in North America Springs um, with that Luke and Aang, uh, Wushong and Ross coming into here and Akno with Akaya who settled on as he was playing with Blaze and Blaze with the Ulgrim that we saw in those highlights as far back in 2019. Still holding on to that here in this 2v2 composition. We're in game number one here at Brawlhalla San Diego. Let's get into it. Side sick from Blaze starts off really good for the red team as they aren't even close to KO percent. Side sick dodged by Dog, but Cutie comes in, hits the neutral light. There's a recovery from Akno. Red team might get some more stocks here in a sec. Yeah, Cutie goes down super early. D light, neutral light, just tagging on even more damage on the Cutie. Um, and, and Blaze, oh. followed with that side air, catches Dog off guard, and that is a dominant start. He just caught him right in the belly with the axe and locks him out of there. Cutie already getting into the red. Dude, the red team, they're showing their dominance here. Good spacing, yeah. both of them with the punish, and there's the side sick oh. from Akno to take Cutie down to his final stock. All right, this is, uh, I mean, I gave it favor to Akno and Blaze, but this is a little much at the moment. Okay, he actually makes it back, and then Dog gets the D-Light onto Cutie, so he gets hit by the Nair. Finally, a stock goes down to the blue team. Can Cutie get the double knockout? Weapon throw. Nice. Yeah, and that double knockout actually goes from Akno drifting to the left, being like, let's sync up those, those respawn timers, right? We were talking about what makes a good team really really good, and that's Akno and Blaze going, you know what, I don't need to waste this five seconds dodging through this weapon zone recovery. Yeah, I My mean, dog goes down. The, the decision to, to, to pick a stock versus, like, being next to your teammate, like, that's a tough call to make, and these top players are so good at making it, and good team damage coming out from the blue team as they got both red team members stacked up there, but Cutie's getting very deep into the red, and he cannot afford another cider at this point. Oh. 
Acto goes over the side light. Nice punish by Dog. We used to get the Sarah right afterwards. So even though he gets the gravity cap down light read, Ooh. Cutie goes down to zero stocks. It's going to be four stocks to zero at this rate, Duke. And I don't think we're going to see a 1v2 miracle like Sandstorm just pulled out here in this game one. Yeah, he doesn't have boots. Oh. Yeah, blasters are rough in 1v2. We talked about it a little bit earlier. Gone. But uh, that D-like ground pound will do it. Yeah. And Blaze and Acto are kind of looking at each other and being like, okay, well, we'll wait for the, the set to start because that was. <laughs> You're like, okay, next. Pretty dominant. Y'all talking about this team and like. We're good. We're chilling. Cutie Dog might have to find some sort of change up. Maybe yeah. this is like that like little bit of like where experience starts to kick in, right? Because again, Acto and Blaze have so much experience. Like, like Cutie Dog experience from Maiden experience kicks in. Oh yeah, he's just gonna he's gonna run on stage yeah. and give him some advice. No, are we, are we allowed? No, uh, no, no mid-set coaching. coaching. No, 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 no mid -side coaching is no mid -side coaching. No experience. Don't do that. Anyway, <laughs> no, you're Yo, talking the about their, their experience in the two yes, space. Yes, in the two space. And that's why when I look at Acno and Blaze, I really do think that they're so consistent as a team that you have to be a top eight seed team to have a chance to beat them. Um, I'm not actually sure where Dog and Cutie are on the seating. They might be. So Acno and Blaze are the higher seed with their red team. Okay. I just don't know how much. Uh, but here we go. Game number two, Acton and Blaze four stocked them very convincingly. I think it was one of the most convincing matches that we've watched so far, even though I would consider these teams very, very competitive. Yo, I mean, like, blue team not looking too terrible right now, as he, he did eat that axe recovery. Left side, he hits the ground pound, but Blaze comes back up as Akno gets both blue team members, but Dog with the wake up. He is sweat beating, but he manages to touch back down. Oh, that's what we can do. Side six does not come through. Blaze. Okay, no, that was Cutie taking down Acto there. I thought it was a friendly fire. Ooh. Waits out, and that's one of those things where it's like, do they drop that off the plan? I don't know. Yeah, that's one of those questions, because I've seen Cutie get that set up so many times where he stands by his, his teammate, dashes Wait, forward, yeah. gets the down light off of the neutral light setup. That's like why you do cross into Spear in general, especially when you do cross with Sean because of the little signatures. Um, Dog's still living, though. Hey, well. That's what I get for saying it. Yeah. Shouldn't have called it out. Um, Brought attention to it, and the red team was like, oh, yeah. Uh, oh, see, yeah there tried you again. I tried. Yeah, I mean, it was a little unfair. I told it was there, but there you go. Acno, now the one with the most damage tied with Cutie. Who's going to go down first here? As Dog and Cutie have stabilized after that game number one. Have brought it back very nicely. Neutral light sent up. Acno comes in, gets that punish there. Cutie getting juggled around. He tries to go for the wake up recovery, but Acno. Still living, and so Cutie comes down and goes, all right, let's go for the power play on the Blaze for a hot minute here. Oh, Sarah comes through. Jumping neutral there from Cutie, trying to get even more down damage. Light, the recovery, blaze. recovery oh! and Blaze with a save from the oh! Axe. Gets that recovery, and let's see. Cutie, there's a dog. Ooh! Okay, there's that side to Acno, and Blaze just like that, even up four stocks to two right away after what was a really dominant lead, honestly, or, or at least a very close game. Yeah, it was looking solid for the blue team, and suddenly not so much as Akno might be deep red, but he's playing far back. Nice side air from Cutie, but Blaze still has some health to play with, and he's starting to back away here. Weapon oh, tosses come nice out, swaps there. over to the blasters. And they were so quick. Yep. Caught, uh, caught Dog out of off guard whoa, way whoa. back. Cutie with the accidental Exhausted? save into, you know what, Dog's saying, I'll just use my exhausted recovery there. Exchanging one of his jumps for not a less powerful move, but one that travels less distance. Still gets it. Oh, Akno can't get the, uh, the vertical team combo there with the downlight after that stomp. Oh, the Dog and Cutie keeping this close. Akno hits the sign light, but that's just some good damage. Not going to be a KO. Oh. Side sink, but Dog not able to interrupt there, and now he's left to the 1v2. He's yeah. got gauntlets. He's got gauntlets, but he's got to avoid. Okay, okay. That, that's actually a great start. Wait, light, wait, side wait. Light, neutral six. Okay, Acno dropping two neutral six now. And Dog could actually take Blaze oh, off the top. He's burning a lot. He's burned a lot, but Acno and Blaze didn't cover the landing, and so now he's getting a ton of damage. There. Oh, Sarah? there, Sarah. Acno's Blaze. just watching. No, no recovery. Acno didn't realize he didn't have a recovery. Dog gets the side air. Yo. He gets the ground pound. Can Dog get the 1v2 one weapon? One more hit, one more hit. He, he doesn't that's need it. it. Acno goes down. And Dog, just like that, after two drop team combos. Is that is that the theme of the day, dude? dude <laughs> tournament nerves. <laughs> tournament nerves. They get up there and just go like, what the heck, I never dropped this online. No, there's just things happening right now where we're watching really seasoned teams drop their follow-ups. Like, I, I I'm convinced Akno didn't go down for their save because he thought that Blaze had the recovery. Yeah. And then Blaze falls, only having Lance side air. And then Akno completely drops to the dog. Dog really clutched there in that game two. And now it's game three with the tied set. Judy and Dog keeping this one close. Potential here for another upset over the Europeans. Double gauntlets on the blue team side as Akno yet to pick up a weapon, finally picks up that spear. Dog immediately down airing him as he goes for a sideline. Oh, 
on Dog. Now really pressuring Blaze the Gauntlets and Blaze and Echo. Don't ask, they, they are not happy with how that last game turned out. Nobody would, but I think for Blaze and Echo in particular, that was an unusual uh, lapse in performance. Um, and so let's see if they can tighten that up here against Kirby Dog in game number three. As Dog has shown that even in a 1v2 against Echo and Blaze, he has what, what it takes what? to get the win. Oh man, he hits the Sair inside of that down sig on the right side. Dog gets the side sig as well, but Akno surviving that side sig not as strong as it used to be. Down light, but Blaze not in position to get the follow up off of Cutie's setup. Nice recovery punish off of that blast. Whoa! Fight. Some friendly fire there where everybody goes on the other side of the screen. I mean, that's as wide as the camera can ever be on Apocalypse. Uh oh. And no stock has flown yet, dude. Siner getting him. Dog can still make it back. There's okay, one. finally. There oh, the goes spear toss. No, I think that just did it. And yeah. Blaze. Uh, Goes a little deep off stage to go for the edge card there unnecessarily and gets the recovery on Cutie still living. They cannot get these stocks. It's a good fast fall recovery from Blaze. Didn't quite take down Cutie though. Off the soft platform, Cutie's got some movement, but it's the recovery from Akno. Takes him down. Blue team just a little bit behind here, but Blaze is deep red. Yeah. Blaze has to think carefully about the next thing that knocks him back here because if he gets hit by Tafar, okay, I just, just have to think about it at all. But I was thinking about if he, he spends too much time coming back to the stage, maybe Akno's in danger. But Akno does just fine, gets two hits on the bow, uh, and gets out of harm's way as Dog doesn't follow him after the sideline. Basically even here in game number three. Akno goes for the jump nair. Cutie with a good dare. Pogo's him away. Starting to dip into the red on both blue team members, though. Oh, that side air. Not feeling good for Akno. Oh, he misses the punish. Doggo, or sorry, Dog, goes for the neutral light, gets caught by the side sig now. Oh. Neutral light from Blaze and Blue Team down to their final stocks. All right, I'd say that this game's in the bag for Akno and Blaze, but we just saw game number two, so we know what's possible here. Uh, Cutie looking for that weapon, takes a ton of damage. Just two axe down lights and a dive kick. Big thing of the gun. That just comes through. Uh, let's see if we get the knockout there. Goes to the ground pound, and the unarmed recovery actually gives Akno a chase dodge. They throw all of the gauntlets off the side of the stage, but and Akno still makes it back. The boy who lives avoids all the weapon tosses there. Akno backing away. There's the recovery from Dog. Blaze not able to interrupt. Final stocks here. Still some health to play with as Dog is the most damaged. Getting close to the red, but not quite there. Oh, and Blaze not even off to go for that weapon. Dog guarding and neutral like through, and Akno was actually ready to uh, just commit to hitting his teammate there on that team combo, but gets interrupted by the blasters. Nice near. Who team hurt? Cutie. They're hurt and neutral light and neutral light. Oh, oh, That's whoa. a ton of damage going on to Dog. Dog getting launched there. Can't afford too many big hits from the red team. Sair misses Cutie. Down light oh. picks up. Akno with the Sair takes down Dog. Cutie's left in the 1v2. All right, Akno, Blaze, down D light side air. Go, oh, D light recovery. That was absolutely called for. Blaze was getting ready, and then Akno was like, I got this, I got this. Goes on the recovery. That's why you saw Blaze drift a little bit further to the left, knowing his knockout uh, times. Really great job. Just being wary of how much damage his opponent had on him and using the right moves to follow up. Now Cutie and Dog about to be into the elimination side of the bracket. Currently down 2-1 against Akno and Blaze. Potential for a game five. Again, that one was so even for the brunt of it, and then suddenly Akno and Blaze started to kick it into gear. Yeah, I think the experience that you were talking about in game one has been showing up even though there were those team combo drops in game number two, because what happens is if the game's very even, well, we can rely on Akno and Blaze to do more so than Dog and Cutie, at least in this matchup is get their alley-oops, get their team combos, so that they can get those knockouts at the same time, as opposed to Dog and Cutie, who are really struggling to take down one opponent down at all. Dude, Cutie took so much damage at the start of this, just trying to get a weapon spawn. Neutral Sig comes out from Akno. Recovery comes out from Akno. Cutie's just getting knocked around right now. Yeah, Dare comes through. Cutie flies up to the top of the stage. Dog dive kicks back, and they're so damaged and so unarmed. Akno's using these down sticks to cover the weapon spawns and pick them up, just hoping that they're going to run to the ice. And that time it works. Puts on a second one. Why not put on a third? Akno's well, so good at these corner guards here. Dog comes in. Good back away to avoid any punish coming out from the red team. Still, both red team members holding on to their initial stocks here. Yeah, Akno goes in for a jump read. Silent Air Sair hits Cutie twice, then tags damage on the dog for good okay. measure. Dog finally gets a knockout, gets the side stick, looks for the landing on the Blaze, doesn't get the downlight, doesn't grab the cancel the downlight either, and he ends up going down. Blaze just jumping right around Dog. Dog takes the bait, goes for the side stick, gets caught for it. Cutie with the Nair, though, will take Blaze down to his final stock. Very rare Need that the I combo. See Gauntlet Nair go that far. Sair? Team combo. Oh. No, it doesn't pivot the Nair. The soft platform, I think, kind of played a role in that one. Weren't sure how he was going to bounce there, but 
did get Acto closer to the orange. This is bringing the blue team back. Cutie, edge guard, misses the ground pound, hits the nair, blazes in position. Dog gonna cover the left side, doesn't go early enough. Yeah, that bow ground pound taking on a nice amount of damage. Acto vulnerable, but Blaze hits Dog towards the side of the stage and it almost falls up off of an Acto speed hit. Whoa! Nice side stick, just sends Dog into the skies. Down stick's not going to be able to do it. And Whoa. the neutral stick interrupted oh. by Acto with the recovery and the stock is obtained. What an amazing interrupt by Acto there. And then oh. Blaze returning the favor right away with that Lance side air, showing why they're so good as a twos team. Keeping their teammates alive and converting to KOs. Acto and Blaze now have the lead here in game number four. Potential to close this one out. Dog coming in, trying to decide who he wants to go for. Hits the side air. Acto in the oh. 1v2, and he's getting the damage and done. The down stick, while it can only grab one opponent with the ice, the arrow that follows afterwards pierces through, hits both Cutie and Dog, and a ton of damage is done off of that win. Acto goes down, but not after doing a ton of extra damage for it. Got to get to the drive through and order that combo. They're not, they're not even trying. They literally didn't even set the card. Oh, man. That's just giving opportunities to the red team now. Blue team trying to slip in. It really looks like Cutie wants to take down Acto. Here's the setup into the side sick, but oh. he misses. Oh, that team combo could have gotten in the game. And it got, could have gotten to game five. They still have a chance, dude. They're still armed, but they're severely damaged, right? So, like, I feel like everybody here is, is like, two hits away from losing the weapon that's in their hands because they're so afraid to refresh. Oh! Two hits of Blaze barely survives Acno for just making sure that he can get back to the stage. Lance picked up. Oh! D-Light Cider. Okay, Blaze went in for that friendly fire to stop Cutie from getting the punish onto Acno. Really well played. Get the follow-up. Oh, oh, no, oh. it misspaces it. Is and there? Cutie gets the side air. Follow-up, ground, ground pound. The neutral light. And now Acno in a 1v2 oh. slides forward with the breakdance. The Oh, it's a neutral signature and one more recovery. It's going to be game five here for the blue team. Can he do oh! it? Down to hits. Oh! Goes to the neutral to get Cutie with the falling stair. Not Still can't get yet. the knockout. And Acto. Sig, but he Acto. doesn't touch the wall. We're going to game five. Acno almost does it again. We he, saw him do know, it at that BCX. Was, that's his signature recovery, he right? He almost and, did it again. And, and I know it's called a signature, but that's the Acno using the Kaya neutral signature to get that little bit of sliding momentum, get the, the line of sight over the stage. The risk is if you miss it, the drift takes so long to fall in. You might be like, Acno, why didn't you hold to the right? Well, it's because at the end of that move, you kind of fall for a bit <laughs> before you can drift towards the stage. Um, wow, what a close game four. Look at this. Yeah, we're going to see that. Oh, wow. We're going right into game number five. But uh, that neutral sig was really, really close to being as clutch as it was at BCX. And now they find themselves in the game five scenario where Cutie and Dog are becoming incredibly tough to fight against. Cutie Dog leveling up within the set. Acno comes in, getting some good damage put out. Cutie in the sweat beef manages to come back down safely. Acno with the juggles might have a little bit of beef with the bald man as he's just focusing down Cutie. Oh, and Cutie tries to get a fade back Nair. Gets punished by Acno for it, but the Pogos gets him out of harm's way. Gets the down. Side okay, sick. nice side sick, actually. Um, on, on to Blaze, but no, no stock is yet. Acno, that is Combo. your teammate into the neutral signature. Beauty misses the ground pound though. Acno and Blaze end up the victors in the stock lead. Side Sig, Blaze with the punish. Acno still living. Kaya surprisingly survivable. What number is the that's your teammate combo at the drive through <laughs> <laughs> The one that nobody that's wants to That's a secret order. menu item. <laughs> <That's> right? <laughs> yeah, that, was, that was brutal. Acno and Blaze still make it work, but they are very close to uh, going down here to their second stocks. This is on the winner's quarterfinal, so winner of this gets in the winner's oh. side of top eight. Uh, loser of this goes to the elimination bracket a lot earlier than they would like. Cider coming through, nice hit, gets a double KO on the recovery on the way back. Acno trying to get that damage with the Mammoth. It's evened up now, four stocks to four in game five. Not over yet by any means. Still health to play with, Cutie and Dog. They don't even have to focus for a team combo, but a team combo would be real nice for them if they can get both red team members stacked up. Right now, Blaze going for the juggle on the Cutie, but a good interrupt from Dog makes sure Cutie doesn't get caught by Acno's follow-up. Side air hits. Acno puts up the down signature, and Dog's punishing it. Blaze gets hit by the side air on the back of the stage of the neutral oh. the center. There's so many clashes. Oh. Look at all the stack oh. damage, and Acno gets out on top with the neutral signature. Blaze tries to catch Dog, dodging in place, but Dog just escapes that situation. A spear recovery is not going to take him out just yet, and Blaze goes back to center stage with the Lance. Sideline air to Ser. Oh. Acno, a perfect finisher to that combo from Blaze, means that they are now two stocks away from victory. Cutie manages to escape the edge guard attempt from Acno. Blaze still very healthy as the side air from Cutie does not take down Acno. Acno, ground pound. Acno oh, with the turnaround. The Dog can't the save him. And Dog, Dog is done. Down. 
what a finish there. Dog had to go down there for Cutie, but Acno and Blaze already in position to get the ground pound there to punish the, the opponent that by all means had to be sent in that trajectory there. And look at how well Dog played on that graph. I mean, the damage was there. I, I can talk about it later, I guess. But, <laughs> it, but yeah, th that was a really great uh, best of five there. Going all the way to game number five. At the very end, Acno and Blaze as dominant as they were at the very beginning. But in between, really, really well played. Hey guys, well, <laughs> I was like, hi, I've hi. been sitting here. Hi, hey How's everyone. No, actually, I'm, I'm watching that match with you guys, literally sitting here and seeing just like how, I can even hear all the audience groan in the back too, just seeing Cutie and Dog like just fall to their, you know, to the KOs. And it's just, man, man, like all these different matches that we've had so far um, leading up to this have just been like back to back. Wow, what's, that's crazy. Like I still am sitting in my head about the match that just happened, and I'm, I'm actually going to let you guys talk about it. I mean, Acno Blaze versus Dog and Cutie Tazza, here. You, you wanted the grab. Yeah, Tazza, you wanted Dog. the grab. Yeah, look at that. Dog was untouched for about half of that game there. Yeah. Um, and, and was His carrying a lot of field. And, and then what happened to Cutie on those last two stocks was just really unfortunate because of how fast they went mm -hmm. down. Uh, Blaze and Echo really capitalizing on them being off stage. But yeah, Dog was playing out of his mind in this best of five. I mean, he single-handedly brought it to a game five in one of those games. Yeah, I mean, it was it was amazing plays. And again, Dog and Cutie, they, they keep coming in here as this team that people are discounting. Of course, they're now down into the elimination side of things. But I think they've kind of shown like, hey, they can kind of hold their own. The fact of the matter, they got it to game five against Acno and Blaze, which is, I think, by a lot of metrics, people wouldn't have expected. Right, right. And uh, that's how I feel like a lot of the matches are going so far here yeah. uh, at San Diego here at DreamHack. There's been some really great cross-region gameplay that's uh, now, at least for Europe, fortunately led mm -hmm. to a win, right? So yes. in, that, in those four teams that can have that top, winner side top eight spots, one of them is now European. Uh, we have two North American teams, Blaze and Acno locking it in for Europe, and that means that the, the match coming after this, maybe South America could do it too. But yeah, what what a crazy game five here, especially that ending there, Blaze and Acno just making sure that everybody knows that they were definitely supposed to win that set with that edge guard. Yeah. Dang. Oh my goodness. And I kind of like want to report in here because I've been looking at the bracket because I, you know, we can't see every single match. We can't catch it all, but they're still playing out here. Well, some of it's being shown on stream. Let me report in here and what I am seeing. What's up? Um, Remember how we talked about Pugsy and Blazy earlier? Yeah, they yeah. got knocked out by Sack and Vecina. 3-2. Big win for this South is, America. And this is on the elimination yeah. side, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm talking about elimination side. That means Pugsy, Blazy. Dumb. Out. And Sack and Vecina, move on. I got I got a couple more updates What's here. Um, let's see. Uh, Loris and Kaina, yeah. out. Ooh, uh, no. Use and Phase on 3-1. Oh, All okay, right. okay, okay, okay. Uh, not the most heartbreaking of defeats. I think that was a, that was a solid match. Would have loved to see that one person. One more. I got one more here because okay. we did talk about Heisen and Simple earlier as uh -huh. well, uh -huh. as you can see here uh, with their match earlier with oh. Java versus Fakey. They oh. went down to elimination, Heisen and Simple, and got three old by Fred Fred Berger and Jeff. Fred Fred Ooh. Berger got the win. Fred, Fred, Fred Berger, Fred, Fred Let's go Berger. Fred. and Jeff three zero. Wow. So that's it. That's that's oh, Tyson and Simple's run. I want to call out one more, yeah. which was that Zyder and Anis knocked out uh, XJ, Cool J, and Jesser, okay. which were were, uh, were doing really well. Yeah. It got an upset, I think, and even took a game off of Luna. They're Stein. the ones who upset Pugsy yeah. Blazy on yeah, the yeah, uh, yeah. pool side, and then, they, like you said, took a game off of uh, Luna and Snowy. So, so the Zyder Knees win there is a pretty big deal because I think some people were kind of sleeping on them yeah. as a team as well. Even though Knees is twice qualified for Royales now. Anyways, they it's, have really, really crazy happening. It's crazy stuff that is literally happening live right now as like these guys are still playing out pools while we still stream some of this stuff and I, I you know we literally just were talking about these players these teams to look out for and some of them are already out that's it that's their end of their doubles run but but I want to say a big buck because I I'm going back. I'm still stuck on the Sandstorm Boomy versus Godly Fozy match. Oh, yeah. I haven't gotten over that yet because I'm sitting in the audience with Sparky. Sparky's reading for Godly and Fozy. I'm reading for Sandstorm Boomy. It's back and forth. And it's crazy that so early in pools, we're seeing such what feels like a championship match just bam, being duped out. And Godly and Fozy are currently, currently doing their. Uh, elimination side run right now. Um, I don't know if you guys have any final thoughts about all the things we've seen so far, all the matches that, that are happening. 
Uh, and I can tell you what's up next, actually. It's Wes Fiend versus Maiden Experience. That's going to be the next match, That's too. That's going to be another really fun one. I mean, it's been it's been super fun so far. I know it's a little bit heartbreaking that we already saw Godly Posey versus Boomy Sandstorm so early, but also it's a really good thing because it's like, oh, that was just like the top 32. There's so much action, so much happening here at DreamHack San Diego. It's already been a blast. It's going to continue to be a blast because we're barely into day one. Yeah. I could say my final thoughts on going into the rest of the bracket here is that I want to see South America representation in this top four, right? In this winner okay. side top eight, which means that I'm actually rooting against made an experience, which hurts me to say that, but I need to see what's being made. You hear that experience? No, 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 no. Okay, Did you hear that? Hey, hey, Did you hear that? He's being a hater again. <laughs> we, need, we need, we need North experience. America, experience. Europe. Do you okay. hear that? All right, all right. <laughs> Having South America, Europe, and North America in winner side of top top eight uh -huh. would be phenomenal. Yeah. I'm not going to complain if made an experience get the win over there, but I would like to be able to see that now that Acno and Blazers secured that spot. Because there was a reality where we could have had four NA teams, and I would have been like, oh, well, that's a bummer. We're going to have to take a very short, quick break before we get into our next match, which is West Fiend versus Made an Experience, as we still are going through top 32. And when we come back, we're going to have Ajax and Sparky up on the desk as well. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back.
Welcome back, everyone, to the tournament that's happening right now at DreamHack San Diego. And we're still making our way through top 32 of the doubles competition. And I'm joined by some new fellas here. Ajax, Sparky, how are you guys doing? Uh, fantastic, other than the fact that the singular time I don't pick Boomstorm for top three, they go and decide to ruin everyone's predictions before the day. But it's San Diego. We're out here. We're having a great time. The food's been awesome. And the company has been even better. I'm just mad at Godly and Fozzy. <laughs> uh, that was, He's that not was, over it. That was their game. That was their game. They had it. They had it in the bag, and then they choked it at the end. They gave it to Boomy and Sandstorm, and then Boomy and Sandstorm went on right after that to lose and go into the elimination <laughs> they, bracket. Yeah. So if there was ever a time, like obviously no one wants to go in the elimination bracket. No one is like, oh, oh boy, golly gee willikers, I can't wait to go down there. <laughs> no, no one wants to do that. But now. You really don't want to do that. You have Boomy and Sandstorm down there. You have Godly and Fozy down there. You have Yuz and on down there. You probably have a lot of other amazing teams down there Doggy as Cutie well. Down there. And Doggy and Cutie down there. And apparently, I didn't see this, Snowy and Luna as well are also down Dude, there. What they is lost yeah, yes, they, they are lost down Game there. 5 to Chavo and Fakie. I didn't see that before this. So predictions be damned. Everything is thrown in the trash. Uh, the, the only team that I had that was still sitting in my top three is Akno and Blaze, and they went Game 5 with Dog Cutie. So... This Land, is crazy. Lands change everything, and it's already it's showing up here. Yeah, it's definitely been crazy, and like my heart's already broken right now because like Meg D and Radish were the ones who put Boomy and Sandstorm in the elimination side. But before we talk more about what's going on in the tournament, we gotta talk about this exclusive merch. Okay, you, you guys, get it now. Scan that QR code because this is a event exclusive uh, merch drop where you can get that cool hoodie, maybe this T-shirt, maybe both. Who knows? But you can grab this right now. It's the Brawlhalla San Diego merch. You don't want to miss it. Uh, and uh, I mentioned this earlier, but I will kindly remind y'all about how that there, there's a special flat rate fee for our international friends when it comes to shipping. That's huge. It's huge. It's huge. Now, also, I want to also remind folks about the timeline, the things that have been happening in the year eight of Brawlhalla Esports, because we've gone through the Winter Championship and the Winter Royale, and now the Spring Championship was literally last week. And now we're here at our first open land at DreamHack San Diego, and but we're not done, because you can see there are other lands and Royales and things all the way leading up to BCX, and oh my god, it's only the beginning of the year is my yeah. point here, okay? It's the beginning of the year. We're already seeing some crazy upsets today at DreamHack San Diego, and I don't even know what's going to even happen in the future, y'all. Yeah, look, <laughs> if you had not the greatest San Diego and you need a little bit of a break, you have that May break, but then Dallas is right around the corner to try and get that W back. A lot of people here are definitely not getting the performances they expected to, and it is not going to be an easy fight to get to that top four, Sparky, but... I mean, just looking back at that, like, again, that game five, and then just what we didn't see in that winner's quarter is like, what, what even is our top three at this point now? Like, this is going to be kind of wild. Yeah, it's going to be it's gonna be really interesting, especially with, like, Java Faky up there. That is a very possibility of that they might make the top four and even push yeah. on to the top three. You can see it there, second from the bottom. It's going to be Java and Faky versus Akno and Blaze. Magni and Radish, of course, are waiting on their opponent, which is going to be the winner of our first set, which you can see it's second from the top. Maiden Experience versus Fiend and Wes. Both players hailing from South America, both players hailing from Brazil, going up against some of North America's finest Maiden Experience. Yeah, this one's interesting, too, because you don't see a lot of set history between international teams because it's not too often you see everybody fight but these teams actually have history it's two to one in favor of maiden experience because of that mid-season invitational where mid uh, maiden experience did win it all that's actually part of why i was originally thinking fiend and west you know i'm a big fan of brazil you actually put me onto them really early on and i have a lot of faith but maiden experience after winters or excuse me springs just just last week it's kind of hard not to think they might come out on top in this but we might just be capping because all of what would make sense for the seeds this tournament have been getting destroyed. Well, I know this next match is really exciting. I know there's a lot of West and Fiend fans out there. So you know what, boys? I'm gonna let you guys take over the action and let's get things started. Well, huge fan of Fiend. Pretty much one of the people who, uh, we talked all, we talk a lot about how South America kind of put the blueprint to success for Spear for people out there and Lance in general. But you talk about those two players right now. You talk about West and Fiend, who's established that. Then on the other side, something about 2v2s just makes experience significantly stronger. 
so even with that skill set that they have, it might not be so easy as made in experience have already proven they could do it more times than one. They're coming off the victory from the 2v2s at Spring Championship just a week ago. Meanwhile, Wes and Fiend, on the other hand, are not quite coming off as hot. They got second place, which is still incredible, but they lost to Yuse and Power. Mm. Yuse, of course, is here teaming alongside Phazon. Not quite sure how they're doing. I know they're in the elimination bracket, but we have this team coming in that got the silver medal at the Spring Championship. They've only really played like five different tournaments together, which actually, that really surprises me. Yep. Because they've they've been like the guys in South America for a really long time. Fiend obviously was like one of the absolute first, and then West kind of came after that. So West and Power and all those guys were kind of like the middle ground between like the Balthazar Fiend days yep. to the like Kinda days that we have now. And Fiend has been a mainstay in every single one of those segments of the history of the South American region. Yeah, it's just, you, when you talk about like notable names, he pops up immediately. Fan favorite for a reason, and it's not gonna change anytime soon. But let's see what they could do here, because again, experience went out of his way to bring Made to mid-season, because he said, me and my boy are going to win. I don't care if he didn't get the original invite, we're going to win, and they did. And then, like you just said, coming off of that W at Springs in another very stacked overall event. You're talking about the strength of the previous BCX champs. With them split, Snowy still doing very well with Luna, but they couldn't they couldn't topple them. So this this has a lot of merit to what that top three could look like. I think especially after those upsets that happen, I think there's a very good world where whoever wins this set is getting to winner's finals. I think there's a real possibility of that. Of course, I put Wes and Fiend in my top three. I put them in third place, uh, so I wouldn't have, well, I, you know, they could go through the winner's finals and then end up losing that and then go down into the elimination, and that's where they find their third place, top according 12. to my predictions. But yeah, you see it on the screen right now. We're getting into the top 12. It's made an experience on the Classic Chronics, one of the absolute best team comps in the game, if you ask them and if you ask me as well. Yeah, and of course, everybody's new favorite home apocalypse is the end of days for many, and the end of the bracket runs we're going to see an early stock already going away on the Fiend. Fiend have no time whatsoever to get something started. That was really fast. That cannon can be so devastating in twos. There are not a lot of people who play it. Experience is absolutely one of the best. Yes. That's why he was able to take out Fiend so early. And Fiend, we know. Fiend is a stock tank. Even though he's playing a lower defense legend coming out with the Hattori. Let's see, what stance is he on? He is on the defense stance. So he's going from four to five. That's going to give him a little bit more survivability. But uh, Experience is going to say, defense be darned. I'm going to send you down with a ground pound. I'm going to end that stock so early. He's looking to extend the edge guard against West. Meanwhile, on the right side, Fiend fending off May. Fiend comes in, but just throws a side signature, isn't able to really relieve any pressure whatsoever. Yeah, Experience has just kind of been piecing everybody up by him so far from the left, too. Like, nobody's been able to stop any of his edge guards. He's going to go and chase off the soft platform. Gets the continues to push. High recovery from Fiend, smartly using that there to get back down. But every time they get in the middle, the blue team is continuously getting separated as we see West disappear. Dude, experience is going crazy right now. It has been like a minute and 10 seconds into this game. He is going crazy. We have to see the graph from him after this, because he's not taking too much damage. He's putting out so much damage. Experience is doing a tremendous job. Mate is doing a good job following up. Yep. This game is being quote unquote like carried by Experience in that he's just like doing everything perfectly and Mate is just also doing everything really well. I mean, look at them off stage. They are they are lower and they're still controlling that 2v1 perfectly. West has no options. Gonna go for a full charge recovery to try and catch Experience slipping, but they still are sitting both in the red on their first stock. They have not lost one yet. Looking for Fiend to get some Something started, but it's been so difficult as he tries to get him with that GCD light, and he just gets reversed. Fiend is a very cheeky player. Like, we know that from all of his weapon tosses, the way he can play unarmed against people when he's at the weapon disadvantage, and yet the cheekiness is not catching made. It's not catching experience. Wesley tried to do something cheeky as well, like that recovery that you called out, but no, experience was right there, floating straight up and down, didn't get caught, and grabbed the punish off of it. And that's gonna be one right there. Wes is now leaving Fiend up to his own self, but luckily, experience got sent away. That could have been a lot worse. That does doesn't really seem to matter though. Dude. Experience going to chase after West. West is in the yellow and it doesn't matter. They're still trying to get rid of him. Experience's chase there was amazing. Maid's going to actually pick up a kill on Defeat, taking him out of the game. It is four stocks to one. Let's see Maid and West in the 1v1. He just waits it out. Waits it out simply, hits the sidelight into the recovery. Yeah, there's many times again, we, we try to remain an eternal optimist for a long period of time, but that yeah. game belonged to experience. A 565 damage, only 200 taken in the middle of that. He had three of the KOs. He lined up everything phenomenally. 
it just felt like Maid didn't have to stress because all he had to do was line it up for experience to pop off and Fiend being so early on that last stock, how do you rebound from that when he's playing that good? You start thinking about game two. This red team is looking phenomenal right now. This is looking like already a top three, if not a top two, if not a tournament winning team. And uh, like we're going to call it this early in the bracket because there is still some room to go. They're not even yep. in the top four yet. In fact, they're a set before the qualifier for that. You can see we didn't even get to look at the graph because we are going <laughs> right on into this next one. Maiden Experience want to capitalize off of all of the momentum that they have. So when you're hot, you're hot. You don't want to stop. You want to keep things going. And I mean, you were talking about the, the cannon. Like, cannon has been sporting good wins. I mean, it's the BCX champ weapon. You're talking about how good he's been playing here. This, can th this cannon has been so good for experience because he was switching a ton between Legends for a little bit, but now this, like, this has been working so well. Like you said, the cross Onyx play has been dominant for them. But at least right now, it looks like West and Fiend, up until that point, were doing much better to start off game two. Yeah, if you look at the top right of your screen, it's reasonably even. If you look at West, he's the one taking the greater part of the damage. But if you average out all of the damage together, it's pretty much even. A little bit of team damage coming out from West onto Fiend right there. He ended up catching Maid towards the end of that. The side air actually putting Maid into some team damage on top of Experience. Yo, the unarmed down air. Experience is going off, off stage in the unarmed, getting KOs, moves over to the left side, grabs a double, he's going crazy! Bro, that movement bait was clean. Weapon toss out and he faded in to make it look like he will go for GC ground pound into the wall. Instead faded back last second to trip him up and then still closed out another. Maid is going to fall. Experience does fall quick, uh, shortly after, so at least they minimized the damage this time, but they haven't been able to strike first. They need to start doing that ASAP and they're missing out on some strings. You can't be dropping those. Every single little bit of damage left behind is going to be that much worse as the game comes closer. I mean, look at how many games we've already seen that struggle to find the continuity. That was a beautiful deal, like ground pound coming out from Fiend. But they struggle to find the continuity in the 2v1 team combos. We've seen so many drop today. That's been a, a huge theme a of the day, wild actually. Number. So many 2v1s have gone to the one person because of those drop combos. And if that's happening to the blue team, they're going to struggle here because Experience and Mate are on the same page. Yeah, that Sandstorm Boom you said. There was the game five that happened because they didn't close it. I believe it was on QD oh. at the time. And now we're going to see one fall made Maid might get closed, oh, excuse me, Experience might get closed out over here on the left, but good save from Maid to stop West from going out there to find that side air. Over on the left side, Fiend went for a gravity cancel neutral signature on the Sword of Hattori, and somehow Experience found perfect priority, perfect timing to hit the ground pound and interrupt that gravity cancel neutral signature and find the KO. Fiend definitely at least looking a lot better here in this game. Is on his last stock, but he's in the middle of the fray and he's making it work. You need Fiend to pop off. Like we said, he is a big combo starter. He is a clip machine. And if you can't line up those D lights to get, allow West to close it out, especially with Axe in hand, you're going to be asking for trouble. But they do have a lead. West is going to line up that. There we go. This close it on huge. the right. He missed the recovery. That was a little bit of a bold pick. I don't know why he really went for the recovery there. I think it would be a GC neutral light, to be honest. But something like, like something to send more to the right. Yeah. Because the up wasn't going to KO. If you send to the right, that sets up a further edge guard. Because he was only in the orange. So that was an interesting choice from West. Maybe he was trying to hit the bottom side of it. So he would get the spike down. I'm not sure. Experience is going to have to go in sweat beads, but gets the reversal there with the Saren. Actually gets the ground touch, so Wes has to fight his way back. Meanwhile, Maid doing everything he can to try and line up for Fiend. That's a Tori, so he doesn't really have much leeway to work with here. That's going to be a That's great big. recovery punish, though. Now they get the 2v1. Wes is just chasing into the air. Fiend is putting a lot of distance between himself and Experience. It's for good reason. He's going to let Wes take the lead here. Oh, I'm looking for that Nair. He's going to be able to get back onto stage, but Wes and Fiend being very careful about when he decided to go in does not get the closeout. Oh, no! Accidentally hits Fiend! That's a huge misplay. Once again, Sparky, yet yeah, another 2v1 that hasn't been working out in favor of the team with the two. Oh, is Experience going to take this one? He's definitely more known as a 2v2 player than a 1v1 player, and Wes is kind of known as both. Wes looking for the Axe D-Sync before not he's not going to be able to close it out. One recovery on a missed spot. Uh, it looked like he was looking for a dodgy, but that's oh! going to be experience popping off on that one. He made it work again. That's like the third time today on the stage. Look at, like, experience is in the screen. Like, his eyes are wide open. You better be hyped up after that. And I just heard we're going to get the graph from the first one. Look at it. Oh, my gosh. That wedge is so big from experience, dude. Same thing with Maid. Look how long those stocks lasted. And then look at Fiend. Look how long that's uh, There we go. We have a much more even game. The graphs are much more even. It was last stock red for both experience and Wes at the end of it. Just night and day difference. But in the end, 
it may not matter. Yeah. Because experience still took it. You saw him pop off. The mental of experience is like his best friend and also his worst enemy. If he gets in his head too much, that's when he starts to spiral. But when he has the momentum like this right now, I think he's all but unstoppable. We never see that spiral as much in twos. Like, that's the biggest difference with experience. Like, when he has someone, he's, like, almost relying on him to, like, make the clutch plays. He always does. And instead of what should be a one-to-one -one set right now, looking at 2-0, it's already shown before. Like we said, we don't see a lot of international matchups before, but it seems like made an experience understand how to deal with this very aggressive team of South America. Weston, Weston Fiend, they, they only have, they can't make any more mistakes. They're down 2-0. You're seeing the D-Light into the side air come out from Maid. Experience taking a lot of damage here, and virtually kind of nobody else is Maid is in the orange, if anything. But Wes and Fiend, man, they're sitting pretty in the yellow. Nice down air, makes a connection. Grabs both with that neutral light as well. You see Fiend starting to feel some confidence with the dash D-Light off the stage. Uh, D-Light side is going to send them back off stage too. They've had complete stage control. Here goes Fiend to go try to chase that victory. Experience, experience, going to get his way back on. But luckily for them, because they separated him, Wes was able to seal the deal on Maid, and they shortly after get them very high. Hot start for the blue team. West coming in with the down air on the lance. The recovery from Fiend's sword made. Putting some time on that soft platform, giving himself a little bit of room, but Wes and Fiend, man, I said experience looked unstoppable. I mean, Maid is like right there behind yeah. him as well, but all of a sudden, a huge turn from Wes and Fiend with a gigantic lead. They're going to be looking to take out Fiend first, probably. Lower defense, very damaged. Fiend over on the edge, you saw that cannon ground pound coming in from experience, didn't make contact. Yeah, if there's any big difference I'm seeing, Sparky, is the, like, the energy shift I'm seeing in Fiend's play. He's getting a lot more combo starters, and he's actually not like overextending. He was trying so hard to force something before and he would just get punished by Maid because he was trying to chase experience, which is going to allow experience to get the reversal afterwards. You, get, you have to be very careful about your stage positioning off stage against them. Luckily for them, though, they get rid of uh, they get rid of Wes. Fiend still holding on to his first stock, so he's playing significantly better compared to those first two games. It was looking like they wanted to juggle him. Uh, Maid was jumping up there with the neutral airs on the blasters, but Fiend was actually able to land. That side air does make a connection, even though it's on the right side of the stage. Yo, if they get this, because Maid is right there on his tail. What an incredible route West took. He didn't panic. He stood still. He knew he had time with that extremely long uh, charge you could get off that uh, Lance recovery. But if you freaked out, you're getting caught by Nair. You're getting caught on the left-hand side if you spot dodge a little bit too early. That could have been tragic. That was great composure coming out from West. And he knows he has to. They're down 0-2 in this set. We talked about it earlier, man. No one wants to go into the... Elimination bracket, West sending Maid down, Fiend with the save. save. Experience there to add up more damage, but Fiend with the counter punish, hitting the side air, splitting up the red team. I think West is understanding, like they're getting hyper aggressive off stage, they want the big play, so he's just punishing him for it. Oh no, he's oh, gonna accidentally no. catch Fiend! He had such a good play there, but it's gonna end up being Fiend who goes down. He does get back on past experience, but that changes things up a bit. If he hit his opponent, and Fiend at the same time, that is 100% a good trade for the blue team. That's a little bit of a rough spot, though, because Wes, very damaged. You see, Maid was already looking for the KO. He went for the side light, was waiting to see how Wes reacted before finding his follow-up. He's been doing a lot of side light into the recoveries for the KOs. Might not matter. D-Light into the side air from Fiend, changing his attention to Experience. Trying to take care of him. Experience looking for the follow-up off of Maid, but Maid didn't really believe enough in that position to try and maybe go for a Nair or try and catch him with the recovery. But Wes, unarmed, doing his best to try to get in. It's going to be a GC. D-Light into a Sarah, and now we're at an even game. Fiend, he wants the KO onto Experience, or at least to put out a little bit more damage until Experience is in KO damage, and they can find the knockout neutral, and Fiend just barely holding on. Blue team barely ever so slightly in the lead, but you do not want to have to have this come down to a 2v1. Fiend, gonna oh! catch the anti here. That's a great job catching Experience, and now they have made off stage. Oh, look at that weapon toss, no <laughs> way! No way, what a weapon toss coming out from Fiend. That was like from the left third of the stage. The arc on that was gorgeous. The Hail Mary and it connected. Be most beautiful pass we've seen all day and Fiend hovering over that soft platform to make sure that uh, Maid doesn't have a free recovery and catches him with the side there. They are not done yet. That's gonna get us to a two, v one, a two to one position. And again, you think back to that game too. This could have been two one in favor of West Fiend potentially if they stopped that two v one that experience was able to, to like win out of but nobody's been able to comfortably win that. Even right there, you saw they were being very careful about where they stood, so Maid couldn't sneak one out. Yup. Oh man, that Team KO, even with that, they still had enough of a lead to solidify the victory. That, there was just so much chaos right there with the beautiful neutral signature from Fiend's Spear, and that was the final KO. I'm still I'm still on that weapon toss, man. Yeah. Like, we mentioned Fiend being a cheeky player earlier. He helped like 
I don't want to say uh, use a pun here, so forgive me for this. He, he spearheaded the weapon <laughs> toss game and how you incorporate that into your play. People like Snowy have probably learned from the way that Fiend throw their weapon. That had perfect fade away from the three-point line. It was like beautiful, it was, man. It, he, he, he still had his hand up at the end before yeah. it went out. So, like, if you could... If you can make someone feel pressure like that while Weapon Toss is coming through and controlling the stage, you might be able to sneak one out. And they're going quick and oh, in a Fiend, hurry. Okay. <laughs> I was worried he was going to be below experience and experience was going to find the edge guard to confirm that KO and knock Fiend out in the orange. That would have been a huge lead for the red team. But no, they're going to deny that one blue team. It's just Ooh. a little bit of the leap. That cannon, dude. This is a big reversal potential right now. But made smart, very smartly on made. He knew the experience was too far out there. Just get in the way. If somebody's going to get hit, let it be you. Because you have way less damage. Don't let experience or any of the sweat beads fall in that position. So overall, the damage is actually pretty even between these two. Because main experience are in the orange. Fiend is in the red. But Wes is kind of in the yellow. The only problem with Wes and Fiend here is when you're that disjunct, then Fiend gets knocked out. They do a bunch of damage onto Wes. All of a sudden, he's in the red. Fiend respawns. He's in the yellow. And you just kind of go back yeah. and forth and back and forth. And it's it's sort of like a bad pacing for the game. You basically want to be even with your teammate. Well, even as possible right now. One for one trade a little while ago. Uh, Experience trying to catch that weapon toss on Fiend. And Fiend just trying to walk his way on. Surprisingly, they were more hyper-focused on him than trying to make a power play on the West. But I think it's just because Wes had Axe in hand, you don't want to accidentally make a mistake over him and lose that to that Axe recovery when experience is on the soft platform. Beautiful spot dodge from May to get through that Axe neutral light from West and the punish with the GC D-Light recovery into the KO. Just beautiful gameplay coming out from May as well. We've been talking a lot about experience. Yep. And again, that's because he's giving us like 12 out of 10 gameplay. And meanwhile, Maid is giving like 9 out of 10 gameplay. So still incredible gameplay. Yeah, at the end of the day, like doesn't matter how many KOs one person has on the other. The only thing that matters is that W in the column. Because yep. if you don't have that, who cares if you got six, uh, five KOs by yourself? Made an experience are very good at capitalizing, oh, but each other's experience is going to capitalize big on Wes. That puts them down, and experience still holding up to that first stock as Fiend also falls. Wes on final stock, Fiend on final stock. Made an experience up to one in this best of five set. They have five stocks to their name right now. Wes and Fiend got to oh, find white. something real quick, and it's not all the way up there because you're going to find the blast no! zone, but it's going to be off the bottom. Ground pound for Maid's blasters. Fiend in the one. V2 of his life. Oh, they took him out back. That was bad. Like, Wes had no shot. It was nothing he could do because Fiend kept getting separated. Now Fiend is just going to jump into the blast zone. Made an experience. Do not join the company of everyone else who's been on the higher seeds of this bracket and dropping down to that Alim side. Made an experience. Now get a very good trip up towards top eight. They have now confirmed themselves as one of the remaining teams in the top eight winner's semis position. Main experience coming out in that 3-1 with an extremely dominant game four. They showed a lot of that clutch factor throughout that entire set. Even look in the at, game that was close. Look at look that, at experience man. Again. Experience did not lose that first stock. And then if you look at his numbers, they're incredible as well. He did more damage than Maid. Again, Maid didn't do bad damage. Experience just did great damage. That th this is the look of the experience we've seen win championships. Like yep. this, this, this is prime experience right now. That nobody's gonna be happy enough to deal with that. That's gonna be Megdi and Raidish who have to fight that afterwards. Who took out Sandstorm Boomy in a three to one set. I think this is the team to be afraid of right now. If I, I'm looking at the, the remainders in winner's side, as good as everybody else has played, everyone else had game fives that were like very scary. Experience is playing better than everyone else right now. And that can be the really scary thing about Maiden Experience is they have their good days, they have their great days, but they also have their bad days. Mm -hmm. But rarely do they have a day that's like half and half where they start off bad yeah. and then all of a sudden turn it around or start off good and then fall apart. So the fact that they are starting off this well at this point in the tournament, they could easily take the gold medal home. Yeah, that's why I'm very interested as to how they play out come Sunday. Because remember, everybody... That is yeah, interesting. It is it is top four on Sunday. So if they get through this next winner's semi set against Radish and Meg D, they have that gap day. Do they replicate that? Or that also depends, of course, if uh, you know if they even get through uh, Meg D and Radish because they haven't been dropping many games either. And that's a team we were expecting to eventually do very well, except you know they only had just started. Last time they were out, Meg D was looking phenomenal in twos. So that could be, you know, that's one of the strongest defensive cores you could ask for. That could be the problem that maybe shuts down experience and mate.
Yeah, Megdi and Radish. Uh, I don't think very many people put them in their predictions for, I don't think I saw for top three. I mean, we, we briefly mentioned them on the pre-show, but, but other than that, I don't think anybody was really putting Maiden Experience up there, even in that, like, maybe fourth I position. had them for my fourth, Your but fourth? as the okay. team, I, that was the team that I expected if anybody was going to cause a breakdown of that top three, it was them. I would not be upset if they took apart my top three. Except everyone else has been taking apart <laughs> yeah, my top three, so uh, it's uh, it's not been a good, it's not been an easy ride for anyone. We're talking about the, the other upsets, and we got to lean back into it too. The confirmed winners' semis matches so far are Java and Fakie, Agno Blaze. Java and Fakie are there, three two yep. over Luna. Yep. It's Snowy. You talk about one of those other upsetters. It's gonna be Java and Fakie. Man, like what? Uh, out, of, out of nowhere? The return of Odvar. What's going on here with Java and Fakey? I, I I truly believe after what I was seeing, like Java's Java's back home. He he has he has Bodvar back because he was looking great on Hattori. He was making that work, and it, we 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 saw that even with the loss of Hamry before, he's fine. He's just that good. But now it's back, and it was looking amazing earlier. And uh, I mean, also like that three zero against Heisen and Simple. Most of that was on the heels of consistent KOs that from wild. that Bodvar hammer. That was so wild. Seeing them 3-0 simple and Heisen was just like, whoa, okay, yeah. all right. I gotta. I, I need to really start paying attention to this team. They did get fourth at the Spring Championship 2023, but then when we incorporate all of the other regions into something like this tournament that we have right now in front of us, that's when I'm like, okay, your fourth and fifth placers, they start to fall off yep. once you add in the best teams from all of the other regions. But Java and Fakie, man, already shocked the world incredible work took out luna and snowy in game five before that they took out heisen and simple 3-0 like we mentioned and now they're in a top four qualifier match yeah like look Lance, on the winner's side ajax lands hit different man like we were just seeing everybody was kind of hanging out over in the, the lobby area there just yeah, getting some games in or playing out their bracket matches all the online play, like, there's a lot of hype sets that come from that, but when you're in the room, the energy around you, the people watching, the feel of wanting to be the, the big name on stage, sometimes that pressure hits, and I feel like that pressure's been hitting a lot of people today who we normally expect to just, you know, win out in those spots who were normally comfortable there. I think that the pressure's settling in for some, and also the fact that Java and Fakie just kind of popped off. Like, I mean, they, they, are, they are looking phenomenal uh, today, so... I <laughs> They really are in the top four qualifier right now against Acto and Yeah, Blaze. that's so wild. And that's why I think this tournament specifically, DreamHack San Diego, could be a really interesting one mm -hmm. for a lot of different players because, like, this is our first open land back since the World Championship, right? Everyone yes. came to the World Championship. Everyone's like, oh, these people I haven't seen in years and years. We're coming off of pandemic, forcing everybody online. I'm so excited to be here. It's so much fun. We love Rahal and all that. But then you have this event which we've already had the world championship. Everybody got that like homecoming and to see everybody that they've talked to online for years. But now all of a sudden, it seems like this is hammer time. Yeah. They enjoy seeing their friends, of course, but this is game time, baby. This is this is the, that real stuff. And some people are cracking under the pressure and others are turning carbon into diamonds. That's why I'm, I, that's why I'm excited to see this also because we put a lot of talk on the Java in Fakie a second ago. When we talk about Acto and Blazer back up here. This is a team that, we always looked at it, it's like, this is the winningest team in all of Brahala. Across EU, they were the dominant force, yep. and now they have struggled a little bit with Godly and Fozzy of late, but they still got third at BCX, and incredible runs. They also had that incredible clutch game that they had against Experience and Made that got them the third in the first place. So they know what it's like to be on the stage. They know what it's like to win in these positions. This is one of the teams I also had in my top three because of that. They know what it's like to be here. But a bigger reason, Blaze, after the last time out, said, it's time to stop playing around. I haven't been putting as much effort as I should be into this. I'm going to put that effort in, and I'm going to win. And I think that big boat of confidence is going to help them get there and not allow them to fall to Java and Vicky. I would not have put Acno and Blaze in my top three, but if you had to, if you asked me if they were top eight, I'd say probably. If you asked me if they top five, I said I think there's a good chance. <laughs> but the fact that they're in a top four qualifier match here. I'm curious what they got for us. The fact that they won against Dog and Cutie after Dog and Cutie have been playing amazingly. Yeah. <laughs> but there was there were a handful of those 2v1 combos that they kind of threw. 
that they dropped. And those are those things that you that you practice with your teammate. Like, we know how good people are yep. at 2v1 combos. That's something you can 100% prepare ahead of time. So usually, you don't throw those. But all of a sudden, man, the 2v1s are not as one-sided as they used to be. Yeah, normally, it's just a free dub and a handshake once yep. you get to that position, especially when you're up decently. But they haven't mattered. That's, we've seen, I think it was three or four so far here on the main stage in day one. Like you said, pressure settles in. But usually not everybody crumbles to the pressure, but that's multiple top tier teams that have been falling in those spots. I think Acto and Blaze have it. I think Blaze is a different animal when he's in that 2v1 in 2v2 specifically, like something a, a very similar to experience. When it's 2v2s, Blaze becomes an even better 1v1 player as well. Like when he's in that 2v2 format, he can make it work. But Acto's also knows how to do it too. I. Honestly, though, I'm kind of scared of that job of Bodvar back. I mean, I, I, I think too. I'm super I'm afraid too. of that Bodvar being back. So that might. I'm curious to see. Like, we haven't really seen a return of like, like a lot of the EU Bodvars, so they might not be as prepped for that. Or even some of the South American Bodvars. If we're looking True. at like Kaina, if we're looking at Morris, and some of the other players that played Bodvar in South America as well. It's still kind of alive and well in Southeast Asia with like Sire and Himwe, but even then, still I don't think as much as popular with those players as it used to be. So yeah, maybe this could be the rise. Maybe I'm gonna start all of a sudden seeing a lot more Bodvars in my ranked games. I hope not. <laughs> I, I really say, is that not. something that you're begging for here? No, it's <laughs> not. I don't want it. I mean, we saw a couple of Taros just pull back up as well over Springs too. We I don't want that either. <laughs> we were in a golden age where I didn't see those legends in my rank games, and then all of a sudden, I'm starting to see more Taros now. S somewhere in the building, Duke is going, yes. But it's uh, it, 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 yeah, it's uh, yet another L for you as well. <laughs> but uh, we're gonna be getting into that momentarily again. This is uh, a qualifier for top four. This yes. is to get into winners finals. That guarantees you a trip to the podium. That matters so much for so many reasons, and you want to get to that winners finals because you can get that most comfortable seat in the house in grand finals on winners side. You do not want to take a trip down to the literal just monster pit of. Elimination side. Let me just let's take a quick look at what's going on. Just down give here. me some of those names so, of the the fearsome warriors. Impala and Clem are out to anime and whoops. They're fighting up against Wes and Fiend in our set. Phazon and Yuz are down because they had to fight the unfortunate trap of Godly and Bozy. Uh, Sack and Vecina is still doing. Actually, Sack and Vecina are out to Dog and Cutie, which is another very strong team we would expect to be yep. there. Uh, and then Sandstorm and Boomy will be going to make up against Zyder and Knees in a little while, which I believe we're going to potentially see on the stream itself. So. We're still seeing Fiend. Oh my God! It would be top eight: Fiend, West, Sandstorm, Boomy. Oh, oh, Snowy and Luna. I almost missed that. Luna, Snowy, Godly, Fozy is to get into yep. top eight. Well, yep. here we go. Game number one. It already started off. I was a little unfocused. That oh, might be some replays. Okay. These are highlights. They, I didn't went into. I, I got real afraid. I wasn't talking about that for a second. But just like Acto and Blaze were able to stop what was another. Top three seeded team, or top, or top four seeded team, I believe, to get into the elimination side. Dog and Cutie almost made it happen. Yeah, Dog and Cutie coming in seed five up against Acno and Blaze. That was a nice KO there. The weapon toss up, a little bit of a distraction. Let Blaze come in, hit that axe in light. Got the KO there. Beautiful D light side air from Acno. Kind of a regrouping here, so Cutie doesn't get any cheeky KOs. And like moments right, like right there, Acno did the right move by going for the D light into the recovery, of course. And Blaze was right there just in case he went for the side air. But that move right there of Lance players following up with side airs have really not been working. Obviously, no. that wasn't the case with that right there because that wasn't the point of it. Look, but so many Lance players, like Fozy as well, they've been missing those side air follow-ups when their teammate hands them their opponent. I've seen a lot of true combos drop today, and I've yep. seen a lot of team combos, especially with Lance, like you said, drop today. Uh, you can't, you just can't, you just can't be doing that. Like it's, it, tough. I, it's easy, of course. In hindsight, 2020, it's easy to say, oh yeah, just do it. But really, no, just do it. Like you can't leave damage like that on the table against the caliber of play we've seen today. Like, and I think the pressure is even more on for the top seeded teams because of how many upsets that have happened. You don't want to be the next one to have it happen to. It's like, wait, no, 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 not us, not us. Uh, Acto and Blaze are definitely capable of stopping that, but Java and Fiki have been putting, uh, making us put respect on their name for good reason here today. That's Acno in the top left of your screen. Blaze in the bottom left of your screen. Bottom right is going to be Java, and then top right, of course, by process of elimination, is Fakie. This is one of the, I think, the first times I personally, 
I think have ever seen Faki in person. I've seen Java yep. before, obviously seen Akno and Blaze millions of times, but this is one of my first times actually seeing Faki. Always good to put a face to yep. the name. They're going to be wanting to uh, come out on top. Obviously, uh, <laughs> no one's going to be surprised by so, that. I, one, no, I, would, I would like to. I would like to lose this set. I would. I would like to uh, not, not, not come out on top of this set. <laughs> but honestly, uh, something to play off of what you just said too. One of my favorite things about lands in general is getting to put faces to the names. Like, there's so many people that I, I, you know, I've still been meeting a lot of new faces that I have been able to uh, meet throughout the years. Obviously, I kind of came in a little more towards the online era of this. But it's nice to get to see everybody in person. It's nice to see a lot of people uh, like just having a good time. The one of the best parts about going to land, to be honest. It's not just the tournament experience, but it's the after tournament experience of going to get food with everybody, going to hang out, checking out the pier that's like right behind us here. Going, there's just so many good things. Uh, we ran into like the EU crew at the San Diego Zoo like seven times somehow in that massive zoo on Thursday. And it was just a fun time each time. And this is things you don't get just through online. So that's why I'm so winners happy to see that we are back. And we are back at it because we got winner semis, the first match of winner's top eight starting off now. And this is where you have to separate the fun from the business. The game starts, it's business time. Akno and Blaze coming out here, of course, on the Kaya and Olgrim. No surprise there whatsoever. Fakey on the Hattori and Java on that Bodvar like we've been talking about. I haven't seen too much Fakey gameplay, of course, because he's a much better player than me, so I'm not queuing into <laughs> him on that ranked ladder. Really, the only times I get to see him are the few times that he's been on stream. Yeah, Akno always being one of the staples of not just bow gameplay, but also showing that Kaya still works just fine. There was a couple changes, of course, post-PCX, uh, not only uh, cruising through the uh, winner's side of uh, ones with Impala there. But a lot of people seeing how strong that legend is. However, she is going to be set packing as Akno is the first one falling here. It's going to be first strike going the way of Java and Fakey. There is a hammer out, so they could be looking to take out Blaze pretty quickly as well. But no, it seems like they're focused really on Akno. Now Java's starting to move over onto that soft platform. Gets hit by Blaze's recovery. Look at the beautiful synchronization between Blaze and Akno with that split weapon toss. One to the left, one to the right. Yeah, making sure they keep everybody separated as possible. Java's not going to be able to find that KO just yet, but great this line up neutralized. Big team gobble, oh closing it out. That was gosh. almost Akno going down to his first, the only last stock this early. And that weapon toss from Blaze threaded the needle in like the worst way possible for the blue team. It's threading yep. one of those needles where you don't want to thread the needle. You want to hit the left wall or the right wall of the needle. Something to interrupt that <laughs> amazing combo that they found so quickly onto Akno. Basically put him into KO damage, which then turns around. They get the stock. It's four stocks to three. And Java and Fakey trying to get a team combo over here on Blaze. But uh, Bla not Bla <laughs> Blaze, not Blaze. Uh, falling off to the side, getting away smartly there. But they haven't really been able to line up too much. We said it before. It's kind of been hard to get some team combos. But I like what Java and Fakey are doing. They're kind of staying around that soft platform so no D-Light starters will come up from Bow so they could get something going. They're playing around that side very well. Jump side air coming out from Java, follows it up off the edge. Meanwhile, Fakey keeping Akno over on the right side. He has to go over to the wall. Beautiful stomp into the recovery. Coming out from Java, his hammer is going crazy. As we said before, the hammer from Java has been the nightmare scenario for many as he keeps snatching him out of the skies and he is not done yet. Akno already deep in the red. Akno just trying to get around this ground pound. He does smartly from Blaze. He gets out there to go help him, but you, can, you only have so many more mistakes left for Akno over there on the edge. I can't believe he's held on to this final stock for as long as he has, given the, the damage they put out on him so quickly. Java with the side leg, it's juggled a little bit. The weapon toss coming out. It does get picked up towards the end. Blaze there on the bottom, charging up that recovery. Not enough, he is gonna be done. And that is a four stock in game one for Java and Fakey, with Java doing 653 damage. Bro, what is going on today? Like, Bla Blaze made a good attempt to try to get that ground pound reversal off stage to try and sneak something out. It doesn't matter. Fakey dodged him, and then, like you said, 600 plus damage for Java. And right there was really good. Akno faded underneath quickly to make sure they got that double KO, but it didn't matter. They rebounded so well. The revenge KOs were on point. Akno was getting destroyed in many regards that like how do you how do you rebound from that is the question look at that 402 damage on the spear faking lined up everything perfectly for him and if you're lining up everything right into the hands of hammer well you're disappearing fast 
So I, I pulled up a tweet here from Java from March 26th. He said, IRL circumstances have left me unable to practice basically at all this year. So I'm unsurprised by doing poorly. My story isn't over in this game and I'll grind for 1,000 more years before leaving without a gold. Two, Only improvement one, from four. here, catch me and Fakie destroying Sunday. Now, I believe that was referring to Spring Championship Sunday, but uh, there's a very real chance that that could also apply to this Sunday on finals day based on the way that Java and Fakie he played game one. I feel like I read that quote in Art of War. I didn't know Java read, <laughs> I wrote that. <laughs> I mean, he is currently oh, going to war wow. right now. That's another attempt at a pogo. Blaze can't get by. That's three. Fakie oh, continuing it. And dude, he, he's done. That was, we haven't even hit seven minute 30 seconds and they're both gone. I can't believe they got the full team wipe on that. Akno deleted, Blaze deleted, Java and Fakie just have so much momentum on their side. And this is after Akno is swapping onto the Koji. I am sorry for hyping up experience so much. They said, look, stop talking about that last set. Yeah. Pay close attention to what we have done. Fake is going to fall, but that was, again, after so much damage has already been done, trying to get something started on Java. Java doesn't care. He really doesn't care. It's like, look, I'm going to swing stairs. Go ahead. Try and hit me. And they just, the, the power play did not exist. And Akno did not engage in that offstage at all. You saw Java go in with a ground pound, and Akno was like, I'm not even seeing this. I'm, <laughs> I'm walking away. I'm on the stage. I'm going to go help my teammate because I don't want to mess with the Universal potential that Hammer has on the edge. Yeah, and, then, and oh, there's going to be a Somps there. They're going to go ahead and make an attempt on the Akno. Akno smartly separating and switching sides back and forth to not try to get anything big started. Akno, however, is yet again already on his last stock. One whole minute after he just got speed ran on his first one, and Java refuses to give up his first one. The entire blue team has uh, combined three stocks. Hey, guess what? So does Java. <laughs> He has as many stocks as the entire blue team combined. Neutralite comes out with a follow-up from Fakie to get the KO onto Blaze. Akno luckily only has to fight the 1v1 because they did find the KO and actually counts as a double KO for Akno. Signs of life definitely still here for the blue yep. team. They, the craziest part about this too is that even if, you know, the win condition on board is to get rid of Fakie. You want the 2v1. But they haven't been the cleanest in 2v1 so far. It happened earlier with that QD dog set too. So Java might be able to make that one happen just like everyone else. Let's see Java. You see him chasing over onto the edge, but he's still very careful with it. Put enough room between Akno and him. Only really threw out that weapon toss, and he picked one up right after that. Ooh, good job from Akno after picking up his teammate with the D-Light and then fast falling down so he can... Oh, so many things are oh happening my God. on the edge! Yeah, that was a big reversal stare that got onto Fakie to get that KO off stage, but Jabba was right in the middle of all. This is a great opportunity for J uh, Jabba. He's going to get the scoop. Nat's going to put him up. Now it's just Blaze on his last stock where Jabba still has a whole one, and it doesn't matter. He goes up 2-0 in the set. Akno tried his best, especially on that final stock. He was dominating, which means he picked up three stocks on that final stock alone. He tried to fight back as best he could, but Java and Fakey are just too much. I don't know what to do. I mean, a change of scenery might need to be in order uh, because they changed it to Koji and it didn't, it didn't solve the problem. Uh, so maybe a little bit more room to work with to try and navigate away, but I feel like the only opportunities they have would maybe be Demon Island, and I don't think that's a good idea with how aggressive Java's been offstage. You need as much room to try and hide, so maybe Fortress Alliance to try and switch this up. I don't know if we're going to run it back to the same stage. Look at that first stock from Java. Look how tall that is. Little blitz. so much damage. Java, incredible gameplay. Now Blaze is the one swapping over onto the Bren pick, a classic Blaze pick. Yeah, this is a classic duo pick we're seeing with them right here too. Away from what they've been working on, we're going back to the Koji and Bryn. A see if the magic can be made by one of the strongest teams at EU, but Fakie and Java had had a lot to say about that. Dude, like, just their PR alone. Like, Java's PR 12, Fakie's PR 28, dude. Versus Akno and PR. Blaze are 3 and 4! <laughs> yeah. Look, again, Lan Diego has not cared much at all about any of that. And uh, it's looking like it might continue. At least this time, Akno hasn't been hit that much to start off the game. And great save. Honestly, that kind of was a better save because that was about to be a GCD light recovery and a chase because Blaze was right there to go and try and continue off that combo. And Akno was still trying to find the KO on Java off the top. He does eventually get it off the left side. Fakie having to fight the 1v2, going in with the ground pound. He knew how deep Akno was. Even if he lost his stock there, it would be a one-for-one -one trade. 
which would put them a little bit behind because Blaze is still on his first stock, but uh, like you see how quickly he ended up falling off of it, so that could have been a quick cleanup for them while getting Akno out of the game. Yeah, there's been zero chill so far throughout the series. We're going to see another KO fall onto Fakie, but this is by far and away, Sparky, the closest start we've had to any of these games for Akno and Blaze, at least off the rim. A little bit of team damage coming out. They ended up turning it around. Fakie coming in with the sword. Java with the sword as well. There's been a lot of, like, boisterous hammer gameplay coming out from Java. I feel like his sword, it hasn't been like the most amazing thing I've seen. It's just like consistent and strong. Yeah. I mean, th that's all you really need. Like consistency and damage is just been working out fine. I mean, fakie has been able to back him up pretty much anytime he needs it too. But Acto and Blaze, you know, there's signs of life here. It's looking a lot better. We're not going to see the KO they needed there, but they will get it onto Fakey going deep off stage, but that's going to be a good reversal from oh, Java. Oh, Java. Oh, great Acto job from Acto. Acto gets the chase dodge off of the down air. I thought he might not have enough distance with that chase dodge to get up, but he actually does. Java got a little bit too big for his britches there and went in with the unarmed down air. Well, this is how reverse 3 O's begin. Moments like that, Fakie's already deep in the red, and that's a Tori, so he's got borrowed time sitting in front of the axe from Blaze. Blaze looking for it right there, and that is going to be the end of that. Now, three stocks up on Java. Now, there is, of course, always that reversal potential that Hammer has on the edge. You saw it right there. It started off with the recovery. Java's going to fall there. GG comes out, and it is Blaze and Akno fighting their way back in this one. Uh, Team EU not out of it yet. We already have one of them down in the limb side, which still, again, is such a surprise factor for many of us. And I still can't believe that's going to be for a top eight qualifier after. But incredible job again. Fakie knew, like you said, the resources. He knew exactly where he had to go. He had nowhere he could really mess around with that. But Acto and Blaze, you know, the Brin swap definitely helped. But Akno's getting hit way less. Like, as the set has progressed, his defense has picked up. And when you have Akno being as evasive as possible, that's exactly what you need. Because that's going to allow Blaze to feel more comfortable about going in and cashing out on those team combos. They were not getting them before because they were just... Akno spent most of the game just trying to be on stage in those previous two games. Now, look how flat Blaze's second stock is. Of course, that's a damage taken graph. So that shows over, like, basically half the game, he was taking damage at, like, one half or yep. one third the rate of everybody else. Everybody else had sort of that essentially a linear graph, but no, that one was like super low. One thing that matters a lot, of course, as the match progresses, you already know, it isn't done until you see that three on the other side. There's still opportunities to make things happen, and that does mean that Akno and Blaze still have a shot. They may be behind two to one, but that last game was a huge difference as Fakie trying to go for an early play. Fakie is gonna miss out. That allows them to chase on the Java, but very smartly navigating around that soft platform. Blaze came in with the side signature on the axe. A rare choice. You don't see that very often, but he felt very confident that he could get the punish there and also send to that left blast zone. Instead of going for like the neutral signature, which one wouldn't have enough range, and two actually would send in the 45 degree angle. They get the full team wipe on the red team. And this is where Blaze and Akno, with all of their experience on land, with all of their time mm -hmm. being one of the best teams in Europe, this is where that experience is really going to help them. It's going to hurt Java and Fakey. But as I say that, they didn't drop that team combo. We've seen quote unquote better players drop easier combos than that this tournament. Yeah, I was going to say at first that you can feel the energy shift kind of happening here with Akno and Blaze. But then Akno makes one crucial error gets knocked out and gets a free 2v1. If they don't get that, this game is still in the yellow. Blaze, 3-2 to two over them. That just made a significant difference in this match. Blaze Akno still definitely have the lead even after that 2v1 combo that Java and Fakie picked up. You see, they're getting so damaged. Every hit is going to split them up. You have to spend so much time recovering back to the stage. You see, now Fakie's the one out on his own. The side air from Akno sends him over the right wall. Blaze fishing for the neutral signature. Blaze has been a machine this match. His Sarah accuracy is through the roof on how many times he's gotten whiff punishes on anybody who's gone after Akno. That, that will make you panic if you consistently get hit by those. Here we go. Looking for the dare follow-up. Akno gets a reversal. His neutral oh, and big no team way. combo right there again. Blaze has got a sneak through. He gets the wall bounce on the fakey though. Closes it out with the, and the Java going deep on stage. Do not try to challenge him right now. He looks like he's ready to try and get that reversal scoop with the recovery, oh. and he closes it out anyways. He's so clean with the hammer, man. That's why I love watching Java's hammer. That's why I'm glad the hammer is back. 
I do want to see more Bode Bars in tournament. That is for dang sure. Just don't let it show up in my rank games. Java, though, <laughs> very much in the red. He likely might be done off of this as he makes his way back. Gets bonked on the head with a spear toss and a simple dare from Blaze. Fakie cannot save him, and Fakie is going to fall. Momentum has completely shifted. The tables have completely turned. Bro, that whole last 15 seconds was the Blaze showcase. He yep. had... Acno, stay over there. I got this. See, they complete dominance. The weapon toss allowed him to get separation. Continued to press him off stage. Going out there after the weapon toss up, and he uh, was letting, I believe it was Java, get back on. So I don't really care. Like, you have a moment. Akno's going to cover me if I make a mistake. But it was so well executed, and it all kind of started pretty much from this moment. Yep, there you see they get the one KO. There's the neutral air from Java. That was huge. You're seeing Akno just kind of play evasively. There's Java falling. The weapon toss got the dodge, and he was done after that second weapon toss that came out. Great follow-up. Akno and Blaze are going to take that one. And again, look at the flat end line. of the game. A absolute flat line. He got hit a single time, maybe two, and then just like didn't get hit for like the final 10% yep. of the game. And even Akno, his only looks a little bit like quote unquote bad because you compare that to Blaze's, which yeah. is like one hit. <laughs> Akno got hit maybe three, maybe four times, but again, not taking a lot of damage for like the final 10% of the game, showing that they're in complete control, showing that they're in advantage state. Yeah, it, was, it may have been Blaze's flatline, but he was not the one on the deathbed. He was putting the others on their way to the coroner's office. Game that was five. insane at the end. And we have one of the rare occasions of, actually, excuse me, not a rare occasion. We've had a lot of these today. Another game five, but this could be a reverse 3-0 from Akno and Blaze to continue this and get themselves into winner's finals. We've also had some reverse 3-0s as well yes. <laughs> today. <laughs> if we're looking at that boomy Sandstorm Godly Fozy set, Java and Akno over on the side. One thing that Java's doing that I feel like a lot of Bodvar players really don't do is he's ending a lot of... Con uh, he's, getting, he's just he's getting, getting edge guard. He's getting pieced up. Oh, That's what's man, happening he's getting right edge guarded now. by Akno so hard, except that side air from Blaze might have uh, sent Akno with the team damage over on the right side. But Java is ending a lot of these combos with the Bodvar sword side sig, yep. which is not something we see a lot of. Yeah, I mean, he, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. He's been landing them so well. Java getting a dare to just get some more damage on the Blaze. Blaze is not going to be able to go help Akno's. Akno falls. Well, everybody's pretty even, so even though they did fall, we could see both Fakie and Java disappear very shortly after. Blaze is somehow still managing to hold on to this, even gets a stock. His stock was partially saved beforehand because I believe Fakie hit the first sword side air and then Java hit the second side air, which is going to be a knockout sentence, but all of a sudden you saw him DI down into the stage, so that kept him up. Yeah, good evasiveness for, for uh, Fakie there too, because even as we know, low defense doesn't matter. You have the evasiveness, but he's going to get caught right there. Very even game overall. What's the opportunity here to get here on Java? Double weapon Double toss, toss. They might get into Sider, closes it out on Java. Java falls so early. Fakie was trying. He tried his best. He didn't have a weapon in his hand. There was very little he could do, but at least he put his presence out there. He did find a hit onto Akno. But Java, man, he's on his final stock. It is four stocks to three. Blue team very much in the lead at this point. Both of them sitting pretty confidently on this second stock. Now just starting to get an orange. Oh, as I say that, Akno's starting to take some damage, though. You can start to hear the music playing. He's writing in on the wall. It's starting to slowly creep into tune. If they're not able to answer back, but Fakie, Fakie has been able to minimize the damage since. He's not getting hit too often. Great evasiveness there. Even not getting caught by the spear recovery. That could have easily gotten them that stock gone. Akno's not going to fall. Fakie trying to come in with the down air, hoping to take Blaze off the bottom. No, still living. Even that side air from Java going to kind of grind his feet along the stage, going to slow down some of that momentum so Blaze doesn't actually get knocked out with that. Somehow hits the down air there onto Fakie. Fakie definitely in KO damage, has to be careful. Fakie doing everything he can, but he finally falls to the Axe recovery. This is a big opportunity to go get Java's Java's going to get the reversal stare, though. That's going to put everybody on last stock. That was a really bold move from Blaze. You saw how damaged he was. Like, it literally only took that one hit, and he was totally done. So he really went for the gambit there, maybe trying to risk his stock that was almost finished. That way he spawns back in and is basically at the same health alongside his teammate. So that was a tactical move. Yeah, we'll see if this ends up being the play that makes a big difference. And everybody here on last stock, Java's decently damaged. Of course, Java's been really good in, la like, late hit scenarios, but I am a whole liar. He's going to get caught by the recovery. Akno and Blaze one stock away from finishing this reverse 3-0. It doesn't happen just yet, but it's very close. 
And you can see Blaze went for the D-Light recovery because they're in the middle of the stage. He thought he had enough damage to KO that, but even if he thought the other way and went for the side air, Akno was right there with the gravity cancel neutral sig. By using his signature, he has a lot more active frames going on with that, so he doesn't have to be quite as precise while also getting the big force stump. If you went with a side air, he might miss that. We already talked about players missing side air yep. follow-ups off of their teammate. There was a lot of Lance players. He was playing sword there. But the gravity cancel neutral sig was a fantastic choice for Akno, even though it was unnecessary and he didn't actually need to hit it. Now, what an incredible job again. I mean, we're talking about yet another reverse 3-0. This is one of the few teams that has been in a higher seeded position that didn't allow themselves to get sent to the elimination bracket early. And that is joining the company of many other dangerous teams. Uh, on an update, Fiend and West do end up making top eight. They take it 3-0 over Anime and Wubs. Ooh. And uh, Zack and Fasina do fall 3-1. I think we mentioned that earlier to uh, Dog and Cutie. So Dog and Cutie also in that top eight. But if you had to go down there into the Elim quarter side of the bracket, you would have had to fight up against those matches versus Luna, Snowy, Godly, Fozzy, or Boomstorm inside her knees. Yeah, like you're, you're going up against tournament winning teams. Yeah. There's, there's no ifs, ands, or buts. A lot of these teams have not just like one gold medal, but like several. And in the case of Boomy and Sandstorm, like a gorillion gold medals between <laughs> them in both modes. So, yeah, dude, that, that elimination bracket is not where you want to be. Akno and Blaze are moving on into the top four over Java and Fakie. We almost had ourselves an incredible upset. Java and Fakie took it all the way to game five, but ultimately Akno and Blaze came out on top. And even again, look at those final stocks. They just really aren't taking that much damage no. on those final stocks, man. Again, Blaze just looks incredible towards the end of the game. And then Akno is still looks really good, but just not quite as good as Blaze. I mean, like we said before, this is the team of EU for so many years, literally only being challenged just recently by Godly and Fozzy. Otherwise, it has been their dominant force. That is their house that they built that nobody was able to tear down until recent. But today, they look at that prime team we were used to seeing. Acton and Blaze have been on that stage before. They may have been down 2-0, but they understand what is needed to make that comeback. As great as the run has been from Javin Faking, and glad to see again he's got the keys to his favorite car. Bodvar is back, but they kind of figured it out somewhat towards the end. I'm still very curious to see where their run goes, though. I don't. Yes. Yeah, I think the limb side it should not be feeling comfortable with Java and Fakie down there compared to Acno and Blaze at all. Yep, their Java and Fakie's next set will be a top four qualifier on the elimination side of the bracket. So they're going to have some time here. We have several sets before them that need to happen, like Sandstorm, Boomy, Zyder, Knees need to happen, then Fiend and West versus the winner of that. Then the winner of that goes up against Java and Fakie. So like two sets have to play out on stream before Java and Fakie have to play their top four qualifier match. So they have time, which can be good, and it can also be bad. You might cool down, you might not, you might stay warm. Who knows what will happen? Yeah, well, right now we're going to find out shortly after we take a little break for ourselves. Don't go anywhere. Get yourself some food. Get yourself some water. Get hydrated as we have more of this top eight action for uh, San Diego. I was about to say BCX San Diego here at DreamHack. We'll be right back.
and we are back for another top four winner's side qualifier match. Ajax, the tournament keeps going on. We keep eliminating players from the bottom side of the bracket. We also eliminate them from the top side of the bracket, send them down to see who will ultimately come out on the bottom side of this tournament. We've seen a lot of amazing teams fall down into not only the elimination bracket, but also out of the tournament. Yeah, I want to see some players' bingo cards from out this weekend, because there's no shot that most of you had some of those upsets that might have been on there. This has been an insane tournament so far. One of the best parts about LAN is sometimes people realize that they're not ready for the pressure of the big stage, and that has crumpled a few people today. We've seen a lot of dropped combos, a lot of big opportunities that were kind of sold from some people, but you take those at the end of the day. And like you said, we're in another qualifier, and this qualifier is going to include Megdi and Radish, who in that seed position would have potentially been godly and Fozy if Boomstorm didn't get rid yep. of them. But Megdi and Radish got rid of Boomstorm to go up against what we expect now to be one of the most dangerous competitors to win the whole thing in, in Maiden experience. There is still an EU dream alive on the winner's side of the bracket, of course, coming out with Acno Blaze. The winner of this next set that we're talking about right now, that is going to determine who goes up against Acno and Blaze once we actually get into top four, and top four happens on Sunday. But again, you mentioned this earlier, and I really want to lay this out, is because we have these split up and we have our mm -hmm. finals day on Sunday, there's a gap in there. For a team like Acno and Blaze cruising along through the winner side of the bracket, they hit into the top four and then they're, they're done for the day. Yep. They don't really have to worry about anything until 1v1s. But we also have to figure out our other team that will solidify their position and can take a break and focus on ones for tomorrow. It's going to be Megdi and Radish, or it's going to be made in experience. Now, this is normally a position where I say this is team where they have something to prove to, uh, as well as those who have done it before. But I feel like made in experience always have, always have something to prove. They want people to understand that they are the dominant force of twos, and they want it to be that way. They don't want to be behind Luna and Snowy and company. But I will say one of my favorite things about what I've seen from experience say is that because of the competitive level that Luna and company are at, it makes him want to be that much better. And we're seeing that here today. But this new team of, Reg D, uh, of Meg D and Radish, at first we were kind of questioning, okay, we have two really good 1v1 players, one who's extremely good on defense, one who is extremely good on offense. How will that mesh together? Their first time out, okay. Second time out, significantly better. This time out, they're fighting to potentially get top three. Yeah, they've been trending towards that gold medal since the beginning, like you mentioned. The World Championship 2022, that was their first official tournament as a 2v2 team. Didn't go so hot. 17th place, didn't even top 16 that tournament. But then we get to the Winter Championship 2023. All of a sudden, they basically cut that in half, yep. and it's ninth place. Then all of a sudden, the Spring Championships just a week ago, all of a sudden, they're cutting that in half yep. as well, going from ninth to fifth place. Two, so now one, if they four. cut this Winners, in half, they're either going to be second or third, depending on how we want to figure that out. Looks like we're doing a little bit of a button check here yes. as we get into this one. Of course, made an experience coming through on that Chronix. I'm still surprised that we aren't seeing more teams running that. Like, Boomy and Sandstorm yep. are running it for a while. Made an experience, have been running it as well. Other than that, really not very many other teams, and definitely not yeah. now running that. And this is one of those teams, like, with Meg D Radish, I wouldn't never expect to see that. I mean, we're, we're yeah, always going exactly to see right. gauntlets attached to Radish. It's just always going to happen. With the Tesca, it's actually been kind of popping off, too. Like, usually we'd expect maybe the Petro be here, but no, the Tesca's actually been working really well. And Meg D, defensive powerhouse. Val is almost always the pick. That's the most consistent thing you're going to have. They, they don't, we don't see, like, the big play, quote-unquote, out of them all the time, except last time they were out. Meg D was popping off, like way bigger combos than we're normally used to seeing out of him, which I really like, because that shows he has the explosive factor to him too. And that could be a big part of what could maybe be another big upset here today, if they're able to do it. But I also heavily believe in the kid. Meg, uh, Radish has consistently been improving time and time out, but Sparky, is this the time where they add another big W to their name, getting this upset here against uh, Experience and Maid? I'm not sure, man. The way Experience was playing earlier, the way Maid was playing earlier, it seems like such an unstoppable team. Okay, starting this one off with a nice combo. Gets experience into the yellow, pretty deep into the yellow, in fact. Yep. One or two more hits, he's going to be in the orange. So that's a really strong way to start this game out, especially they were able to pull that off 
well, like Maid was here. He wasn't responding. Yeah. He wasn't taken out of the game. He was he was right there. And Radish, Radish and Megdi still picked it up. Now, I also also forgot as well. I mean, we're talking about Megdi, like the gauntlets on Radish. Gauntlets are always on Megdi too. But like the Wushong pick he's had of late has actually been really disgusting. So that could help out by experience. Gonna go ahead and see if he can close it out. Yes, double up on the ground pound. Radish did everything he could to try and break that up, but it was not quick enough. Radish coming in with that Tesca pick. First stock is lost with a D-Light neutral air. True combo KO option coming out from experience. Again, his cannon, dude. It's just blasting, bro. There's the dodge. Just barely keeping Radish from possibly being knocked out by the recovery. But still, so much damage was done in that massive string. Maid is going to get knocked out, put on second stock. But still, compared to everyone else in the game other than experience, is in a great spot. Finds a KO from Meg D onto experience, and that is going to even up the stocks. See if we get a team combo started here. Guess a D sick to go ahead and close out the finisher there. Experience tried its best to get in the middle of it, but uh, very quick option from uh, from Radish going for the Sarah without the command input just to send them back over. They know how to capitalize big. However, being capitalized on himself, Radish is already on his last stock. Meg D and Radish are finding some solid follow ups, though, right after the other. Some of them are signatures as well, a lot of them coming out from Meg D. Radish has even tried a few as well. Grabbing that one, perfect timing. Turn around, focused on experience. He's just floating. He I does not want to get anywhere near that red team while Maid is spawning back in the game. Bro, again, the theme of Meg D being the offensive powerhouse has continued here. He's dominating right now, and he continues to do that very well. Looking for another D-Sync to see if he come on over and try and uh, score it up. Oh, he goes to the other almost. side to do it again, but Ma uh, Maid always there to break things up as well for experience. Radish hoping to get the take off the top. Didn't quite get it, maybe on the right side. Experience, very damaged. So is Maid, though. They have a real chance of taking Maid out of this game, putting Experience into the 2v1, or taking out Experience first. Good and awareness as well. finishing the stock Ooh. from Maid, Experience. This is exactly what I was talking about. Now Maid is in the 1v2 while Experience is respawning. A single dare. That is going to burn the dodge after the weapon toss. Nice KO. That at very, least puts Megdi Very, very good stock. at Experience to get in the middle of that too because if he doesn't get out there, Maid probably falls in that position. Megdi had complete control on the right. Maid keeping it together though. Gets this air to break up the team combo and Experience. Okay, that wasn't a major signature. Did find a connection, but there isn't too much damage on it to Meg D whatsoever, so it didn't put him in a terrible position. Grab it both, though! Going for the chase, experience trying to get his way back down. You cannot take a D-Light from Raiders right now. Sarah, and uh, because of sweat beats, Meg D wasn't really able to do too much in that position. That command input, Sarah though, is going to go ahead and push him off stage. Experience unarmed in a terrible spot, Sparky. Meg D and Raiders have complete weapon advantage. Did grab that one right out of the air. A fantastic spawn that experience was able to find almost immediately, and that is it. Just like that, Meg D and Radish's follow-ups have maybe been some of the best that we've seen today, specifically for moments like that where they find like three hits. That exactly. That's the most important part. They're always getting the quick three hit strings. They're not leaving damage left on the table. It doesn't necessarily always need to be the big combo. As long as you are guaranteeing damage, that's going to put the other team into a freak out position. Because now, once they see something started, they don't feel comfortable letting it rock. They don't think you can drop it. They get a big punish. They have to go get that breakup, which sometimes will force you right into the combo. We saw at least twice that match. So we're seeing starting this one off. Radish still over on the Tesca, not swapping back to the Petra that we've seen him play virtually all of his career. Yeah, honestly, I think the Tesca has just been so good for twos uh, for Radish. Like, it's just, Orb is also great in lining things up too, but the boots have been phenomenal for not only setting up combos, but also quick breakaways to let, uh, to let Mech D reposition. If Fumi and Sandstorm want to play Tesca in their comp, I'm willing to bet Tesca is a very strong yeah. in twos yeah. specifically. But Radish is going to be the first one to fall. Maid might be right behind Ooh. him. Oh, experience! No, it actually wasn't. It's Radish. Oh, my goodness. Experience has been hunting for that all day, and he finally gets it. That's what you have to be so fearful about. Cannon in his hands. Magdi looking for a punish. Does get the dodge read with the Nair. Just get a little bit more damage on allowing uh, Radish to get back on, but Radish is currently having trouble just playing the game itself. Dude, Experience is still in the yellow on first stock. He's just a completely different player 
than I think we've ever seen him be. And I'm including MSI. Yeah, where they where won. They won. <laughs> like, where they won the whole thing in land, and exper experience just feels that much different. I agree with that heavily as they get a free power play here on the Meg D. Meg D's gonna get a reversal neutral light, but Radish, he keeps trying to get in the middle, Whoa. and he gets caught even by his own teammate. Ra Radish wasn't actually allowed to play that game. Radish, like, Meg D bounced past Radish to himself? <laughs> and like and ended up knocking him out meanwhile experience man still has not lost his first stock you're seeing the cross hand come out and and that shows that i think experience and made are feeling very confident on this they're already up 1-0 they have five stocks to their name going to be looking at a 2-0 very quickly yeah this is one of those games where usually i say look just go ahead pack it up put it in your back pocket because you're behind five stocks like don't waste too much energy, but he's kill he's keeping it going. He's still in the fray trying to see if he can get something going here. Weapon toss down though is going to stop that mess. He's gonna get himself a uh, a game on the board. But man, experience. What was I didn't I didn't get to catch his damage numbers. Like he he was the entire MVP you needed him to be in that game too. He he just went so crazy. It it, it the wild thing is is that the set is now tied one one after the absolute dismantling yeah. that we just saw. Like, I, I would expect that to end the set. I would expect that the way that they made Megdi and Radish look, they made them look like much worse players than they actually are. They made that look like a pools match where it's like me and you against Maiden experience. Yeah, I can't even try to cap and act like it wouldn't have been like that. Actually, I don't know if we would have gotten a stock off the board. Yeah, it probably would have been a six stock. It would have been a six stock for sure. But it's okay. It's okay because we can't run back. I don't know. I beat Java in a money match. So I think at least I won. I did watch that. I saw it. can confirm that Sparky, in fact, better than Java. That is so true. So true, bestie. Dude, experience. He's still going, man. His momentum, his confidence, the way he's playing cannon, Dude, beautiful follow up. When, when you have your teammate playing like that, look how many easy punishes Maid has been finding. Like, that makes you get amped up in it, yep. too. Uh, well, much closer game here to start. Nobody has been caught just yet. Not going to get a KO off the top. Boots recovery, uh, pretty strong, but usually way stronger when it's much higher up. Megdi and Radish doing a great job of bringing this one back to pretty much even. Radish is going to be the first one to fall. Hopefully his second stock doesn't get deleted immediately by Experience's cannon. Yet again, like we saw last game, I don't expect that to happen, especially because Experience has gauntlets in his hands. Yep. And uh, Me Megdi and uh, Radish, they, 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 they kind of been able to slow the game down a little bit. It does fall finally to that Sarah, but I do like the fact that they were able to kind of bring the game to a crawl because you don't want those moments where Experience pops off again. You need to make him second guess his openers. Main experience, man. They're still on their first stocks. Okay, experience is going to fall there. Magni and Radish in the 1v2. The opportunity here to go try and jump made, but experience just, yeah, just hovering in center. Like, go ahead, please, please hit made. Please, because if you do, I'm getting a huge punish on you. And then uh, Maid is probably going to turn around and also get the follow up. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it, you, you it's actually worse for you. Yeah. You're going to get punished for hit confirming. Like, that is actually a worse idea. But that's going to be a big net oh, coming experience. in. That's going to be a huge KO that they get out of experience. And this is a big swing because now, because Maid is so damaged, he's going to fall there. Now they have the time to do the 1v2 or the 2v1. And they put out some solid damage. They can put out probably around 50. They found three or four hits, yep. which is good damage, especially because, like, Experience is on his final stock here, and Radish might take Ooh. you off the bottom. Made a good evasion from Maiden. Oh, experience experience does is not done. get the wall touch. He tried his best to get under. You can see him shaking his hands off in the cam, like nah, nah, that shouldn't have happened. Oh, a complete reversal from the last game. I mean, Cross is definitely one of the uh, legends you'd like to see in a two v one in this position, but oh, Radish. not right now. Oh, Radish accidentally hits. If he, if he could get this KO on the Radish, this actually would be huge. Made trying to focus here. They're trying to set up. There's the D-Light ground pound coming out from Meg D's, hunting for a weapon. Don't know how much uh, unarmed and then a weapon mix-up that they've dealt with in terms of the follow-ups because we know they got that one ready to go. The neutral signature from Meg D on those gauntlets, he's been using that so well. Yeah, has so much synergy with his teammate. Yeah, here to a key, key, uh, quick team combo again. Climbing heavily. Oh my god, doesn't get the finisher. But that put him straight into the red. That's kind of sealed the deal here potentially in this game three. Team damage virtually doesn't matter there because he's going to hit the down air. Finds the KO. Didn't even need the weapon toss. And Radish and Meg D are going to take that game. So. We talked about this little tidbit of information earlier, Sparky. The Bears repeating currently in this moment. Experience sometimes looks like the best player in the entire world in twos. And then sometimes when bad things happen, the, ex 
the mental can crumble a little bit. I don't think that it's going to crumble here in this next game, but that was a rough game yes. at that. So you need to put that in your back pocket. Remember that you are that guy. Three, you have two, won championships one, before, one. and you j you had a bad game because you can make it happen again. But Radish and Megdi are definitely feeling very good about that bad game he had. I mean, that's blue team and red team traded one for one, right? There was the game that Radish was just watching that's the cutscene. That's true. That's true. Yeah, he actually play. did. Even Meg D said, bro, just just stop, yeah. okay? Like, he, he got rid of his own teammate's last KO there. So, game number four. What do you think is going to be the play for uh, Experience and Made to try and make sure that does not happen this time? I mean, if Experience survives, he Pretty thrives. much, yeah. yeah. He doesn't just survive, he thrives. As long as he is on that stage and isn't taken out super early, it's, it's Cannon City, baby. It's Gauntlet City, baby. It's Damage City, baby. It's Knockout City, baby. <laughs> well, right now, uh, currently just trying to find his way back onto stage is made. Uh, who's watching experience just kind of have fun all by himself over in center, but that's yeah, pretty much like the like the theme of this team as well. Made just lines up things perfectly. Nice. Experience does get a great uh, punish over on the right, left, excuse me, and Radish once again being the first one to fall. Yeah, that might have been Radish overextending himself a little bit, maybe feeling a little bit too confident. It would have been nice if he got the KO there, but using a gravity cancel, oh, Ooh. an experience, I'm telling you, man! <laughs> He it, just keeps going. If he got that read, that would have been such an early KO, and they would have already been down to three. And that's the difference between like what Radish did and what Experience did. Experience was all the way up there. His opponent really wasn't anywhere near him, at least in terms of being able to punish. He could have fallen into the signature, but wasn't going to be able to punish Experience. Meanwhile, on the other side, it was down low. It was dangerous. He wasn't. He wouldn't be able to just fade back to the stage. He had to use inner movement economy. His dodge was already burned. Good. I mean, actually, you know, I've noticed uh, Radius actually has minimized a lot of damage for a while. Like he's been he's been on his second stock way earlier than everyone else and was almost KO'd from that early string. But since that moment, he's minimized it a ton. Great team combo setup, though. Radish was lining up perfectly for Meg DE to go and get an offstage neutral stake again, but he shut it down. Now we see Radish over on the edge. He does down air, but it's into the wall. It's gonna reset his jumps there. Nice string all the way from the left side of the stage to the right. And he keeps it going, and Megdi was set up, ready to go. Unfortunately for Megdi, he ended up picking up the D-Sig on the left side when the closest blast zone was to the right. Yep. So great move usage, just kind of got unlucky with where the opponent was. At that moment, Ground Pound takes out Radish. Megdi over on the wall, gets through. That signature was starting up. You know yeah. the experience was ready to use it. And they had great control of that, too. Megdi, well, excuse me, Maid was covering the high, uh, the high route if he decided to take it, but he gets back on, and Radish now catching the side air, trying to line it up for Megdi, looking if they can maybe get a recovery follow up after that but they couldn't find it experience just trying to go and help mid which has been working out well but experience in meg d both holding on to that second stock neutral sig coming out from meg d the 2v1 while experience spawns back in the game they weren't able to do too much on the mate but he is in the orange on his final stock meanwhile it is three stocks to two maid has got to be careful Starting to be in danger of being taken out of this game. He's over up on the soft platform. If he plays too passively, though, you do not want to have this 2v1 have to happen here while Megdi still has that second stock. If you're going to at least let it be when it's down to one apiece because he could sneak out that KO on the Radish and force that 1v1 to Ooh. try to get that game number five. Megdi is uh, hunting. He's hunting down Megdi as much as possible, but oh, that experience. recovery gets punished him himself by experience. Oh, he picked up the ground bound, too. That's the double KO. All of a sudden, it was looking like Maid was going to get knocked out and experience Experience was going to be in the 1v2, completely turned everything around, went from one red team member to the other, and all of a sudden, Meg D finds himself alone on the Fortress of Lions. He can make this happen here. He's just got to get around this. He's also got to get to a weapon soon. The weapon starve is continuing, so Meg D having a bit of a tough time trying to get rid of Maid, which is the primary target right now. Dude, that can of gameplay. What are you going to do? He's just gonna bonk you on the head. That is literally the most disrespectful move in the entire game. It's just the cannon weapon toss and the way it goes gunk, right as it bonks you on the head. And we're going to game five, Ajax. And you can see it when it happened to Radish, his hands were in his face. There's been a lot of emotion from everybody on this screen for trying to get that guaranteed trip to Sunday. Remember, this is to get to winner's finals. The guaranteed podium finish. No matter game what, five, if you get to one, that top three, four. we're going to see which one of them gets it done. Game number five, once again, you, would, you could honestly couldn't have asked for better. It's sick that both of our top four qualifiers on the winner's side have been a game five. Yes. So it is still 
so close between like virtually all of the teams on the winner's side of the bracket so far. Megdi and Radish, we still have not seen Radish go over to that Petra. He's still sticking with the Tesca. It's been working well. Like, he found himself in game five with it. Yep. I mean, a lot of their team combo startups have been off the boots. Yep. Like, so I, I like the fact that they're staying with it because if if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Megdi's always there ready to line it up. Don't give a reason to not have your team combos hit later. Experience looking for a weapon, picks up the cannon. Radish is in KO damage, but so is Maiden. Experience might be right behind him. Meg D is the survivalist this game. Radish is going to sneak underneath. Maid looking for the ground pass, oh, but he gets reversed tough. by Experience. He's going to be able to get back on, so not oh, too uh, much yeah. bad happens there. I'm a little bit surprised that the red team kind of let him back up because they had both members of the blue. Nice down air. It's going to send Radish further because it was team damage. Maid and, uh, excuse me, Radish and Meg D both gonna fall to Maid getting that KO over there. Meg D just trying to sneak his way back on. Good reversal, Pogo. Weapon toss actually gets interrupted because Experience ended <laughs> up eating the hit. What a goofy interaction coming out. Maid, though, at the weapon disadvantage. You see Meg D immediately moves back. Oh, Experience also disarmed himself, gets knocked out. Complete weapon control. Oh, it was a little bit too slow for that. That's just how much damage was built up onto this first stock of Maid. Yep. And here's Experience trying to make sure he can try. Like, anybody who does something to Maid is going to get punished. He's waiting for his moment to strike very smartly. Don't try to go for something, because that's going to put on free damage that you don't need right now. And getting away after recovery, not trying to do something, because Meg D was right there to punish as well. Maid still surviving on this first stock. He's trying to get in there as fast as he can. He does hit the sidelight to interrupt the combo, but they kept putting out damage because of Meg D. Yeah, Meg D is just, he's no fear. No fear being in the middle of everything. Like we said, one of the defensive stalwarts, if you will, of Brawlhalla has been one of the most aggressive players in this 2v2. Decent uh, comes through, almost getting another follow-up, but a great breakup from Maid. Been playing such a great support game so far while experience is just going crazy. What a great dynamic to have as this team. I say it's all about... Oh, they grabbed it! There we go. So that's going to be Radish falling. Meg D is... He's got Gauntlet, so you don't want to try to check him too much. Experience is near recovery range, but KO's. And instead, he goes for the D-Light, gets the neutral stick punished. So everybody down to three stocks. Yeah, that was a bold move there. Went for the non-true follow-up, of course. We saw, I believe, the, I actually don't remember if a dodge came out or if he just expected to get hit. I think he hit. just did it, yeah. He, yeah, just he expected to get hit by the true combo. Of course, it wasn't the true combo. It was something different. A Ooh! third scarier option. <gasps> the weapon toss save from May. Those gauntlets might have just saved this game. That actually might be the difference maker in this set. Like, if he doesn't get that save, that is a early KO happening once again at 2v1. But well, we're going to see Maid fall. Big opportunity to go and try and get experience. Looks for the Pogo. Experience is going to sneak his way back on and get and away. Immediately, Maid is there to follow up. Unarmed, off of experience's gameplay. Unarmed. These, these two players are really just on the same page. Now they're putting out so much damage. They're just finding it all over the place while experience is still living. You saw the weapon toss in there to try and allow Maid to get a separation from uh, between the two of them, but it does not happen. And oh, that's a so punish. Close. Oh, smartly not going for anything. Maid was looking for the follow up, and experience gets the punish. There oh. we go again. Meg D's going to fall. No way he can, get, he can get back up, and Radish has no room to save. That side air. Weapon toss. Dodge is burned, and Radish is done. Experience and Maid somehow. Experience did not lose that final stock. That was incredible, and I'm going to pinpoint the play again. That weapon toss yep. save saved them that set. That yep. would have been a huge difference maker with a 2v1. Instead, because he kept Experience in the game, Experience helps to clutch it out at the end. It, you, the pop-off was so worth it. That was such an intense set. Hugs going out between competitors, too. That was a phenomenal way to get themselves that guaranteed trip to that Sunday top four. Look at that last stock of experience. You have the very steep build on that third stock. And then he gets hit like once, maybe twice. And then he get, maybe gets hit by like one more time for the final 25% yes. of that game. Incredible clutch coming out from experience. That amazing save with the gauntlet weapon toss that came out from Maid. Both players having that clutch factor at the exact moment that they needed it. We talked about Maid kind of playing the support before, but he was able to shine in that yes. moment. Even though, like, that's a clutch play while also supporting his teammates. Best of both worlds. Once again, that experience in Maid 
was MI, uh, MSI champ experience to me. They looked phenomenal. Even when their back was up against the wall, they figured it out. Their coordination is so good. And we can't put, like, there's not enough credit to give to Maid allowing experience to do what he does and go crazy, but also the saves. If he's not there to get the follow-ups, if he's not there to break things up, everything goes south. But if that weapon toss does not happen right there from Maid, they are looking at a 2v1, the most important crucial moment of that set that allowed them to have that right there and standing on top of a guaranteed podium finish here in yep. San Diego. That is going to be on Sunday. We're going to see Agno and Blaze versus Maid and Experience. And I'm ready for it. There you have some of the sets that we've seen so far. Made an experience 3-1 over Fiend and Wesley. Java and Fakie unfortunately caught an L to Akno and Blaze in game five. And then made an experience, clutched it out in game five over Meg D and Radish. We're not done, Ajax. No, we still not. got some more, Ajax. And you know, we talked a lot about what we were happening, but it wasn't just us who was watching all that. Sheepy. How are you feeling about what we just saw a second ago? Oh my god. Um, I I think there has to be something said about made an experience and their and their like chemistry together and then yes. how they play on a LAN, right? I think there's something that said there when I, the the what like what you were saying, clutch factors and then just their chemistry as a team and I think they really do show up. Honestly, when when it comes to like in-person inventational, it's like where they really shine. Like they they are totally okay with the pressure, all eyes on them, all the crowd everywhere, and they played out of their minds and well deserved because now they are guaranteed to go into championship Sunday. Now yep. they're they're good. They're like, all right, we're gonna enjoy the weekend for a little bit until Sunday. Look, experience flew out, made to get him into the MSI, MSI champs. He has said many times over, they will not maybe they will be the best twos team that you will see in Brawlhalla and the way that they continue that uptrend Sparky it is only a matter of time yeah. with how good they have been uh, they've 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 already done it they've already continued the uptrend by cutting their place in half because they're guaranteed top three yep. now which is basically cutting that fifth place in half so they've already done it and they could do even better the upward trend of maiden experience incredible I, I love it. I, I honestly, I love to see it because it just shows that through a lot of hard work over time, they've had their ups, they've had their downs, they've had some moments where it seems like, why even bother to continue with the set? And they rebound so well because they make it work. And this is against the team who was able to beat Boomstorm a little while ago, a new team on the block, like we said before, not the hottest start at BCX, but continuing to play very well in that Meg D Raidish set. They still got it done. And that was two. And I'm also again very happy that we had two game fives to make winners finals. Yep. Like was not a, no free O's whatsoever. Those were hard to uh, to win. Yeah, those are definitely hard hard fought like matches that guaranteed these guys into champion someday. So that means we got Acno Blaze up there for champion Sunday. We got main experience, and we are not done yet though. Okay, we still got to go through the elimination side of this top 32 to find out. Who are the other folks going into the Champion Sunday? So, actually, here, our next match coming up is going to be a spicy one, y'all. It's, I believe, Luna Snowy versus Godly and Fozy. Tell me about this. So, this is the top two seeds of the entire <laughs> yeah, event. Surely, all of a sudden, we time traveled, and we are on Championship Sunday <laughs> in the Grand Finals. Surely, seeing both of these teams on our screen, that has to be the truth. Yeah, except this is to not get ninth this is to Bro. just get into Bro. top eight what's going on we're talking about one half of the bcx champs versus the team that got second to them in luna snowy where snowy and boomy were able to get it done and they're sitting here <laughs> to fight godly and Fozy in the essential pseudo rematch to just get top eight that's how crazy san diego has been yeah it's insane that we are seeing these folks in the elimination side, and it definitely feels and looks like a championship match, but it's not. It's still elimination side. They're still trying to go for this goal. They're trying to secure the uh, top four to get into the champion setting. You can see the trophies right yeah. there. That's what they're trying to get for. And of course, the prize pool. We can't forget the $70,000 prize pool as well. And for first place, 9,000 each. Yeah. Hello? That 
That is uh, a significant difference between McDonald's or a steak at the end of this weekend. And also if you happen to buy it for your friends. Uh, so Yeah, just just make sure you go to dinner with the the winner of the tournament yes. like they did at Winter Royale and made like Luna pay for Foca to Chow. So just just make sure you slide on into dinner with with the winner of the tournament. Seeing some highlights here from Godly and Fozy versus Boomy and Sandstorm. What a set that was. That was one of the tw that that set for all of us really was the determining factor of why some of us didn't put Boomstorm in our top three because we saw they had to fight round one of top 32. So the fact that Godly and Fozzy have been as dominant as they have, it didn't feel too comfortable, and yet they still fell to that reverse 3-0. It's just showing again that nobody could be comfortable here at all, even with as dominant and Godly and Fozzy have been of late, being that new all-star team of EU that was only belonging to the throne of Akno and Blaze, they still fell here. And the fact that Java and Fakie were able to put Luna and Snowy into the elimination side of bracket, this is by far and away a non, not expected by pretty much anyone. Yeah, you mentioned that these players are fighting for top eight in the elimination side of the bracket, and that's so wild. But that also means that the loser of this game doesn't top eight. That means Godly and Fozzy or Luna and Snowy does not top eight this tournament. When I had both of these teams in my top two. I had both of them in, you had they were them in my top two. In yep. your top two. Uh, Duke had them in his top two. When Ann is the only smart one who didn't put them in, in her top I'm one. I'm going for Boomy and Sandstorm all the way, number one. That's all that really matters for me. So it's crazy to to hear you say that, that elimination side. One of these teams is not going to make it, but what is going to make it. At least they it, can look cool while yes. doing it, right? <laughs> it's like, but wait a minute. Don't miss out on this exclusive DreamHack San Diego, like, for a hollow merge. You can get the hoodie, you can get the t-shirt, maybe you can get both. You can scan that QR code on your screen right now so you can grab this latest exclusive merch while supplies last, of course. And just a kind reminder for our international friends, we have made a cool deal where, hey, if you are interested in one of these things, uh, flat, rate, flat rate shipping for y'all, okay? And that's outstanding. So something for everyone. QR code, scan it right now. Don't miss out. Brahalo.com, you can literally get it right now or scan that QR code. Now keep in mind, everyone here as well, if you somehow are hearing this next to all of the noises that are going on in this convention hall, <laughs> those are not available here. We are not selling those here. Those are only being sold online. online. And notice it says under merch drop while supplies last. So everyone that is here at DreamHack San Diego also needs to go online. They also need to go to brahalo.com forward slash merch. They also need to scan that QR code if they want their piece of merch before they are sold out. Yes. yes, yes. And that sale also ends on Thursday. So just wait a minute for all the folks at home too, or maybe you're busy spending your time here at DreamHack San Diego, and you kind of forget, oh man, I really wanted to get that exclusive merch. Sale ends on Thursday. Trying to look out for y'all, okay? <laughs> Don't forget, brahalo.com slash merch. All right, let's go back into the action here. Um, boys, I'm gonna let you guys kind of take it away here with Luna, Snowy versus Godly and Fozy. What an insane conversation again to be had. Like, this is actually ridiculous to even talk about again. Top eight qualifier top eight qualifier right now for Luna, Snowy, Godly, Fozzy. This is seed one versus seed two. <laughs> it could, look, Let's go. Just, is this the winter championship? Like, I know it's yeah. a little bit of a cool breeze outside. Look, that may be what winter feels like in San Diego, but this isn't the winter championship anymore. Look at the splash art on there. It's a tropical paradise. Look, okay, look, okay. For anybody who has ever looked at their bracket path and said, oh, man, I got to play these. No, it could beat them, too. Every single person is beatable. It doesn't matter. They're just another player with a controller in their hand. Everyone can be beaten. And we have seen that happen here today as the number one and number two seeds, the people we expected to be in Grand Final Sunday, are fighting just to keep their chances alive at that here in this Losers Qualifier for Top 8. I, I can't, I don't know if we could stress it enough anymore. <laughs> like, it's... This is going to be a Grand Finals Caliber set at that, though, like without a doubt. So we mentioned earlier about players whiffing their side air follow-ups off of their teammate. Godly and Fozzy, 
were one of the victims. So why they that. are here right now. Fozy and his land side airs were not making connections to follow up off of Godly. There were a lot of times where Fozy was just, he was kind of flying around like he was the Jetsons. <laughs> I couldn't think of anything else flying around. Uh, the Jetsons is old even for me. So <laughs> he's, he's just kind of cruising around up there like he's having a good old time. There were several times throughout the match that he was doing that. And he was yep. like throwing out a side air, missing, getting punished. Fozy's going to have to step it up. God, yep. Godly did a lot of work, but as the set previously that we watched dragged on, Fozy just he just didn't have it. We know he has it. Yeah, I mean, like, there was a point in time we were starting to have the conversation. It was like, is Fozy actually, like, the best 2v2 player right now? Like, he was out playing godly in those positions. A big part of why they even made it as far at BCX was how good Fozy was playing. Yep, absolutely. But there could be no world where you leave damage on the table in this match. Once again, everyone, we are in the qualifier for top eight of Luna and Luna and Snowy versus Godly and Fozy. So coming into this one, Fozy has that Lance in his hand that we saw previously. Of course, he is on the Orion and Godly is coming in on the Rayman, of course, with the Dalsim crossover skin. Yeah, it's been a big part of their success. This is one of their main combos they go for often to get these Ws, and it's been working for them so well. But Luna on the cross has been such a problem of late. Speaking of which, he's gonna go and try and close it out. The weapon's also very close, but a big reversal punish on Luna. He's gonna get the wall touch snow to get back on. And, you know, we're seeing a Zerial on the screen, but it's not Fozy who kind of like... That's throwing me who, off. Yeah, who kind of like, like popularized Zarial in 2v2. No, it's actually going to be Snowy on the Zarial. Of course, that down sync that you saw earlier off stage that ended up hitting his teammate. Ends up I mean, hitting his teammate with that one as well. Like, that move right there was that their trip to top two of BCX. The amount of times that Fozy was able to connect uh, with Zarial throughout the whole set is was insane, but Godly is not someone you want to see doing that. You start seeing him start off the game with double KOs, start counting that W away from yourself. I, that was not the way I wanted to line it up, but it's okay. I took an L there too. <laughs> Someone is going to hold that L though, if you let Godly play like that. There we saw an attempt at a follow-up from Fozy coming out with a neutral air, but the red team member did have a dodge offensive, didn't get caught, but the thought and the timing were basically there. Coming in with a downlight, actually ends up hitting Godly a little bit there. Okay, we were seeing some true combos drop, some side light nares. Yeah. Godly did it on Axe as well. True combos drop, you can't do that. No, not again. Like even with the stage position, like even with the stage nares that can hit, you have now spent enough time throughout the day. They better be gone. But go uh, Godly going to fall, trying to snag a side air onto Luna on a wall bounce, but Luna smartly recognizing that, reversing the situation, and now puts Godly on his last stock. We're even on this game so far until Luna just lost second stock. Bozy, the only one still on the second stock, still going in with those double spear recoveries. Putting out some serious damage here. Now going on to Luna, almost picked up Ooh. every other person in the game <laughs> with that downlight, but he chose to take a step back from it. If God, if Godly wasn't in the middle of that, Fozy probably could have gotten that read on that spot dodge. Like he looked like he was hunting for it, but backed off. I'm but thinking he still should have gone. For I think it. he honestly should have too. Picked up both members of the red team. It may not matter. Ultimately, Fozy is going to fall there from his second stock onto his final. If Godly can survive here, nice neutral air from Luna though, kind of bringing it back into the fray. Snowy and Luna are extremely damaged. Damage here, the D sync and the side air. Fozy is doing a lot of team damage here. He does hit the side air on a Snowy. I will say though, Fozy's picked it up a ton in this game, and that's gonna be a fault of Luna off the top. So Snowy currently in the middle of everyone. Great reversal there though, and rewards the side air punish. Oh my dude, Fozy was just flying around him, not finding a single hit while Snowy was throwing out moves, while Snowy was completely punishable, while Snowy was sigging his teammate. Dude, do not have the game be as strong as you did all the way up to this point, and then have that last second be the detriment. Like Snowy has a great opportunity, but that side is gonna send him off. He's not gonna get KO'd just yet. Can't oh. make it over to the stage. The dodge was burned. What? What an insane comeback they had going there. Because Fozy, that Fozy was what we remember from BCX. He was he was separating everyone. He was getting his hits. Also, just basically getting true combos, which is thank you. Yeah. Do not drop those. Do not leave damage on the board. But one crucial, like it feels like in those last second scenarios, he does not feel comfortable finding openers. Like, it, it, he's been pretty stressed at finding those. Like you said, he was floating around everywhere. That's part of why they lost that set earlier in that reverse 3 up. Seeing some communication coming out between Luna and Snowy. 
We've seen a little bit coming out between Godly and Fozy as well. I don't even know if they're actually talking about the game itself because from what we've seen with like that interview, these two troll so much, including themselves. Yeah. So will <laughs> Luna and Snowy just be talking about what they're getting for food after this? But we'll see because they had a lot of good opportunities. Uh, I feel like the thing though is that I, I, you mentioned it earlier. I saw one one time where Luna looked like he's slightly overextended, and you can kind of do that a little bit with Cross and not worry too much, but Three, not when two, Fozzie was playing one, as good as he was. I think they're just trying to figure out, hey, if you see me go off stage like that, be prepared to punish the Lancer a little bit better next time so we can stop Fozzie from feeling comfortable going off stage. We see Luna going in up against Godly. Gauntlet v. Gauntlet. Luna getting the better of it so far. Snowy swapping back over to the Onyx, away from the Zariel. I, I gotta say, I'm on board with this. The I, Zariel, I like, it wasn't bad, but it just seemed a little bit sloppy because, like, you saw how much team damage yeah. was coming out. And that's, like, he was using it with signatures, which is how you're supposed to play Zariel. He was doing the right things, yep. just not quite in the right way. I mean, I, this is this is also the reason why he has the BCX title is because of Onyx. Yep. Like, keep, don't break what isn't broken, right? Like, he's already been able to do it. Right now, though, Luna just looking at an attempt to try and make it back smartly. Good positioning once again from Snowy to get right in the middle of them to take the focus away. Unfortunately, Luna wasn't really able to follow up off of anything. Although he was he was right there, it seemed like he was a little bit scared, cautious to actually commit to anything major like a Blaster's Recovery that could take off the top. He was just kind of floating around in the area. Godly once again striking first and often. He's uh, He refuses to give up scale uh, quickly. Quick three-piece, I like that. Remember, we said that earlier about Megdi and Radish. It doesn't need to be the big combos. Just get quick damage in, back off. It's okay, just as long as you're getting the damage from the combos. And Fozzy was able to take out Luna with like pure Lance gameplay. Forced him over to the side. There were a couple weapon tosses that came out as well. He kept the string going. Oh, if he takes out Luna here, that would be so disrespectful. No shot again, bro. Fo like, fo look, Fozzy. At the start of these games has been on fire. Like, he's still on his third stock. He's been piecing up Luna repeatedly, and he's looking so good at separating him. He's going to finally go down to the gauntlet recovery, but it took a long time. Yeah, Fozzie's really starting to step it up here in this set for sure. He is at the weapon disadvantage. Snowy's going to grab that cannon right out from underneath Fozzie. Throws it away. Neutral air. Has to be careful. A little team damage coming out, but no. Fozzie has the dodge after that. Doesn't get hit by the opponents whatsoever. Snowy chasing right now, but they got... The oh, I like the attempt. Fozzie is uh, not super damaged, so you might get catch him sleeping, but Spear d is going to get rid of Snowy. They have an opportunity here to get rid of Luna. Luna's going to avoid the weapon toss out. Fozzie trying to go get him, and a great save and Reversal there from Snowy to allow him to get back on. Godly there grabbing the weapon, stealing that one away from Snowy, making sure Luna sent the weapon disadvantage as well. Oh, that edge guard, Ajax. That was that could have been exactly what the red team needed if they were able to get a ground pond onto at least one of them. But stocks are flying, Luna is out. Snowy all by his lonesome. He wasn't even able to take out Godly on the right side. That is going to be some team damage coming out from Godly. That D-Sig takes out Fozzy. It's two stocks to one. Snowy all by his lonesome. He does have the weapon advantage, but Godly's able to grab the axe quickly, and there comes the lance for Fozzy. Fozzy pushing him away. Godly trying to get a punish on that. There we go. Big punish in. That is now the number one seed of the tournament. Looking down the barrel of a 2-0 lead. Here to get into top eight and we're seeing Fozzy doing 606 damage. This is the Fozzy that we were looking for earlier. This is the Fozzy that we know. Fozzy, again, we had many individual conversations where we started to wonder, Fozzy is looking like a contender for best 2v2 player in the game right now with how good he has been, BCX and on. And this is what we needed to see from him now. If you needed it at any point, it's the matchup you expected to be grand finals. 600 plus damage meaning so much right now, but it bears repeating once again. How many times today have we seen that game five happen and those reverse 3-0s happen? It is not over. Dude, Luna barely got to play. What is rumbling my entire what? lower body in this arena? Are we being abducted by aliens? I think so. There's Something <laughs> is happening. It might be Godly and Fozzy. Honestly, it might be their power leveling they up. They are tearing the house down <laughs> right now. And uh, I'm actually trying to figure out where yeah, they're what, what the heck is going on? Oh, I think it's a, it's, a right okay. yeah, oh, it's a trailer. Okay. Oh, it's a trailer for Tetris. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Well, I mean, that look, the base boost or, over there is hitting. Well, yeah, right dude, now. I, can, I can feel it in my dang loins. <laughs> well, what 
what do we do now? This is that time where I like to put the question to the table here and see if there's some route. Sparky, they are down 2-0. What is the answer to try and stop this from being a 3-0? You gotta shut down Fozy. You gotta shut down Fozy, and it seems like at least so far, the goal is gonna be to at least start with the Lara Croft, with the Diana coming out from Luna. Luna's switching over, gonna keep those blasters in play. They, they, were, they were definitely not the problem before. The blasters are actually getting a majority of the damage done. What well, Fozy, like you said, the issue, the big issue. Again, there's the Spear DC. Gonna only take a little bit of a punish from Snowy, though, because Godly right there as Godly also closes it out on Snowy, striking first once again. You might be able to correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, as I saw last game on the stat screen, Luna did zero gauntlet damage. Like, literally zero I'm gauntlet damage. fairly certain and it he was did, zero. He did 160 uh, blasters damage. So that's why we're seeing him step away from the gauntlets and, of course, still committing to the blasters. Which is crazy, too, because that is, like, one of the Luna weapons. Yep. He has been swapping amongst Legends so much, but it was almost always consistently a gauntlet in the hands once he started moving away from Taros. At least it's looking a little better here to start things off now. And they have Fozy in a great time. Oh, Fozy weapon toss down too, even after the attempt to try to punish. Oh, and he gets the ground pound. Deep, and Godly is ready to go deep on the other side. It's a nice down air. Luna coming in to relieve the pressure. If Luna, oh, he almost got caught. He still might go down as a chase dodge up. Godly still gets back. Luna barely escaping, losing his second stock in yellow. That could have been writing the check mark for them right there if Luna Absolutely. ended up getting sold at the bottom. But he gets at least one. And they are st they still have Godly in some decent damage, so they can get this to even soon. Okay, they take out Godly, put Godly on final stock. All of a sudden, Ajax, we're at an even game, and I don't know how that happened. Honestly, I think a lot of that is coming from Luna kind of picking it up. Like, I, 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 Luna is really picking it up a ton right now. Snowy, however, they're getting caught, they're getting jumped, and Fozy is just kind of chilling on his own. Yeah, all of a sudden, Luna's starting to take a bunch of damage. Snowy is taken out of the game. Luna has to fight this 1v2 for any hope, any snowball's chance in Apocalypse of getting out of this without taking the L and being knocked out of the tournament. They're down 0-2. Let's see if Bozy and Godly can take this 2v1 when there was one before, not too long ago, that they didn't take. Hey, I mean, look, if you wanted at any point in time for something to be on the shoulders, it is against the number one player, essentially, of Brawlhalla right now. Luna has to be the one to put the team on his back if he wants to stop this 3-0 from happening in the number one seed of the tournament being knocked out. But that is one more marker towards that potential elimination. He wasn't able to hardly put out any damage on that second stock before he lost it. There is a weapon spawn on the field. Godly. Swapping over to the Axe. They're adding up the damage on the Luna. Luna cannot get through. Weapon Starf has been extremely difficult. He's going to get Blasters, but he's already taking a lot of straight hit damage. And like you said, he hasn't been able to hit the main win condition, Godly. He can't get damage on it. If you can't get rid of Godly, there is essentially no way you're making this comeback. Luna, he's spending a lot of time over on that corner. He knows when he's on the wall, he has Blaster's Nair, which is a pretty safe tool to keep the opponents off of him. That's why we see him keep going over there. That's why they don't really push onto him. Okay, oh, oh! the GC sidelight from Fozy does not make a connection. Yeah, another drop. He does not close it out, but this could be a big opportunity for him right now. Weapon toss up. Yeah, he's got to get to the soft platform. There you, go. you just need to get Spear, throw out the D-Sig. That's really what you need here. That's the win condition. Oh, he waited. Perfect timing for that. And Luna and Snowy are falling. Godly and Fozy are moving on. You could see the hands on his face after it was done. That is a 3-0 loss to the best team in EU out here getting rid of the number one seed of the whole event. The match we expected to see in grand finals of San Diego DreamHack instead closes out here and knocking them out at ninth place, which I believe is their lowest placing in potentially the past year plus, if not longer, for it's these two. Literally ever. Literally ever. That's in insane. any tournament that is in the database, they have four wins, one of which is a winner championship, the other are community tournaments. They have a third in Moose Wars King's Crusade and a second in the Spring Championship. They just got their worst placement of all time by like multiples, by orders of magnitude. They went from winning or getting second at Spring Championship to not 
top eighting this tournament because Godly and Fozy. Look at the third stocks, Ajax. That was not even third. It's just second for Fozy because the survivability is so good. Snowy barely got to play. Like Snowy legitimately yeah. barely got to play <laughs> he that played game. Like half the game. That, Literally half the game. What an insane thing to talk. When we talked about potential upsets, we we had a lot of story to build up. We had a lot of things we were thinking about. This was not one of them. This is if there was one thing we expected to be the constant, it was Luna and Snowy. That was pretty much almost all of our guesses to walk away with the whole thing. This feels like winters with what we're watching. Everything has been flipped over on its head, and they're not even in the top eight conversation. Godly and Fozy is a team we expect. They might not even make top three, just to make that clear as well. They got that dub. And they still have to go through yep. the absolute monstrosity of elimination bracket. Nobody in the bracket should feel comfortable, and I, I highly doubt that there's anyone in the bracket that does feel comfortable <laughs> no. because, I mean, it, it, tr it truly is any given Sunday. Whoever wants it the most, whoever's the most prepared that day, that's all that matters. Yep. Whether it's today, whether it's Championship Sunday, which a lot of these teams are not going to make it to Luna and Snowy are not going to make it to Championship Sunday. Today was there any given Sunday that they needed to come out and do big. They couldn't do it. There's going to be a lot of conversation to be had amongst the teams going into Sunday. That gap break of Saturday better not be just meant with only hanging out with people. Chat it up because that top four is going to be dangerous. Looking at who is on the winner side already in the elimination side. I mean, we have one more qualifier just to make it into elimination top eight, which is coming up next in a second. And it's the return of Boomstorm going up against Zyder and Knees. Yeah, and what we don't have, by the way, many NA reps that are still left to try and stop the invasion. Yep. We have actually been falling repeatedly, which is not the most common thing we're used to seeing. BCX had a little bit of a change up in that too. It's kind of playing out again here. And that was definitely a wild end to that game. It's a wild end to Luna and Snowy's tournament. But we need a quick break before we get on to the rest of this, because we've had some crazy sets. We'll see you in just a few minutes.
All right, everybody, welcome back to DreamHack San Diego, where dreams are getting crushed, as we have seen <laughs> many different top-tier teams who we expect to see in the highest position of bracket fall early, but some dreams are being remade because the Boomy Believers are, are thriving right now. Boomy and Sandstorm still have a shot. They are here in the, lose the elimination side top eight qualifier, but they have to try and take out Knees and Zyder. Yeah, what the heck are Zyder and Knees doing here, man? <laughs> That's why. I know you're not, you're Knees' number one fan. Like, let everybody know. I'm not. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, a, I'm a knees denier <laughs> till the day I die. <laughs> till the day I'm knocked out and sent to the blast zone, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm a knees denier, but uh, we'll, we'll see, man. Sandstorm and Boomy playing well earlier. Let's see. Because Zyder and Knees have had kind of a, uh, a different trip through the bracket than Sandstorm and Boomy have, who had to go up against Godly and Fozy, and then they find themselves down here now, whereas like Zyder and Nice, they went down early, man. They came out of pools on the elimination side. They went out game five against Hardy MJ and Simba, then uh, game four against XJ Cool J and Jesser. And then now they find themselves after going 3-1 over Fred Fredberger and Jeff, now they find themselves against no, Sandstorm not Fred and Boomy. Fredberger, bro. I, I, this is one of my favorite names in all of Valhalla. Come on, now. Well, <laughs> right now, uh, it is uh, also one of our first rare occasions at Demon Island. We have not seen many starts, let alone many counter picks to Demon Island all day. That's true. It has been a an apocalypse showdown. Yeah, which we, we normally see a lot of apocalypse, but we also see quite a bit of Demon Island as well. That's a whole lot of chaos coming in here. Knees hoping to edge guard Boomy. The GC D light over on the edge into the side air. Maybe he was Aww. expecting Boomy to like try and dodge through him, so he has yep. a lot of active frames going out. Well, Boomy is one of the most difficult people to edge guard in all of Brawl. Oh, Huge. great punish from Sandstorm. He's going to be able to sneak his way back on. He does have, uh, he, do, he still had Spear Recovery available to him, but that could have been a knockout. Knees fall, Zyder might fall shortly after, and they struck back quickly with some revenge KOs. Yeah, Boomy's waking up now. He's ready to go. He's starting this one off strong because they haven't done anything in the elimination bracket. This is their first set in the elimination bracket, so they've had quite a bit of time. Yeah, ever since they fell to that rate, uh, that rate is shut a little while yeah. ago, they've been kind of chilling. They had a lot of time to talk it up, and you do not want Sandstorm and Boomy chilling in the lab discussing things, because there's a reason why this is one of the most feared teams in all of Brawlhalla. Oh, uh, but you know, well, maybe, I don't know if this is game one maybe. or what's going on here because Zyder and Knees looking pretty good here. And even if they get the stock off of Knees there, I mean, they'll be, okay, now Zyder's starting to take some damage. So the tides are turning a little bit, especially after that side sig coming out from Knees. Weapon toss goes out, Zyder, oh, Sandstorm was hoping to hit the side light and then actually move down before he finds the recovery. Zyder falls. Great neutral light over by Boomy over on the side. Get a, get a tag out for Sandstorm, who actually didn't believe hard enough to try and go catch Knees, who did sneak his way back on. Sandstorm catching the D-Light, but not trying to commit to a Sarah, because he knew Zyder was just going to wait underneath. But there's the Sarah. Great punish from Knees, though, as he tried to make an attempt to maybe go for active input. But he's only in the yellow, so it wouldn't have knocked out anyways. Now, we are very even between these two teams. Of course, Boomy coming in on the Reno that we've been seeing all day. I do like the Tesca in twos. I mean, I don't know for like other people how I would be feeling about Arena. No Tesca setup for anybody like other than Boomy Sandstorm, yeah. but you know I'm I'm open I'm I'm ready to change my mind. It's nice to see the return to Reno as well for Boomy. He's yes. been he's been swapping between a ton. We've seen Diana coming back of late too, but uh, the Reno is what we've all kind of waited to see. And knees with a big punisher, but Zyder falling Bro, right after. What's what's going on here? Knees. He's in the one v one against Sandstorm, and he's very much in the better position here, just in the yellow. It is Gauntlet v Gauntlet. We already saw Sansom was able to make a comeback in a position earlier, but that's not going to happen right now as Knees gets the KO and strikes first. Incredible job from them. Very uncharacteristic thing to happen. Boomy, even though he was forced to go off stage because of the great play from Zyder and Knees, he's one of the most difficult people to edge guard in all of Brawlhalla, and he fell not once but twice pretty early to two of them to start things off. He's got to, you got to shake that off. Now, I'm a knees Three, denier, two, but I got to give credit where credit is due. I think man put out 595 damage. Meanwhile, Zyder put out, I think it was like a mid to a high 300. So, like, he was definitely there. He was in the game. He had his major moments. It just necessarily wasn't in the damage department when all things were said and done. But you, there's more to the game than damage. You are the epitome of... I needed someone to tell me I fell off for knees. Like okay. every, every time, okay. as, as he steps up to the plate up there, it's like, okay, Sparky's up there. I'm going to make sure that I get the job done. But will they be able to replicate that success? We'll find out because currently, already red team starting off hot. 
C knees, hoping to chase, take Sandstorm off the top, but no. Okay, Zyder coming in now with the Lance over on the right side. The ground pound Ooh. ends up clashing out with the weapon toss. It's Sandstorm. He's definitely done. Are they going to be able to clean up? Yes, they do clean up Boomy. That is a full team wipe for the blue team. Knees very much in the red, but if he plays his cards right, he is... Oh, they're grabbing both in that, too! Ooh. That's huge. That's like almost instant 50 damage. And Knees still refusing to give this up. Going to get punished for the GCD light, but does not get KO'd for it, so it doesn't really matter. Neutralized from the gauntlets on Sandstorm will finally get the job done, but he was refusing for a good while, Sparky. And I mean, when you're on Demon Island, if you play it, play it right. You can stay in the middle of that stage, stay away from that ceiling, yep. stay away from the left and right blast zone, and you can live for a very long period of time, and that's exactly what Knees did. I mean, Zyder's doing a fantastic job on his second stock as well. I'm truly surprised <gasps> by this blue team. Sandstorm, though, potential get opportunity, but no! Zyder comes in, side sink to the back of the head. Sandstorm on final stock. Boomy might be right behind a him. great recovery route from Boomy. He had weapon toss down. He had Knees in the way. He had Zyder going for yet another weapon toss afterwards to try and close it. They do finally find him, but it took a long time to get rid of him. And Knees, dude, again, he is so healthy in the lead. He refuses to get hit half the game. This could be a big opportunity for them, though, if they go and catch Knees and capitalize. But Sandstorm missing that GCD light to try and get a combo extension, maybe get a Nair to line it up for Boomy. Nothing really comes out of it. Oh, that was a huge moment. Sandstorm got the first hit on the knees. Boomy got the second hit, but Zyder was right there to interrupt it, so they couldn't continue that combo onto knees and potentially take out that second stock, put him on his final. The recovery still not enough. He's basically picking that up almost grounded, so that high ceiling of Demon Island, again, it seems like this stage is working out for Blue so well. Yeah, it's definitely like a lot of their a lot of their KOs are coming off the horizontal plane. Like you have you have Spear D Sig, you have Lance Sayer, like you're gonna be fine. You're gonna find plenty, but that's a big punish from Sandstorm. That's uh, gonna get I rid of knees. Put on his final stock, but Sandstorm is taken out of the game. Delight recovery from Boomy takes Zyder out. Clutch moment to bring the 2v1 into a 1v1 before Knees was able to spawn and grab a weapon. Yeah, this is the second opportunity the red team has had to try and win a 2v1, but they both times have been in the red when we've gotten here. Boomy can make it happen for sure, but Knees was able to do it last time, and he's going to do it again as Brother. they move up 2-0 in the set. Brother, what's happening here? Our Zyder and Knees about to send Boomy and Sandstorm packing. Again, Boomy and Sandstorm have the potential of not making top eight, of finishing ninth. You know, we've constantly been looking for when Boomstorm is going to be the all-star team we expect to see again. And you know it's only a matter of time but they have not been having the easiest route to success. However, they did last time in this position get the reverse 3-0. They that could is very do true. it again, but the way that the only solution is you must somehow deal with Nisa's survivability because he refuses to get knocked out. Bro, and look at Zyder's second stock. Oh, look at the first half that. of that. That's like 15 to 20% of the game was almost a flat line of not taking damage. So one of the things that Knees is doing really well is he's keeping his the damage that he takes at a pretty good rate, but then he's also just positioning himself on the stage. So when he gets hit by a big move, if it's not like a signature that is for yep. sure going to KO, his positioning means he's not close enough to the blast zone to be taken out. Meanwhile, on the other side, Zyder, you have the brute is right there, right in front of you. If he's just not taking damage. I just realized something too, because I noticed a lot in second stock and it didn't really click in my brain. Zyder is not letting Boomy get gauntlet, or excuse me, uh, blaster combo starters. Like he is always in the way, shutting him down, uh, not just with the Lance, but he was using Spear d -Sig just to stop. Even if it hit his teammate, you're not getting that D-Light so Sandstorm could capitalize on it. That matters so much. That's the part of the chart you don't see is how many times you broke up those moments and Zyder is capitalizing well also without taking a ton of damage when he goes for that. That's a very good point. I didn't really pick up on that, so I'm glad you said that. <laughs> I, di I didn't really realize it at first, because especially on Demon Island, Blasters are having a party with yeah. la lining up team it's, combos. It's a very like flat lateral stage, and what do you have with Blasters in the flat lateral area? You have range, you have range of D-Light, you have the range of side light, you have all the active frames, and pretty good range on neutral light as well. Yeah, you don't have to engage most of the time either. You were able to keep yourself safe most of that match. Insider said, I'm not going to let you do that. Let me make that clear to you very quickly. So I'm wondering if we keep that, because the orb wasn't doing pretty much anything that game. I think he had like maybe 50 damage collectively on the orb compared to the 400 on Blaster. So Boomy's getting his damage in. 
do we see him maybe switch away from Reno? I don't think we will, but I, if I feel like he might need a better boxing tool with uh, with Zyder in that kit because the Blasters are getting the, the job done. Do we go maybe to Gauntlets and do we see the cross come back out? I think a character swap would not be the worst idea at all for Boomy at this point. I think you made a great point about the orb not being a, a difference maker or really like a major player in that game. So you carry over those blasters onto a different legend that has a better boxing tool, exactly like you said. But on the other side, man, Zyder and Knees are just kind of, they're playing really, really surprisingly well so far. And they're another team of UK and Sweden, just like Godly and Fozy are from UK and Sweden. So we have two countries teaming up Seems like it's a match made in heaven. Yeah, that ally uh, is definitely working out well for them. They, they have uh, definitely struck a good accord at the moment because they are potentially Three, about two, to knock one, out yet four. another one of America's strongest teams. And we are up 2-0 in the set. Sandstorm and Boomy looking down what could potentially be our, a back-to-back 3-0. And we are not seeing Boomy swap off of the Reno, swap off of the Orb. We're seeing the same legends coming out, except for Sandstorm. He's playing a bulb, man. We love that. <laughs> We're going to get the, the bias power up, of course, for the bulb positivity from uh, Sparky. But the Wushong, I think, is a good idea, too. Like, maybe instead of having Boomy switch, we're going to have Sandstorm try to utilize that spear to get that little bit more range, to get that poke, to stop them from getting those breakups on Boomy. And Boomy not swapping is definitely not a huge surprise. That's something we talk about from Boomy all the time. Is like he'll go in with a game plan, and he's going to ride that game plan all the way till the end. He's going to dance with the date that he brought. True. He does switch legends between tournaments, but whatever that legend is, that's what stays the whole time. And uh, Zyder and Knees at least have taken a lot of damage to start, because usually when we're at this point, Knees is still in the yellow. Yep. So a lot of things have been changing, at least in game three. Now, if we're looking at Signature Kit as well, from this Avatar Aang coming out from Sandstorm, very strong Signature Kit on the Wushong. Boomy dodging back to touch the wall. Knees nice sending him over to the edge again. Trying to follow up quick with the ground pound. Didn't quite make a connection. Yo, Zyder and Sandstorm clashing over on the edge. Both are able to get back, but Boomy takes out Knees in the meantime. Yeah, again, Boomy having not the easiest time of boxing with people off stage. It's actually been pretty rough for him so far. Sandstorm getting pieced up a little bit too, but now they have separation of Boomy and Sandstorm. Going to capitalize big as they get the Seer, but Sandstorm does not fall. Weapon toss goes out. Sandstorm still living. The D-Light Cider, unfortunately from Knees, the angle that he sent Sandstorm didn't bounce him off of the wall where he could follow up with the Cider the other direction. Just sent him back onto the stage, but they find the stock ultimately. And Ajax, we're really starting to set up for a 3-0 here of Cider and Knees over Sandstorm and Boom. Knees and Cider trying to shut down the Boomy Believers. Boomstorm looking at what could be a 3L. Missing out on that team follow-up to get KO on the Cider. Knees going to help him out, but the dare from Boomy nice. does get the punish big opportunity is to get nice. the there and we get back to last stock a piece clutch factor coming through to even up the stocks here sandstorm and boomy might not make it into top eight again such an incredible pace from sandstorm and boomy so far and then man that would be so rough to not make top eight at this tournament especially because they couldn't play in springs because sandstorm was sick Hey man, look, EU continues to remind us that we need to put respect on that region's name. Man, They're out here to. just. <laughs> we have I to. to. Polymanto is popping off somewhere. They are just doing so great. But we're on last stock of piece here. Boomy's going to get the save, but Sandstorm's going to get punished. Oh, That's going to be Sandstorm not making it back either. And Boomstorm is Goodness. out. And San Diego, Zyder, and Knees take them out. Yet yeah, another one of NA's top rep teams falls here to EU as they get themselves into that elimination side top eight. Dude, Polly is going crazy right now. Oh, he is absolutely. <laughs> He's going he is, so his crazy man is right dancing now. He is Fortnite dancing on us at yep. the moment. We have to just hold that L. Yep. <laughs> what an incredible is, job from these guys. He is such a knees believer. You know, maybe maybe knees can change my mind this tournament. He won't, but let, let's just <laughs> let's just pretend. And there you see it. Uh, that was actually a different game for Boomy. It was 323 damage on the orb compared to the 157 on the blasters. Meanwhile, Sandstorm was mostly focused on the spear. I mean, Sandstorm switching it up to the Spear did help a little bit, but the biggest thing was what we normally expect to see as one of the best defensive units offstage. And then when we mean that very, very much so with a lot of history to back it up, they had no solutions to Knees and Zyder offstage. Like, yeah, at just, all. 
These and Zyder look completely dominant on stage, off stage, in neutral, in advantage state, in disadvantage state, which disadvantage state didn't happen very often no. <laughs> for Knees and Zyder. Like I'm 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 truly surprised by this team. Uh and that's that that's awesome. I love to see that. I love I think Zyder's entertaining. He's not he's not quite godly levels of entertaining yet, but I'm down to see Zyder winning because like I like Zyder. I think Zyder's funny. Hey, you know what? Hey, honestly, well done. Kudos again. You got to give uh, you got to give credit where credit's due. They played phenomenally. Knees refused to get hit pretty much the entirety of the set. Zyder was right there to capitalize every time they needed it. And with how difficult it has been to succeed in this event, and you are one of the few names that gets to join the company of everyone else in the top eight position. Kudos just in general to that, because they now have to fight up against the last remaining reps of South America in a Fiend in West in that elimination top eight. Now, you just heard from us, but there's also someone I want to hear from, given that it was her pick for the winners of the tournament. Guys, I, I, I'm sitting here shaking my head because I am so processing. I am a little heartbroken. I was literally sitting here on the side of the stage I watching you, Luke Duke. You were stomping your feet him. like a kid just got their like, toys taken away from them. <laughs> so anyways, um, I am so processing. I am heartbroken because Boomy and Sandstorm, another legendary duo out. Like this is it. That was their, the, their doubles journey. Gone. Done. That was it. That was literally the elimination side. And, uh, you know, even though I'm heartbroken, I gotta give it up to Zyder and Mies because I think they were playing out of their minds. Yeah. I was watching Zyder and I was like, what? This is such a completely, what is going on in all the offstage plays and just how they had each other's back. Out, I, I just, you know, you can't be too mad, but then you're kind of a little mad. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You know what I mean, Chad. Come on, come on. Where are all my boomy believers out there? Um, but you know, that's not all because that that feels like that's all. No, we still got more coming at you today. I mean, I, I'm going to just start previewing what is actually coming up next. And I kind of want to hear your like final thoughts about that because we got Dog Cutie versus Godly and Fozy. And Godly and Fozy have been just dominating. They're just breezing through the elimination bracket. So Ajax, tell me your thoughts. So really quickly, Dog and Cutie have been playing very well. They took out Saka Pizzino, which is another huge dub. Fozy is back to form though. Yep. For, uh, fo the Fozy we has we saw potentially winning BCX as well as winning Winters along with Godly is back in where they need it most. That's why I'm very scared for Cutie and Dog going into this next match because I think Godly and Fozy are going to be the nightmare scenario of that number two seed we expect them to play like. So my question is, <laughs> earlier we saw Dog and Cutie lose to Akno and Blaze. That is true. Are Akno and Blaze going to give Godly and Fozy the tips that they need, or are Akno and Blaze so confident that they are maybe worried about Godly and Fozy and don't want to give them the tips so that they can then move through the yeah. bracket and you have Akno Blaze versus Godly and Fozy? There's a whole lot of dynamics going on right now because we have a lot of EU teams still in this tournament. Yeah, there's like region bias, and then there's, bro, we've held the LTU the last two times yeah. out, so like, y'all can, y'all can, there's, there's actually the last three times out, excuse me. And so. then there's inter-region bias so, nah, nah, as well. Y'all got it, y'all got it. Y'all can, can handle that on your own. We got three teams up here in EU already. We're doing just fine. But there is a reason why they got the game five. Dog and QD have been on the money. There's a reason why we both had them in our top three back at Springs, because that team has been on fire of late. It's only been a trend upwards for that team. Uh, it, so the, the fact that they are sitting here in the Elim top eight is by no, it, there is no fluke to that. It, this is a team that could definitely get another upset. I just currently, it's kind of hard to doubt Godly and Fozy. That's true, but Cutie is going to be bringing in the ball buff. He's keeping the ball dreams alive <laughs> by playing as Avatar Aang. So we definitely respect that, of course, coming in from North America as well. So we're going to respect that always as we just saw them lose to Adam and Blaze <laughs> at the end of that replay. Maybe they could give us like a cutie dog Look, replay or something. You got to tear them down to build them back up. Okay, okay? okay, that's what it matters. Well, before we get into the action, we just, you know, have a couple matches left to just round out our top 32 journey today. Uh, but... 
Before we get into the next match, we're going to take a really, really quick short break. So don't go anywhere because we're going to find out who's going to be going into Championship Sunday. We'll see you guys real soon.
to the final matches of our doubles top 32 today. It's been a quite a long journey, but we're about to find out who are going to be the last remaining two people who go to top four to Championship Sunday on the elimination side. And I'm joined by Duke and Taza. Um, guys, how are you guys feeling about all the different upsets? I feel like upsets that we've seen. I'm going to start with you, Duke, and talk about Luna Snowy. What? <laughs> real quick. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Let me bring up your trauma real quick. I'm uh, I'm upset. I think a lot of North Americans are upset right now because of North America, again, a, a, a region that I absolutely adore. But right now we've got one team guaranteed into the top four, and that's made in experience. But on the elimination side is three other North American teams all vying for some of that final spottage. But it's just, it's been tough. Some of the top teams in North America have already gotten knocked out. Luna and Snowy, namely, of course, a team that I absolutely adore, but also Boomy Sandstorm, another one of those teams that are just very beloved and also a team that a lot of people had faith in. Conversely, there's teams like Dog and Cutie, who people continually discount Taza. What and are you now talking about? They're here, no, no, potentially getting I, in. I'm the or Meg D and Radish, Taza, okay. potentially into the top four as well. Wow, dude, you're just doing me like that. Well, okay. what, what do you, what right, do you okay, think? Okay. Come on. I am very happy to see Dog and Cutie game this yeah, far in a yeah. bracket of just complete uh, destruction, right? In this lower side of the elimination bracket, we've had teams that, I mean, when it comes to this land, I guess we had like 15 teams that we could say could have made it in the top four. Uh, but to see Godly and Fozzy having to fight against Luna and Snowy for ninth was pretty tragic. But they made it through and are representing Europe. Like you said, the amount of NA teams that we have is four. Well, we have two European teams left with Akno and Blaze on winner's side against Made in Experience. And then we've got um, Godly and Fozzy there in the... Uh, Elimination bracket. There's three EU teams. There's three? Zyder Knees, Godly Foes, and Akno Blaze. Zyder Knees, yeah. Zyder Knees as well. Oh, wow. All right. Yeah. There we go. Zyder Knees. And then uh, Fiend and West was the one South American team. Still holding on. The yeah. final, final yeah. South American and that, team. And so, like, by that bias, I am really rooting for Fiend and West to at least break it through into that top five, maybe even get into that top four. If we could have all three of those regions represented in the top four, that would be really, really fun to see. Well... Let's talk about the schedule of the different matches we're going to actually see, because we're talking about them right now. So the next match is actually going to be Dog, Cutie versus Godly and Fozzy. And I know you were talking about Fiend and Wes and see them get through. That's going to be the next match. And yeah, they're they're up against Zyder and Knees. And just for kind reminders uh, for the folks at home, these are the last four matches of the day. Okay, someone, the, so, two teams, excuse me, two team, teams are gonna go into top four and go into Championship Sunday. We're gonna find out who very shortly. Um, let's talk more about this next match coming up. Um, Godly, Fozy versus Dog Cutie. We got top, I feel like top EU duo team right here versus Dog and Cutie, who I think are, like you said, Duke, um, fantastic team that we're just not really counting. Like, I, I, I had a conversation with Duke about it, which okay. was kind of like, because at Spring Championship, I was looking at Dog and Cutie, and I was like, huh, they're in winner's side of top three. Again, why has nobody ever put them into predictions? It's because they haven't won a tournament yet, right? They get there constantly, then they go down into the elimination bracket and usually get third. So seeing them this far to land is really exciting. I think Dog has been doing a fantastic job, especially in the 1v2s to make these things so close. But Duke, uh, I think after Fozzy dropped that D-Light Sare in winter side, he has he basically vowed to never make a mistake like that again because they are playing fantastic in the elimination bracket. Uh I mean, the the match between them and Luna Snowy, which again was a heartbreaker for me, was an amazing performance from Godly Fozzy. I did not yeah. expect it to go so handedly in favor of the team of Godly and Fozzy. So uh, expecting a lot of things here. And it, it's kind of uh, absurd because again, they're coming in on the elimination sign of things to potentially make a run through two of the final North American teams. If they get through Cutie and Dog, I believe they go into Megdi and Radish right after. So uh, they could really just knock down some more of the North American competition. And again, this is the favorite of EU. So there's a lot of potential behind this team. Well, Taza, Duke, I'm going to let you guys just bring on the action and take it away for this next elimination match. Cutie, Dog versus Godly and Fozzy. Well, it's definitely going to be a good one. Already seated and ready to go. On the left side, of course, you're seeing uh, none other than Godly. Right below him is Fozzy. And then on the right side is, of course, the competition, Cutie and Dog. Yeah. Uh, and, and Godly and Fozzy have gone through a gauntlet already. A, lo a lot of the players that are here from Europe traveled quite a distance. I know uh, both Godly and Fozzy 
personally had like a 25 Top hour eight, travel time. Elimination. Just here. And then the long doubles dance coming through here right now as they're getting towards the very end of it. Let's see if they can get through. His dog and Huge are going to be their opponents going into game number one of this best of five. Uh, and Godly and Fozier are continuing to try and push to represent Europe here at DreamHack San Diego. Ooh, and a fantastic start coming out from the oh, red team, though, as they started getting that uh, gauntlet string built up onto Godly. He's actually getting close to the red here, so there's potential for the red team to get an early lead as Fozzy gets a pogo onto Godly. But the team oh. combo sets up for the Sare, and that's going to be the first KO going the way of the blue team. Fozzy is so unhurt. Yeah, Fozzy's incredibly unhurt, and he's coming up with those team combos there. Even with Godly being so damaged at the very start of the game, getting those setups so that Fozzy can get the follow-ups is leading into those knockouts. A dog with the exit of a friendly fire there, almost executing off the top of the stage. Yo, know, the Sairs from Dog again almost takes out Cutie, but it does result in a knockout onto Godly. But Fozzy playing so well in the 1v2, making sure he doesn't land in between oh. them because the red team was looking for the combo. Yeah, Fozzy uh, side sticks Godly there and then uses that repositioning to get a recovery. Still really, really unscathed here. I feel like the further that we're getting into the bracket, like the more games that Fozzy and Godly have to play, the better that they're getting. This, this ramp up gameplay is so fantastic for them because the more that I watch it, the more I'm like, Fozzy, how are you? He's just so good in doubles at not being able to get that, that, that nice down stick, gets that knockout. And I didn't actually see what, what hit Cutie there. I Just think it was something from Godly. I think it was like a neutral light that launched him. And then uh, Dog interrupted it with the blasters? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It was like a punish, but now uh, still lead for the blue team. Team combo onto Cutie. Goes for the recovery there, but Cutie relatively unhurt as the down sync from Fozzy brings Dog down to the final stocks alongside Cutie. Yeah, Godly pretty damaged here on the second stock, but at this point, I'm not very concerned for the blue team uh, with how Fozzy is playing here. Godly goes in, he's setting up for those neutralites once again. You can see Fozzy and Godly trying to sandwich their opponents in the center of the stage, maybe get something to start with either one of their neutralites, but no, Godly goes down. Fozzy could be taken out here if they're careful about it, but Cutie and Dog aren't taking that risk off stage, even against Fozzy's spear. Yeah, he made sure he did not go near them. He sat on the wall and was like, I'm gonna wait for Godly to respawn. I wanna keep this stock as long as possible as Cutie. Oh. Oh, gets in there, does interrupt so that Dog doesn't get caught by the combo. Yeah, Fozzy now pretty damaged in the second stock. Ooh. Daylight ground pound into Godly's recovery means a ton of damage just goes in on the Dog. Cutie stare to the right, and they're just focusing on Dog. And Dog puts out a, a ground pound there that's so easily punished by Godly that they can just keep oh. switching the oh, edge guard Cutie's here. gone. Cutie's gone, oh. and Fozzy didn't even need to hit that ground pound. Fozzy uh, goes for it anyways, and then the down signature from Godly secures them a three stock here at game number one. Pretty handedly, but again, it's Cutie and Dog, who I think we saw earlier actually have a nice kind of comeback where they were able to make what looked like it was going to be a, a complete uh, stomp go into game five, if I'm not mistaken. But there's oh. that team combo that really gave Godly nice. and Fozzy a nice lead. Yeah, it was at that moment that I think uh, they really brought it back because Godly had started the game off in red in like 10 seconds. Oh, it was a And stare. then we were like, what's Godly going to go down to? Okay, the stairs are knocking them out. And then that weapon throw, this ground pound, he's there's, so <laughs> there's, there's, there's no reason. He's kind of like, I've got two stocks. <laughs> and that gets that gets to some people, right? Like, Fozzy really making yeah. sure that he knows. Gets that little bit of extra sliver of damage there right at the end. You can see it on the graph, actually, where Cutie gets ground pounded. <laughs> <laughs> this is a spike. You can see that tiny tap yeah. right Three, before he gets two, knocked out. One, As we get into game number two, Fortress of Lions again, the map pick for Cutie and Dog versus Godly Fozzy. Godly starting off, picks up the gauntlets, was starting to chase down Cutie. Cutie currently unarmed, trying to play this edge guard. Yeah, let's see how this opens up here. Godly not so damaged this time around. They've got Dog airborne, falls the side light, no follow ups after that. And nothing really getting started here as Dog gets hit by that Sarah Downs to come through. Actually, that, that, that disarms him. And Fozzy's on the hunt there for that edge guard. Sarah finally hits, slides oh. against him as he fades back. No dodge available, and Fozzy relentless on this chase down on Dog. Honestly, dude. I really feel like Godly's here to provide Fozzy some setups, but really Fozzy is dismantling the team of Dog and Cutie by himself. Even interrupting that down air just in case Godly got caught by it. Yeah. Uh, ground pound great. hits. It, this is fantastic. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Fozzy's like probably playing the best. Oh, nice pickup from Cutie there off the side air from Fozzy. Yeah. I was saying Fozzy's kind of playing the best 2v2s uh, of the day so far. He's just doing such a good job, both being an aggressive monster chasing after opponents, but also getting so many follow-ups off of Godly. Nice side stick from Dog, Huge. but it launches Cutie the furthest. Yeah, but Cutie's still on that first stock there. And Godly and Dog are similarly damaged, so as much as I've been focusing on what Fozzy's been doing, 
Uh, Cutie and Dog have been keeping this very even. If Posey goes down here and they can get that uh, knockout afterwards on Godly, they have themselves a very good chance of bringing this to a tie set. And it was like you said when we saw them earlier, uh, they had like a rough game one into making a very competitive game five run in the sense Ooh. that they've had a difficulty with it. There goes Godly down to one stock compared to Posey's three. Cutie and Dog also had a moment earlier today where they were kind of having some tournament nerves, right? Dog yeah. got the setup with like a blaster's neutral and Cutie missed the follow-up. Didn't miss it that time. Gonna pick up the recovery. Cutie and Dog with the slight lead here. Yeah, both teams really focused in right now. Posey going down to two stocks. Cutie and Dog, however, are about a touch away from going down. So that team combo on the Posey is huge. And Cutie almost gets the dodge win on the Godly, but Godly gets, cuts through, gets the Sair, takes Dog down to one stock, and Cutie has to run for the hills. Nice side light. Doesn't get anything afterwards, and Posey breaks up the pressure with the down sig. He catches so many landings with that spear down signature. Even if it doesn't KO, great oh. damage. Catches again. That time it's going to take down Cutie. Oh, and now we have ourselves a really deceptive lead situation. Godly deep into the, honestly, early into the red whoa, now. Whoa. Recovery hits. Cutie, okay, down heavy's got, okay, Godly by himself, that, okay, nice alley -oop. The Siders enough knockback, and that's the double knockout there. I was surprised, that, that Sarah was so close Yo. to not hitting team combo, Yo. the side uh. thing. It was, it was intentional. It sends Dog over there to get the setup, but no, Dog goes back over, denies Posey of the weapon. And this team uh, situation, this is great. We don't get to see this very often, but Dog is preventing a weapon spawn by yep. juggling these. Until Posey interrupts it, there's nothing that can be done. He goes over there just to stop it, and that's a perfect weapon spawn for him, but right away gets caught out of the air by uh, Cutie's D-Light side air. And Posey, can he make it back? Oh, tried to go for the trickiness, doesn't quite work out, and Cutie and Dog win out in game number two. Very reminiscent of what we saw earlier today. Yeah. Uh, again, you, you, you kind of pointed out the juggling that Dog was doing on the left side. Part of why that works so well is he has so much faith in Cutie's ability to 1v1 Posey. If you don't yeah. think your teammate's going to win that 1v1, you're going over there trying to be present, trying to get those follow-ups, trying well, to get some setups and, and punishes. That faith is backed up by the fact that Posey doesn't have a weapon, right? Wow. Like, yeah, like un saying. unarmed against spear or gauntlets is really, really tough. I mean, unarmed against anything in general is pretty tough. Uh, but yeah, you're right. And being able to hold that distance, like with that weapon spawn being so perfect, means that Posey had to aggress to even have a chance to pick something up. So here we go. Back to Fortress of Lions. Cutie and Dog showing that they have a really good fight in them. And that neutral light catches both Posey and Godly. And Godly's been starting a lot of these games out, uh, taking the most damage going into these games. Ooh, went for the setup there, but got interrupted. You saw the side sick yeah. come out from Dog. He really wanted that follow-up, even though it would have uh, potentially hit the teammate there. All right, let's see if Posey can do anything to land. Side like it's interrupted. Dog gets hit by the dare, but doesn't jump into the neutral signature. Nice recovery. Neutral like catches up. Cutie falls oh, on the Sair. The and it would have been nice because the Sair sends it like a slightly spiking yeah. angle, so it would have hit on the backside of the down sig, but they're doing such a great job stopping these signatures from finishing. And now both red team members currently disarmed. Blue team with the weapon advantage. A lot of people in the red, but the side air from Godly not quite enough to take down Dog. He uppercuts his way up. Did he get the wall touch? Yes, oh, he did. He's and the back. Dodge. That was beautiful. But the recovery has enough force. And there's the weapon throw. Cutie sweating. Ground pound hits right as he touches the side of the stage. Can he make it back? He can. And Dog was there to secure it. Nice recovery. And both blue two members go off the top of the stage. It's a lead, albeit barely, but it's a good one. Yeah, Cutie holding on to that tiny lead for the red team. But that uppercut almost does it. That recovery from the blue team. Dog, not sure if he wants to 1v2 or just keep that edge guard going. Oh, recovery takes Cutie off the top. Okay, even game. Dog running away. Has the blasters. Nice job. Cutie picks up the gauntlets. A little bit of friendly fire. Okay, Posey on the right side of the stage. And a lot of Posey's momentum that I feel like Ooh. he had at the very beginning of the set has been kind of stripped away as Dog and Cutie have a better idea of how they want to play against them. And they're really focused firing Godly down. Neutral line set up. Dude, God, Dog and Cutie are so good at, like, making the idea of a team combo be in the blue team's mind that they're constantly defensive. They're constantly yeah. trying to get oh. those interrupts. Nice side sick from Fozy though. And he Can't. gets in there, gets in position, gets a follow-up as well. The weapon throw. Godly getting something to work there. He realizing he couldn't reach with the Nair, so he got a bit of extra damage off of that combo from Fozy. Godly goes down. Fozy could go afterwards, but Cutie's also severely damaged. Let's see what's going to happen here. Dog cycling the weapons, preventing the next spawn for a little bit longer. Fozy catching Cutie in the air with the recovery, and that's a almost perfect spawn for Godly. A little bit of friendly fire there, but he managed Ooh. to get it, and that was a great read on the jump. Yeah, saw that chase coming up. Now, Fozy holding down the lead for the blue team. He's in the red. He gets the Sair. Could oh, go for more. No dodge. Cutie goes in there just to Got help caught. Dog mix it up. Cutie's still trying to help Dog get back to the ground. Dog finally gets there. Disarmed, though. And the Sair hits, and Fozy goes right back over to Cutie. No. Helping with the edge guard here. 
Dog still holding on to this stock, but he's been chased down. He's just narrowly surviving. Finally picks up a weapon spawn, tries oh. to interrupt there. That neutral stick is huge. The Sarah cuts through both Cutie and Dog oh, down here. Spikes foes. He goes to the recovery. Bounces him off the wall. Doesn't have enough knockback, but one more of those will certainly do it as he goes out for the hardest Whoa. read that he's gone for all day. He suppose he's just landed that signature button rip. Oh, but he just goes for the neutral line on Cutie's side. Could have potentially knocked Fozy down to his final stock. Godly in the red. Gets the recovery. This looks like game three is going the way of the blue team as Fozy goes down. Oh. Cutie! Oh, he caught it and he didn't believe. Didn't have anything. The gravity gives the sideline hits. I'm not sure if he had anything. I, it felt like a moment of like him going, oh, that, that actually connected? I was just moving in the air. Let's see if we can get it. Side air hits. Can't hit, uh, get, can't get caught by another one of those. And touches. barely touches. But still, I mean, he's deep red. That's yeah. going to do it. Game three goes the way of Godly and Fozy. Yeah, and really well played and almost a carbon copy of game number one there where we had the situation where Fozy's on two stocks. Godly, sure, he was getting beat up, but he wasn't going down. And he was able to set up for Fozy to really be able to clean up a lot of those stocks. And Fozy gets into this mode. I, I love watching when this happens where he's just kind of like, okay, we're so far ahead that I'm confident that we can't even lose this. And instead of throwing the game, he just uses a lot of neutral six and down six. <laughs> and they, even though they don't connect, it makes his opponent so worried about the threat of that. And then he still has the ability to play really smart neutral just like that. He was waiting to see, okay, is he going to go back on stage or he's going to jump above me? I mean, am I going to neutral item or am I going to catch him with a down light? Um, and we can even see Fozzi's second stock there yeah. plateauing for a, over two thirds of that game, where he basically took like maybe three hits and then finally went down. That, really that's well the played. thing that really stood out to me about Fozzi. Like you were talking about, he yeah. hits this mode where he does blank. To me, it's the mode where he does untouchable. He just yeah. goes invincible and just makes sure that nobody can hit him. He's done that so many times. And it's one of the reasons why like this team just continues to do really well is suddenly Fozzi just kind of the switch clicks and he's like, you know what? I'm Three, just going to get two, untouched and I'm going to just do damage. Oh. So they're going to Apocalypse now. Fortress of Lions was the stage to play on for the past three games. Uh, Godly and Fozzi are at match points. So they win this and they knock out another North American team here uh, in, in top eight. Leaving it to, I think it would be 3 NA, 3 EU, 1 SA, right? So yeah. that would be a really big deal here for, for, for Europe's region. Side stick catching dog on the landing there. Fozzi's actually been so great about dog. hitting dog. When dog's on the right or left side of the stage, he doesn't tend to spot dodge a lot. So Fozzi just looks at him and goes like, well, the weapon hasn't spawned yet. I'm going to call you out with a side stick. And he's not reacting in time to jump out of the way. And that recovery just takes him off the top as they really abuse dog's positioning. Yeah, they. I mean, they recognized dog being, I guess, the quote-unquote weak link. They just chased him down the entire time. Their dog was constantly trying to get away from that and just could oh. not. Nice setup there from Dog. Second oh. recovery. Cutie keeps that stock count even. Yeah, that's huge. Uh, dog ends up going back to that corner, but sets up the downlight side there, and Cutie holds center Ooh. stage. That's like the first time I've seen that down tick used not <laughs> off the side of the stage. What a great read from Cutie. Doesn't knock out. Yo. The daylight sider will get the knockout. Combo. And the gravity cancel downlight dare? sider into Dare. Neutral oh. No Dare follow-up, but Cutie gets a double daylight oh. sider anyways, and Fozzy almost at one stock in under a minute here. I mean, if they could get the edge guard here with Dog, D-Light Recovery would almost certainly knock out. Godly has to help Fozzy get back to the stage. That's such good no, damage. That's, that's, not, that's, that's the opposite not, that's of what we asked for. <laughs> Down airing Fozzy was not the play. Uh, Fozzy thankfully makes it back, but he's still hurting bad this game. Yeah, I mean, he could be on his final stock here in just a little bit. He needs to find the untouch button, but the Sare from Cutie puts him to his final stock. Doesn't hit the follow-up off the Nair, but Cutie is still on that no first stock. No dodge means, oh, Fozzy interrupt. interrupted the D-Light recovery. That one yeah. has certainly been Godly stock. Uh, Sidelight comes through. Nice job setting up on Fozzy. Oh, Fozzy has okay. just been the subject of every team combo Dog and Cutie have. This is this has been a brutal game for him. That weapon toss. Oh, and he oh. OK, Dog fades back yeah. away to stop getting hit by Fozzy's recovery. Didn't want to give him the double. Yeah. Fozzy playing really well here on this last stock despite those last two. Oh, oh and he. He does like the slide charge down thing where the slide's not like full momentum, so he barely goes over the edging as the full charge. Really well played. Catches Dog off guard. No team combo follow up there, but they're bringing this back. It is a very, very tense situation here. And I love the decision from Cutie on that uh, save there to go for Fozzie, the person who wasn't actively doing yeah. the damage, just so he can just stop immediately. Godly gonna get taken out here, but Dog needs to make sure he doesn't fall. If Dog falls, I'm not 100% confident Cutie can win the 1v2. Oh man, Dog on the right side of the stage gets hit by that ground pound, clashes with the recovery. He has to go on the full aggression here, and Cutie gets through, snipes Fozzy with the, with the 
the spear side air. And Fozzie bets it all on an unarmed ground pound. The weapon's over there, Shoot. but he knows Dog's playstyle. <gasps> the weapon throw hits Fozzie, trying to recover low. Oh, no. Then the team combo to the dare. Oh. No falling side air, but Godly now stuck in this 1v2. He has to win this or else it goes to a game number five. Weapon throw forward, gets interrupted. Disarm means that Cutie gets one nice neutral light. And Dog's just going to juggle those weapons until Godly Ooh. inevitably oh. gets hit, but he gets through. I think a game five is undeniable at this point. Godly deep red, last stock, and the Sayre's going to do it. We got a game five. All right. And now, the question is, is it going to just continue that swinging motion where Godly Fozzie win one, then it goes the other way, then they win, then it goes the other way? Is that was back? a very different game than the last three that we saw Okay. because of what happened to Fozzie. And so we, we, we don't get the highlights of Fozzie getting team comboed because, well, maybe we do actually. Oh, well. <laughs> because it never get led to the stock. But what happened was, and if we look at the graphs of the damage, we're going to see Fozzie randomly spike to like 0 to 300, yeah. and then live for a little bit, and then go down. Um, that didn't happen in the previous three games. So unless there was an anomaly, I'm giving favor over to Cutie and Dog here, but we're on a very different stage. This is Miami Dome, and the reason why this is such a big deal is because both Spear players here can no longer reach the platforms with Downlight without gravity against them. In a lot of stages, you could cover platform pretty well with Spear. So let's see how that changes here. I also think that uh, Dalsim, Epic Crossover for Rayman, has a lot of really great signatures that utilize these platforms. Like, you can kind of do the Asuri side sig with the axe if you wanted to, where you slide, slide off slide and off. then all, go all the way to the ledge. So let's see how that plays out. Dog taking a ton of damage here in Game 5. Yeah, Dog is, is taking the beating, and this is kind of reminiscent of what happened in game number three, right? Is Dog spent so long just trying to run away from this blue team. Kind of doing the same here. Nice neutral light. Godly comes in, ends up only catching Fozzie with that side light. Oh, man. Fozzie getting hit by the Sayre. Makes it back to the oh, stage. Cutie. Cutie sent super high into the sky. Oh, and Godly, oh, can he make it back? Nice falling Sayre, but Cutie saves Dog with an unarmed side light so that that Axe Sider oh. doesn't send him super far away. Down to barely surviving. Great angle on there, barely surviving the stair. Both Dog and Cutie have a chance to be able to make this their lead oh. if they can just stop getting hit by these strong hitting moves. Let's see if they can do it, recovery hits. Not enough to KO, Another but that one, that one, one will, will off the soft platform. Dash jump into the recovery. Godly now trying to avoid the 1v2, but oh. Cutie with the recovery is gonna give them that tiniest of leads. And Cutie hit three recoveries back to back to back, getting two of those knockouts. And Dog with a double side light, he gets the dodge down read, and Fozzie gets loaded by a ton of attacks from the blasters. D-Light, pivot, Nair, getting the executed on that so that the Nair hits both Fozzie and Godly, despite the no, downlight only hitting no. one of them. And finally, oh. Fozzie says that's enough. Neutral six, pivots, down six, gets both of those stocks, but look, dude, look, look at, at how the damaged damage. they are. They're getting into the red. Dog and Cutie, oh. Cutie! goes for something cheeky there with the GC side that heavy was unarmed. That, that would have been so cool. I wonder, uh, now after seeing that and seeing it whiff, I, don't, I can't imagine Fozzie's going to let that go. Dog no. fully charging the down sig. I didn't oh. even see that animation, but the neutral takes gone. Fozzie down to his last stock. And this, Duke, is elimination bracket. Oh. Godly goes down to his last stock. Dog and Cutie are healthy here and on the verge of knocking out Godly and Fozzie, the highest seeded EU team here at San Diego. The EU dream quickly becoming an EU nightmare as Godly and Fozzie on their final stocks. Dog and Cutie very healthy on their second stocks. Tazi, you keep asking the question of when will people stop discounting the team? I think that time is coming soon. I mean, if they take down Godly and Fozzie here to down be able to get in the top five, Godly gets hit and he is hurting, makes it all the way back, sweating to the stage. Dog tries to get a landed ground pound. The neutral like connects, up, no. but Cutie lands with the grounded ground oh. pound. Doesn't connect, and Godly manages to get through all of this. Fozzie goes toss? for the weapon throw. Can he get the edge guard? He has to get this deal. Okay, ground he got pound. one. Fozzie is in full carry mode here. Picks up the spear. Godly gets the side stick. All right, it's one stocks across the board, and we've seen Fozzie do these one feature comebacks. There's a chance. Godly in the red. As long as he doesn't get touched oh. for a hot minute here, he's good. Fozzie oh. have plenty of health to play with as the team combo is starting to come out. There. Cutie, Cutie dog. damaged. They're falling Fozzie apart. gave the dodge reads, but Cutie with the recoveries is so on point. Oh. Side light, Nair. No follow up. Fozzie goes all the way off the side of the stage, and Godly somehow survives oh, the start the team combo, and Godly's out. It's only Fozzie against Dog and Cutie, and that D-Light Sider gets him. Cutie and Dog knock out Godly and Fozzie in game number five and move on into top four, top five here at DreamHack San Diego. What an upset. That is incredible. I mean, at this point, Duke, it's like it's no longer a question in the air. That that. Dog and Cutie are incredible as a They're, Tuesday. They are such a solid team. They've definitely more than proven themselves here this weekend. I mean,
coming in here, PR is, I think, like 10 and 12 or something like that. Where is it? 11, 11 and 8 versus PR 1 and 2 of EU. And Cutie and Dog able to take them down. Again, Godly and Fozy just beat Luna and Snowy moments ago. And now coming into this one, you see Dog and Cutie getting that hot W. And now they're going on to fight Meg D and Radish. But fantastic performance and, and the oh. adaptation from Cutie and Dog. That's not something you expect from this like relatively untenured team. Well, at this point, I guess it is. We we, we saw it um, in multiple best of fives all throughout the day. It's how they're getting those wins. They're starting off looking pretty weak to the point where we're like, okay, now can we discount Cutie and Dog? And the answer is always no, because they're able to adapt to how their player, the opponents are playing no matter who they're up against. And that was the most dominant victory that we had seen so far. And that's why I was like, was game four an anomaly or not? Because they had focused down Fozy so hard that they made it actually a very convincing win. And it turns out that it wasn't. They had finally figured it out. Godly and Fozy were able to adapt. And we see with this edge guard right here, Cutie just needs a downline side air, making Gauntlets look like sword there. Uh, that that was a, that was an excellent, and look at the pop off from Dog, absolutely well deserved. That, that was fantastic. Taza, I have a question that I don't know if you can answer. But okay, go for it. Of the teams who made top three at BCX, yeah, how many are still even remotely alive? Boomy, Snowy, both of them are out. Yeah, in their respective teams. Godly, Godly Fuzzy, Fuzzy are, out. are out. Yeah, and I don't, I don't know. I think. Made experience got out pretty early on last time, yeah, right? They, they, I think they, they yeah. top eight in BCX, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I don't think anybody, I don't think any of those teams are there. Yeah, I, th I think our podium BCX is, is literally just yeah. not here. Yeah, so this is a very interesting tournament. Yeah, <laughs> like, it's wild. We, it, it's it's reflecting more of the results of the online championships than I expected, in the sense that like there was some hesitation on certain seeds about like, okay, should we weigh what the results were like? at BCX a lot harder, or should we be looking at the online online championships about who's been doing better just recently in any kind of form of competition in general? And is that looking like it's more aligned in that sense? Uh, because we have teams like Cutie and Dog and Median Experience and Acno and Blaze yeah. doing so incredibly well. But Godly and Fozzy going down as early as they did is still really rough. Um, just because they had such, they had such a brutal bracket to go through, right? They, they, they I mean, who out, didn't? They, they knocked out a lot of really high contenders. To who get who far. did not have That's true. That's an true. incredibly tough bracket? It, it's like, again, I cannot overstate the winners round one for many teams was a very intense match. Yeah. We had Boomy Sandstorm versus Godly Fozy mm -hmm. for top 32, and then we just continued for, from there. It, it's been a crazy day. Yeah, it has been incredible, and we've just got more matches like this coming up next. And, and this one is something that I'm really excited for because I don't think we've casted a European versus South American match so far. And that's yeah. what we've got coming up with Fiend and West going up against Knees and Zyder, uh, who made a really incredible 3 0 upset over Boomy and Sandstorm yeah. just now, which I think nobody was really talking about Knees and Zyder going into this. Like, Knees, it's so interesting. Knees has been a consist literally a consistent top three placement in singles but not really the talk of the town when it comes to doing things in doubles. Mm -hmm. uh, hasn't really had a super consistent teammate. And then Zyder's always been really good. So it's like, all right, this makes sense that they're here. Just nobody was expecting it. And so now I want to see if they can go all the way. Of course, Weston Fiend, I want to see South America be represented all the way yeah. to that top four. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I think a lot of people are going to be coming in here rooting for Wes and Fiend just because, again, mm -hmm. we want, we love South America. We love to see them do incredibly well. Um, but then again, on the other side, Nies and Zyder, they took out like a fan favorite team. They took out Boomy and Sandstorm. Yeah. So seeing them do very well would be impressive. Uh, really, the standout from this team of Nies and Zyder for me was Zyder. Zyder's Orion play. The EU Orions have been looking incredible. Of course, we already saw one Orion just fall a second ago, but still, the EU Orions have been looking pretty good. Yeah, uh, Orion and doubles in general, which which is really fun because, like, after BCX, there were adjustments to, like, Orion and, and Cross. Spear and, Dante. And, and now, <laughs> looking at you, Spear Dante. And Posey had really good success with it. But here we go. We got some highlights coming up from Fiend and Wesley, uh, which is a team that we're going to be seeing on stream in just a little bit. And so this is a team um, that, at MSI, surprised quite a few people because it was like a conversation about whether or not oh, Fiend and West team together. No, I just highlight that. That was him taking out his teammate. I mean, wait, sometimes it's, sometimes it's worth highlighting. Hey, when the stocks fly, it's a highlight. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. You see a, you see a KO and you're like, all right. Uh, yeah, the earnings back and forth here. Zyder and Knees having a lot of those top placements. We see Knees still vying for that gold medal. Mm -hmm. Zyder's been in the top three before. And plenty of top eight and top three or two placements. 
Veen and Wes, much, uh, many more medals coming out of their reason, region, respectively, region, yeah. there. Uh, Wes with so many goals, and then Fiend with so many top threes that it's impossible. He's been doing it for so long. Um, yeah, really excited for this head-to-head -head here, because this is a South America versus Europe uh, matchup where, honestly, Europe's been struggling against South America in a lot of cases. And I feel like yeah. unless it's Godly taking down every single South American player in uh, it once, I feel like South America's really got Europe's numbers. So this is something that I'm interested to see. Yeah, I mean, and then to your earlier point, right, Fiend and Wesley, I think the first time we ultimately got to see them as a 2v2 team was that midseason Invitational, yeah. where they went home with the second place finish. And it was, I know for me personally, I was like, okay, this is a solid team. I want to see them continue to play and see yeah. how well they do. And then they went back to South America and were like, never playing again. Yeah, the, the wild card about South America is that, like, I feel like you can expect the 6 to 8 top players to just really play musical chairs yeah. with uh, who are they teaming with because they're all just so tight-knit in that community in general. But seeing the Fiend West pairing here for, for San Diego is certainly quite a lot of fun. We got the highlights there of Knees and Zyder off of their win against Boomy and Sandstorm, which was a really, really big deal. Yeah, we're talking about that Orion, right? I mean, he gets, ends up getting reversed by Boomy there, actually. <laughs> but uh, almost a really great edge guard. And that's like, those are the side air follow-ups off of the Blasters neutral light. Like, Blasters being such a staple in, in twos in general is because when you hit that neutral light, which in singles, you're just kind of like, well, I guess I'll chase dodge and hope I get yeah. the read. Maybe get it an doubles. Air. Every single move's got a nice Two, enough stare to be able to follow up with that, that you get the perfect angle from it. Yeah, that, I think that's one of the reasons why Blasters is, is going to stick around in the 2v2 space for a, a little while here is because it's such a good setup tool. But we're getting right into game number one, Zyder and Wes versus Fiend. Uh, sorry, Fiend and Wes versus Zyder and Nii's uh, last South American dream here. Yeah, starting off on Demon Island, we've got Hattori and Olgrim. Classic picks both from Fiend and Wes there, and already Fiend responding to that neutral light from West gets the daylight sider and West no doesn't jump with gravity cancel the neutral signature could have gotten the spike there and that would have been a super early knockout on the knees. I really want to highlight what West did after that setup. He hit the neutral light for Fiend to get the follow up. Yeah. Immediate chase dodge forward to box out the opponent to make sure that team combo continued and knees going to be the first one to fall. Oh, Fiend goes all the way out for that pogo there, reading when he was going to release the recovery, but Zyra goes for a full charge on the land. Science against him hitting knees and West with that dash forward nair gets a second nair keeps Zyra away. Way, and is now trying to box knees out of the air as they're trying to get their second stock here in game one. Zyder just eating side air after side air from Wes. Good pogo from Fiend, but Knees drops down, hits the recovery, and is able to interrupt as Wes was getting that side air started onto Zyder. Yeah, Zyder incredibly damaged, but not out and still damaging his opponents. There's the recovery onto West. That's two stocks he takes down, and Fiend finally is able to stop it. The, the weak leak here being Knees, super damaged after losing that first stock, and is already close to going down to one of Wes's many down sig landing callouts, which he loves to go for here. Goes in for the combo with Knee with Fiend. Is the double neutral light and Zyder trying to catch a landing there and that down to with nowhere close to hitting anybody. Fiend realizing the distance adapts, uses the side light instead. So much damage going on to the blue team here, and that Ooh. was almost the stock. Good, good down air from Fiend, side air from West, gonna take down knees to his final stock there. Down light almost takes out Zyder. That is an axe down light putting him off screen. Yeah, that down light so close to knocking out. Sarah will take him down. Fiend and West up four stocks to two. Really in control over game number one here so far. Oh, can he get this? this? Okay. Wes got away from the edge guard. Oh, they're so good at dealing with the nope. downstick. And then I say something, and then Fiend falls into <laughs> it. Doesn't knock out, though. He's a little bit more damaged. That side stick okay. catching that landing from Wes. Fiend goes off the top. If they take down Wes right now, then I would call this an even game. Yeah, this I is, mean, this it's, is it's very close. It got a lot closer as Knees drops down, hits the dare oh. on the Zyder, but the side air. Almost does it, the team combo opportunity, but jumps. Fiend, he's Fiend just staring knees That's away. It. Fiend, we, we talk about this so much. Spear, sword, doesn't matter. He's so good at babysitting the edge guards there. It's Sarah after Sarah. Every time you do those panic jumps, Fiend is there to be able to hit you with a cider right afterwards, refreshing your jumps to get it. And this team combo off of the oh. side lights doesn't quite get it, but they're still getting a ton of damage, and Zyder can't find himself with a weapon. Okay, there it is. Lance picked Punish. up. Ooh. Really, he was hoping that West would jump up for a dare there, yep. but that neutral sig. West trying to bait out a reaction with that jump dodge down, and it works. Sidelight Nair hits, Fiend falls to the side here, and Zyder says, all right, we'll go next. He's like, okay. off the side okay. of the stage, and we're going to game number two with a lead for South America. 694 damage put out from Wesley yeah. with the Olgrim. It 
kind of took a minute for him to ultimately decide on this Ulgrim as far as like 2v2 characters pick for Wesley. Like, I know he's played the Orion. I think he's been on the Roland as well. Like, he's kind I of mean, cycled around for a bit, but finally, it's like... As long as he's got a Lance, I'm feeling pretty okay with it. Yeah, I but feel it's like... Like, like I, we've seen so many Ulgrims in EU that it's like, what? why did it take so long oh, to get here? Oh, well, Three, it's, just, it's just a matter of experimenting. I think, that, I think that Wes has been selling the Ulgrim for quite a bit. And I really like how Wes plays the Ulgrim because I feel like he, more than any other player, will call out players' landings with Ulgrim's really powerful signatures. He loves using the down signature, not when it's ready to knock out, but just like as a light attack, like a, basically like an axe down light that goes both ways. Um, and he's just really fantastic with the character in general. And I feel like as long as he's got a Lance, it's, it's pretty okay. I think that Axe is just in a good enough spot here, like with how much more stun that Nair has gotten, that the follow-ups for him are just way more intuitive when playing with Fiend. And look at that. Knee is just getting stared a ton. Yeah, Wes tried to get that follow-up there. He was very close with that Axe recovery, but didn't quite connect. Knees jumped immediately, and Fiend with the read, gravity cancel, side sig, but Zyder's down sig Whoa. launches both South Americans, and Knees hits the ground pound. Yeah, nicely done. Picks up the gauntlets, goes for the neutral light, picks up the blaster, and tries to get a jump read. That's stuff recovery. Wes is out of there. Fiend now picking up a sword, but they're down. No. Okay, double Come knockout, on. almost. He Got can get one more recovery. It. Zyder trying to stay as high as possible as Knees lands back in, but there's the side lights there. Team combo opportunity. Oh, and Wes. Hits his teammate, gets the heck out of there so he doesn't do any more damage. And now Fiend's got to go over to, to help Wes with knees at this rate. Knees is actually really popping off with the gauntlet so far in game number two. Okay, Fiend with the neutral line, just trying to get those blue team members stacked up a little bit there, I think. Oh. Oh, the Fiend, good interrupt. Ah, the Sair hits, the falling Sair hits Fiend with the sword, gets Ooh. caught by Zyder, side sick. he delayed the side sick after the side lane hits. Okay, Knees and Zyder really adapting to how Wes and Fiend are playing this time around, and Zyder feels really comfortable. I mean, Zyder's signature accuracy has to be really high for how many signatures he's used this game. He's hit several double stack down sigs. Yeah, I mean, not even that, like, just then, he had the read side sig on the dodge in from Fiend. Oh, Wes, okay, he does pick up the side air, but Zyder with that ground pound. Yeah, game even up oh, now. Gets the side oh. sig. That's not enough knockout to be able to take down Zyder on the Black Knight. Fiend goes, or Nice goes in there to be able to help his teammate recover. And he succeeds. Zyder with the Lance now. Hitting both Fiend, hitting Wes, going both directions. Knees with the great Sire, Sire follow up. And now Zyder. Oh, oh, and there's Wes with that slide charge pivot down to completely covering the state. He's dominating here on the second stock. Doesn't get the down light, or sorry, down air into the end sig, but my eyes are on Fiend, because if he gets caught here, he's gone, oh. and that is the down sig to take Fiend out. Wes gonna fall here. Knees almost into the red. Wes, yeah. can he do it? Fiend literally wiping his brow after that one. Wes does hit Knees with the Haymaker, though, but the double oh. D-Light Cider and a recovery means that Wes starts the stock off deep into the yellow. Let's see, weapon there, he can pick it up. Okay, the Nair comes out from Zyder, just tapping on extra damage. Wes finally picks up a weapon, it's a Lance. Walks a little too close to the end light. There's yeah. the down sig, and Wes is gonna fall, tying it up 1-1. One, one. And that's uh, that's difficult space to get there right there, but Knees went right into the right position, double jumps, does the fast fall, a little bit of smile, a triumphant uh, smile there coming out from Knees and Zyder as they're realizing, okay, we've got this figured out, this feels pretty good. They're getting their team co combo follow-ups, and we just saw there one of the many down sigs that Zyder was able to actually hit stacked before leading into a knockout. Here's that side that. sig read. That was so smart, getting that dodge down read. Something that like blaster players will do a lot with sideline side, -light, side -light, but like it's way more devastating when it's a Ryan side sig. <laughs> when it's a, a literal sig, it's so uh, such a, a big play from Zyder to go for the side sig there instead of the down sig. Like I think down sig would have covered the same movement, but I think the side sig it just has a little bit more force with it. Yeah. And so we're getting right on into game number three. Let's see if the red team has some adaptation. Well, so far, the adaptation is doing a ton of damage to Zyder. I mean, Fiend really doing well with the sword. West now going in this little, like, dodge circle pattern oh, with, the, knees. with the Lance Nairs, and Knees almost takes West off the top. Fiend literally downlights West just to get a chase dodge, and West turns it into oh. an opportunity to get a knockout. No! Whoa. Knees gets the recovery and turns into a gravity cancel D-Light Nair onto his opponent so that oh. West goes down, and they take the lead 6-4. to four. Knees is just getting all of these opportunity options. He gets the downlight into the recovery. He gets the side air to follow up off Zyder. Zyder with the edge guard on the left side. Can he finish off Fiend? Oh. Yes, he can. Fiend's down to his final stock. We're not even a minute into this. And Knees is playing phenomenally. The way that he's been playing Blasters, getting into this game three compared to game number one is so fantastic. Zyder goes down. Knees makes his way back to the stage. And Wes is actually at danger here. Anything that Wes or Fiend do against Knees is super high risk low reward because he's so damaged. At at this point, they've got to focus on Zyder and see if they can get him to the same state that Fiend's in. And now they have an opportunity. 
Uzider gets launched there by the side air, but no follow-ups available for Wes. Fiend catches the landing, immediate rotate over. Wes goes after oh Zyder, God. that's the stock evener. Oh, he goes through the wake up recovery. He had all of his options exhausted, and it was so, he was calling him out so hard with the recovery that he didn't expect Nisa just to be slamming that recovery button, and that stock goes down super early for Wes. Yo, they rotate over for Zyder. It's close, dude. Nisa goes Sarah? down. Zyder, if he gets hit by one combo starter here, no, Fiend hits the sideline to his oh. teammate, and Zyder somehow avoids every down like every side like gets through all of that and knees picks up a weapon just takes a little bit of damage for his troubles but still a very even game just don't bring knees to the top of the map because he's getting those reversals with those blasters recoveries goes for the gravity cancel Zyder's in the red West gets the handoff off of Fiend side there delight Zyder punish okay. on Zyder Zyder goes down knees now in the 1v2 severely Ooh. damaged gets hit by that Sair he can only take one more of those and now Nies makes it back to the side of the stage, and Fiend and Wes are both realizing you've got to land eventually. And when you do, we'll catch you with that sideline side air. Wes with the amazing comeback in game number three, as they were behind three stocks to six, Duke. That yeah. was a devastating lead that they just looked at, and they went, you know what? I know exactly how to get out of this. And I was just in the middle of complimenting how great Nies' blasters play was. We're seeing highlights of him actually doing it in the middle of the game here. Um, and he, he even got that wake-up, like, recovery on yeah, the blasters. Yeah. It's so weird where I'm like, this is a match full of knee Zyder highlights, and they lost. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you just you got to give so much credit to Fiend for surviving. He yes. went down so fast. He was one stock. And he held on to that final stock for so stinking long. I mean, after that, what do you do as knees and Zyder if a three stock lead is not enough to be able to take down these South American Titans? I don't know what is. Like, Maybe look a at them go. Four, okay, well, <laughs> we, could, we could try that, you know. Four, yeah, six <laughs> stocks to two is, is, is very potent. Agreed. Uh, let's see if they can do it. He's fighting off stage. Oh, that Derek caught him on the jump, but he makes it back. Uh -oh. Gets the Nair. No ground pound, though. Fiend's not falling for that. Gets the ground pound. Clashes with the recovery, and Zyder goes off to do even more damage to Fiend. But Fiend with the punish, like you said. Yo, but the right side, side. knees. Doesn't hit the weapon toss. West gets back up. Knees oh. rotated over to try to get the follow up for Fiend. West comes back in. Zyder with the side air. Red team is be uh, getting split right now. Neutral light catches everybody. Oh. Knees slides forward, just charges the downside. He didn't like that he went for it. So he goes for it, and Whoa. Fiend slightly charges the neutral stick there for a spot dodge read. Doesn't hit it, and Nice just lets that down to grip. West does not jump into the D-Light side air and instead gets sent off stage. Are they going to go for the weapon start? No, they wanted West out of there. Nice and Zyder once again take the lead, 6-4. to four. They get that slap down, taking down Wesley. Fiend coming in, waiting out for Wesley to be able to pick up a weapon spawn. Goes for the follow-up, hits the end sig, left side. Trying to think of the edge guard. It's a downlight side air, and that's going to even it up immediately. Being so fantastic with those adaptations to where the downlight hits, not going for the jump there because he hit the side of the stage, just had the side air right afterwards, and now trying to get it again. Everybody in the yellow here. Knees gets a side light, activates that chase dodge, flies right in, and West stops him in his tracks with the axe. Let's see what he can do. Neutral light, Fiend sets it up, but Knees interrupting already. We see Knees in that position once he sees that his teammate get hit by that combo starter, stopping that attack, and oh! Okay, Zyder just barely avoids the downstick coming out from Knees. Knees really likes holding onto the charge for that move, kind of like a Wuxiang play style. Yo, Zyder yo. goes down, Knees goes off the top, Fiend and West bringing it back again. Four stocks to two, dude. They lost their initial stocks, and then they went into clutch mode and continue to get the damage out onto the blue team. Not going to get taken out by the recovery from Knees. Going for more. Oh, West that recovery launched. from Zyder doesn't do it either. One more strong hit, and the West might do can't it. Touch. Fiend can't touch. Let's see you get that side air. That's enough knockback. Maybe weapon throw. Okay, yep. gets the double knockout. Fiend and West get their respawn timers at least synced up a little bit. But Fiend gets tagged. Da Delight, neutral oh. signature. Oh, no. Zyder gets them flying in the orange, though. And some friendly fire from Nies. That's not good. No, but they're both back on. Zyder with the spot dodge. Fiend not able to punish oh, it. There's no. the Sair. Zyder? Zyder make it back. Fiend's edge guards are so oh! good. He, he pokes him out of the ground. He gets a neutral save? signature. The save into the Sair. Zyder can't make it back. And Nies gets interrupted out of his dodge. Down. He's got nothing. And West gets that dare. And Nies is out of there. Wes and Fiend win 3-1 and continue to represent South America as they move on to the top five here at DreamHack San Diego. The EU Dream started our block with three, and it is down to one. South America still holds on, but they're going into the North Americans next. But we'll catch up with them in just a little bit. Still, amazing plays from South America. Wes and Fiend, of course, we knew they could do it, but man, to see it.
Wes going untouchable on that third stock. Yeah, and even in between the first and second stock, right, he spent that entire duration not being touched until eventually getting hit by those attacks. And we see how quickly Knees and Zyder went down in the middle of the game. We got the highlights of what had happened there because it, the game felt like, I felt like we were going to go into a back and forth game five situation, but really, Fiend and West started off behind every game and then said, all right, that's enough. I'm not losing stocks anymore. And that's how it felt playing against it. And Knees and Zyder just could not get the adaptation to work. That was such an amazing combo there to get that win. Um, but they're out at seventh place. And Fiend and West move on to face against Java and Fakey later on in the bracket for that top four qualifier. Man, it's it's so wild because like you kind of talked about it, right? Like there's so many moments where like Knees and Zyder just look really good. There's so yes. many moments where it's like, okay, I see the things that you did to earn your place here in the top eight of things and, and, and to get the victories that you obviously have earned. But then you run them up into Fiend and West, and suddenly you're like, oh, Fiend and West, they just they just have this. Yeah, they're relentless with their pressure there. And something that I think Fiend and West do better than any of the doubles teams that I've watched today is that when they've gotten an opponent off stage, sometimes they'll do that thing where they're dash dancing on the stage waiting for wall slip to activate. But what we saw there towards the end was constant pressure of throwing weapons off the stage, making sure that they were putting out moves. Like, West did that turnaround down air to get that edge guard. They were not going to make it easy for Zyder or Knees to make it back. And it was just fantastic. And even the games where they lost, they lost because Cutie, or, or sorry, Knees or, uh, he like with the Blasters, we saw that, like, wake up recovery. Mm -hmm. They lost to those because they were being so aggressive with their options, because I think like West like jumped up with the Lance ground pound, and that's why he got hit by that recovery. That they would go down to the wake up options from their opponents, but it was because they were the aggressors the entire time that I think carried them through that match. Well, of course, it's been some amazing sets. Uh, we've still got two more sets to go, but before that, we're gonna take a short little break, or maybe even a longer one, because I think you told me it was 10 minutes. So we're gonna take a break, but when we come back, we'll of course be bringing you those final two matches to find out which teams are gonna be joining the final four on Championship Sunday. You don't wanna miss it.
Only two teams can join the final four into Championship Sunday. We've still got two more sets to go. One North American team already made it into the top four, and that's made an experience. One European team already made it into the top four, that's Akno and Blaze. Many favorite teams already knocked out. It's been a wild ride, but we've still got a little bit more to go on this roller coaster of an event. Taza, uh, how you feeling about everything so far? Well, I'm feeling a little bit better because Wes and Fiend got that win. are now one game away, potentially, from getting to that top four and having South America on the map. We've got Magni and Radish going up against Dog and Cutie. Dog and Cutie all made so many upsets this game, uh, this, this today, mm -hmm. but the biggest one being that 3-2 over Godly and Fozy, right? And then Zyder and Nies, who had upset Boomy and Sansom, or actually, I guess that was just a projected win, um, to, uh, lost down to Fiend and Wes, who are now going to be going against Java and Fakie, who have been playing, I think, phenomenally. Like, the best I've ever seen Fakie play mm -hmm. has been at this land, yeah. and Fakie's just been getting better and better. I, I can literally say the best that I've ever seen Fakie play was at the last tournament that he played at, and I don't get to say that about every <laughs> player all the time. Yeah. Sometimes, like, players will have good days or bad days, and Fakie's just always having a better day. Um, and Java playing fantastic, of course. But this next matchup that we got coming up, Dog and Cutie versus Magni and Radish. So this is North America versus North America. Um, the, uh, yeah, well, I guess it's North America. It's like, it's, yeah, a, can, it's America can versus America Canada. America versus Canada. We actually, it's like, so it's not, <laughs> yeah. It is actually just America versus Canada. That's yeah. pretty cool. Let's go. What are you rooting Let for? <laughs> let's go. I was going to ask which, which one you're let's go in oh, for. All um, right. You know, uh, I, I, I am a, a proud American, but I also I, I like Meg D and and, uh, and uh, Radish. So okay. I'm gonna go for Canada. I'm down to side with Dog and Cutie. Okay. I played some rank twos with Cutie. Okay, we did Is pretty that, well. That's the metric. That's the metric. <laughs> yeah, and I yeah, played yeah. rank twos with you. Yeah, that, I mean it, it went pretty all right. Okay. And he's really really good at twos, and I don't have to be in order to win. That's what I learned. <laughs> Uh, Dog and Cutie, however, going up against Radish and Meg D. All right, here we go. So Meg D and Radish running this comp that they uh, pioneered. Uh, the Tesca Chun Li, they pioneered this in Spring Championship. I was a little, a little harsh on, uh, on the Raiders Tesca, but I'll tell you what, it's playing a lot better this weekend now that we're at Lan Diego. And then Dog and Cutie, same thing over here. The difference being that with the Chun Li, they like having the cross, the blasters. And look at how much damage going on with Cutie at the very beginning of this game. But I gotta say, dude, at this point, oh! with Magni getting that neutral signature, as amazing as that is, I'm like, Dog and Cutie always lose game one. Yeah. <laughs> I was saying, it's like, you, you can't get too excited just yet for the red team, even if they win game one, because Dog and Cutie have consistently lost game one and continue to just adapt oh. against the opponents. That recovery didn't launch. Did he drift out of it? I don't think he got interrupted. Yeah. So so another thing to note is that I've become a huge Meg D fan in doubles after Spring okay. Championship because how aggressive he tends to get off stage in this game mode. So we'll see if he's able to continue with that here. His dog is actually doing a better job being healthy than Meg D in this situation. And Raiders and Cutie are both down to a stock. Okay. Blue team does take the lead here. No team combo from there, and Dog was kind of like, why didn't you hit the recovery? <laughs> hits, him with the, hits him with the dare, but uh, they still have the lead here. Yeah, this is a, a pretty healthy lead for the blue team. Dog uh, might be close to the red, but that's oh. probably not going to do it. Yeah, and that side air from Dog. He's got lots of horizontal movement. You see Cutie thinking about it, but Radish comes up, hits that recovery. Oh. Now Cutie left to the 1v2. Radish yeah. and Meg D not able to get a team combo, though. Yeah, a little bit of friendly fire there from Radish's gauntlets, uh, double gauntlets here for the red team. Dog lands with that neutral light. Raid is so quick to be able to interrupt it with the side light, but nothing else comes off of it. And now we can see dogging that side light and the down sig. Neutral light set up, but no. The Radish is so good at stopping the last hit, the pop-up hit of the uh, blaster's neutral light. And if we keep seeing Cutie getting in position for when that move finishes, and then is not being able to get a follow-up because of Radish's uh, tenacity there. But finally, that Sarah will take him down, and Meg D might go down here go too. Again. Nicely done, catches him out of that recovery, and that's a double knockout for the blue team. Left side, right side, getting those follow-ups off the pop-up from Dog. Radish staying low there, didn't panic jump as Cutie came in, but not gonna get KO'd there. Oh. Meg D getting that side stick. Is that gonna be it? Yeah, Cutie. That, is, that, that move's so oh. powerful there. Neutral light hits, and that time Meg D waits out the full three blasts before hitting Dog with the Sair. He's the healthiest one on the field with those two stocks. Cutie being a potential weak point here, but Radish putting Dog down into red means that they might have themselves a completely even stock game in just a few seconds. Nice read yeah. from Meg D. Gets the second side light for the recovery, and like you said, perfectly even stock count. Don't go for the weapon denial, though, and they're gonna let Dog pick up some blasters as he starts to space out Radish. Oh, yeah, Radish 
Beast there trying to go in for that side light. Does get uh, a, a nice little two piece hit there. And making Ooh, the down oh, ticket to the team oh, combo. The side oh. ticket gets the down ticket to the neutral signature. And even though it doesn't catch both of them, it does get the stock. And the 1v2 is much more uh, palatable than fighting just a straight up team in doubles. But Cutie hitting the stairs. Raiders had trouble getting back. Has to sweat to the side of the stage. And Cutie slides all the way off with that down tick. No punish though. Cutie gets back up safely. Of course, not too much burn there when you go for that uh, slide charge down tick. Like you're not burning a dodge for it. Meg D with the soft follow up with that weapon toss. Punish oh. opportunity here, and that's going to be a Sare to give Meg D and Radish game number one. Yeah, you really are betting everything on a gravity cancel signature attack like yeah. that because when you gravity cancel in Brawlhalla, you are expending your dodge, and expending your dodge in the air is longer than doing it on the ground. So it's really just the longest way you can get rid of that resource without even using it defensively. So when that neutral stick didn't hit, we saw uh, Radish take advantage of the fact that because he can't dodge, there's so many more follow-ups that he can do with the boots afterwards. Takes his time, make sure he gets the right attack. But look at this team combo. Side taking it to down stick, sends it right back to Meg D. They've rehearsed that a million times, did it flawlessly. And then we see Radish not hold in on the boots there, there because the, the uh, yeah, non-active input has less version. variable force. Yeah, yeah, so you get that extra bit of force by not holding in on your stairs, which is... Something that a lot of Boots players had to get used to, because Boots active input is literally just kind of like, do you want to go far or farther? <laughs> you want to keep holding? But we're getting right on into game number two. That team combo from Meg D and Radish really clutched them out game number one. We'll see if they can go for that again as Radish goes Ooh. for the nice side swap down there to try to send back towards Meg D, trying to set up for some combos. But I believe that was Cutie that was sitting behind, ready for the follow-up. Yeah, I like Radish's use of the boots there on stage there. It seems to be a move that I tend to only see him use off stage. But has so much potential for combo setups and 2v2s. Oh, nice oh, job oh, that oh. side air sends it right into Meg D's neutral signature. They've got so many great setups off of those hits. And Dog hits one neutral. Neutral light. Cutie goes over the grab and cancel down light and gets sniped by the neutral signature from Tesca's boots on Radish here. Oh. The down sig, not enough to take Dog down, but the team combo on Cutie makes oh. it worth it. Oh, and Dog interrupts with the neutral signature, but it might be too little too late. That's Cutie's second stock, oh. and he's oh. out of there. You can see him reel back in his chair there. He's down to one stock in under a minute, and Dog follows shortly afterwards. It's six stocks to three. Does Dog and Cutie have the Wes and Fiend factor, Duke? Because they're gonna, I mean, they're, they're still getting combo, Duke. Oh, I know, oh, oh. the Dog is the neutral thing. He's not just taking oh, up save. all the way off the side of the state. Okay. Meg D's turn. Meg D has Dog the clip. Off. Okay. Dog, Raid is still surviving here. Finally, Meg D goes down to two stocks. Nair comes out, but Cutie just swings in. Team combo, they need this to complete. Yeah. Nair in, in the end sig, not going to oh, KO. Cutie didn't have the, the jumps to be able to follow up there. That was a fantastic team combo, though. And Megdi could be down to one stock at this point. I mean, Cutie and Cutie and Dog know exactly what their game plan is. Cutie has to be like, well, Dog, I hope you get that neutral win because I literally cannot aggress. Uh, and dig. instead, Dog gets obliterated, and Cutie's kind of like, what do I do with Steven Sarah? Island? Sarah nope. comes through. You could, there's only so much wall to touch. <laughs> Very short walls, and it leaves Dog left to the four stocks, and this is so, okay, okay. Another what? stair. Oh, we got too close. Oh, but it still worked out because he can wake up, grab the cancel neutral light, and the delay the neutral stick hits, and that was honestly a really sick combo. Radish and Meg D destroying Dog and Cutie, who, reminder, just had an amazing upset over Godly and Bozy, right? So this this matchup for Meg D and Radish may be a blessing at this point, because I'm wondering, I'm wondering who they felt more confident yeah. going up against here. Uh, because this is destruction over a team that has been doing so darn well here at San Diego, but the, but the Cutie and Dog might be out at fifth at this rate. It, it, it's been such a fast best of five. Well, it's it's also crazy. Of course, of course, Cutie and Dog hot off the win over Godly Fozy. an absurd performance. You cannot understate oh. that. But also, like this is Cutie and Dog. They have consistently lost game one and then come back swinging in game two. That was Radish and Meg D just kicking it another gear. Zero in game spear two. damage from Meg D. 490 on Who the gauntlet. Spear? I guess so, right? You just gotta wait for that snowy tweet that, <laughs> <laughs> that highlights the fact that somebody did zero damage on one weapon instead of the other. Uh, yeah, gauntlets have not exactly been getting love in balance patches lately, nope. but they're oh, still oh, doing oh. pretty fantastic in the double space here. As we see four gauntlets on the field and Meg D making great usage of them, using all of his damage last game on those. Dog now in the orange here. Their backs are against the wall. This is match point. So if Meg D and Raiders get this, they're in top four here at DreamX San Diego. An impressive performance to say the oh. least as Dog comes in, hits the N6. Still not enough to take down Radish. Another side heavy comes in. Team combo immediately. Pick nice. up into the side sig. Dog and Cutie hold on. All right. And they and it's more than holding on. This is a fantastic lead. It's going to take a lot of damage coming up from Meg D and Raiders. We see that they have that combo potential because they've been doing it in the midst of 
of the frame where they're not, like, not waiting for the 2v1. They're able to get these team combos at any point in time. Sidelight side air because he saw that dodge was caught on that first sidelight. Side sidelight recovery. Might get Cutie here. Cutie dodging everything into the dunk. That neutral signature, like we talked about, not the greatest at spiking. Much better when you hit it on stage, but still the trajectory and the angle is very good, and they get the knockout and even things up pretty quick. Yeah, I mean, Cutie did not have movement there. Was going to fall, and that was enough to even it up. Now it's Radish and Megdi's turn to team combo, but Cutie comes in, interrupts, puts some damage on the teammate, but it stops the combo. Oh, Radish, what is he going to do with the boots? Gets in there, hits Dog once. That's all there is to it. Cutie goes in for the downline, almost catches his Ooh. teammate. And Radish catches everybody with those boots attacks. Yo, but he's going real low there, and you saw the, Cutie the positioning for the pogo, so Radish with the side swap goes Megdi. to the outside. He almost had the team combo off of the Sair there from Dog, but no. Okay, here we go. Falls in, tries to get the sidelight, dunks him onto the stage. That's a lot of damage. And Light hits everyone, but he doesn't get anything after it, and Dog's going to fall to his final stock here. Yeah, Dog goes down. Cutie could go down shortly afterwards. That Nair comes through, spikes Cutie to the left side of the stage. Radish trying to get in, catch with Downlight, find a Sair follow-up perhaps. Can he do it? Oh, he falls with the Nair instead. I like that idea, actually. It covers his head quite well. Falling side air, oh, oh. strong hit, disarms Cutie. He saw Dog come in, interrupt with a side light, but thought Meg D was going to come try to punish him for it. Oh, and Cutie's taking so much damage, Duke. Oh, oh Cutie! And Meg D and Radish, they went down so early on, and yet they've been yet to lose a stock since oh. then. The neutral stick goes the wrong way, and Radish survives. If he makes it back here and takes a stock, that is so huge. Meg D even gives him a little bit of a boost to make it back. Meg D gets a boost himself, finds a weapon. Cutie goes oh, low. Cutie goes so low. Oh, oh Cutie they're, they're didn't touch. Cutie, Cutie didn't touch. It just falls down with the down air. That means Cutie's down to his tournament stock. Dog flying in the air, trying to get back to the ground. Nice weapon spawn for Cutie, but they are so behind. Okay, There's Radish one. goes There's down. One. Can they get Meg D? There's two. All right. Final stocks here. Dog just a little bit more damage. Still opportunity for the blue team to bring this one home and at least get on the board. Take this to a game four as Cutie gets the down light sider, putting the pressure out. Meg D just looking for Dog. On Radish. Cutie untouched so far. Cutie is going on a rampage here. Nope. Falling sider nice. to the down air. Gets the pogo to stop Radish from interrupting Dog's combo. And Radish in deep orange almost in the red here. They're keeping Radish in the air. Pogo stops the neutral light and Meg D went for the combo follow up but couldn't get it. It's so close. Oh. Oh, the team, D. There is a lot of team damage there coming up for Meg D. Does Radish make it back? He does, but barely. He was looking for Dog, ended up catching Radish there. <gasps> Radish with the Nair save, but he eats the ground pound. Meg D left in the 1v2. Can he take down Dog? Oh, Meg D. I mean, it, it, it's really possible. He's so good at getting these recoveries. Falling recovery here on Dog will be huge. Nice. That recovery. You saw Cutie step out of the side of the way, completely trusting that his teammate had that confirmed knockout combo. That D-Light dash jump recovery. Really tight, but an absolute standard if you call yourself a Blasters man. Yeah. And I've yet to see Dog drop that once. So he just made sure he got out of the way so that they could get that win and bring it to a game four. What a great game three there for them. They needed that one. And I love that replay at the very beginning of Dog going for an improvised unarmed combo alongside yeah. QD into the pickup Blasters side sig. That was just that was like literally raw skill coming out from Dog and Cutie. That's something you basically never get to practice because how often are you going to be able to time it perfectly for a weapon spawn in the air yeah. like that? But Cutie and Dog, they've got themselves on the board. They took a game. Yeah, the ability to improvise combos like that, especially with weapon spawns on the fly, is so fantastic and speaks a lot to their ability as doubles players and as a team. Uh, Radish going into this game number four with a ton of damage on him, but the oh, team combo opportunity. Oh, no. And Megdi and Radish don't drop that. They love going for those finishers. The finisher's always the same because the neutral sig on uh, Chun-Li's gauntlets or spear covers the same area. So great damage there, but Raid is still oh. the most damage on the screen, but that could be changed here. If somebody Cutie. goes down and look at that, Meg D always getting that D-Light neutral signature, even though it ain't true. Oh, but so Dog good tried it. to make a trade out, tried to take down Radish with the side sig, just didn't have enough force behind it. Side light Meg D with the fake out interrupt, and he oh, hits the end sig, but that's gonna take teammate. out the teammate. Yeah, he hits the end sig onto Radish. Uh, and he was so damaged that even the forgiveness that we get for friendly fire there is not enough to save him. Uh, yeah, let's see. Cutie, super damaged in the midst of all of that. So maybe that was what he was thinking when it came to being worth it. Oh, oh is that oh, going to be it? I thought that that was a oh, scramble Cutie's and a half gone. there. But that weapon throw means Cutie's down to one stock. And we see him uh, collecting his thoughts there as Meg D is uh, tripled Cutie stocks here in game number four. And if they win this one, they win 3-1. This is such a tough spot for Cutie to be in. This is basically tournament stock, but also like you can't just sit on the wall and watch Dog 1v2 for the next six minutes. You have to be there. You've got to be present to get those interrupts bare minimum. Is Megdi taking like 
100 damage this whole game. He's not even deep orange. That is incredible. I, I, the, the graph for this game has to be insane. That has to be the first time he got hit in the last, like, minute. Down oh, to combo. hits. Okay, they charged a little bit to hit Dog even harder, too. Side light from Dog. Radish comes in, hits the side air. He goes for the active input to make it have yeah. less force. Yeah, and he, he gets to travel out of the way, too. Yeah. He'd be like, here, let me use you to reposition with these boots. Uh, gets that side air, active input forward. Gravity cancel down, doesn't catch. Super high in the sky. Dog uses that recovery to reposition. Megdi's still surviving on this third stock. Finally, Cutie Ooh. gets it. But is this going to be a knockout? Uh, the revenge knockout on a dog is so worth Megdi's first stock. Yeah, I mean, they can take down Radish, potentially, but even then, he's just now oh. neutralized. Dive do kick it? into the neutral light, and that's enough to knock him out. OK. Cutie's still holding on. But how much longer, Duke? Uh, it's going to take a lot here for Cutie. Oh, dancing around here. Lots of recoveries attempted from the red team. I mean, there's an avenue. Oh, nice right? down sink. They hit Megdi out of the way. They get a team combo on the Radish. Oh. They get the 1-2-1-V-2 one, one combos oh, of a okay. lifetime, and they got themselves a game five. Megdi is getting bullied a bit here. Cutie's still surviving. He's using that oh. side line to reposition. The recovery comes through. Follow a team up. combo onto Radish. Dog. They get the several oh, side airs, and path. Radish is now deep in orange. Megdi goes down. Radish has to run for his life. Goes for the weapon spawn there. Side air hits. Dog was hoping for a ground yo, pound in that side stick. They have to hope for those things. And Cutie, how has Cutie been untouched this entire time? Side air onto Meg D means some damage comes in on the board. And suddenly, Duke, this is way closer than I was ever expecting. Oh. Is Radish going to go down to Dog here? The ground, ground pound, pound splashes him up into the sky. He just can't touch the ground. Cutie sweat beats, still lives. Manages to touch down. Meg oh. D with the down stick finally takes down Cutie. Dog left in the 1v2. Damage being done. But. He okay. Just to dodge away. Dodges one. If he gets one silent recovery read on the Raiders, that could be it. Yeah. Meg D goes in for the sidelight, throws the weapon away. Okay, Dog uh -oh. gonna get the new one. That dial oh. side under recovery means that Radish and Meg D knock out Cutie and Dog and win 3 1 to get into top four here at DreamHack San Diego. What a set and what a near comeback that they had there with all the focus fire coming down on Radish. I mean, you gotta give a lot of credit to Cutie for surviving so long. And like I said, it's not a situation where you can sit in the back and just watch. You have to be present at the very least. You gotta make sure that Meg D and Radish are looking at you and thinking about coming to get you. And he, he tried his present. best to do it. He was he present. really tried. I mean, I was seeing like gauntlet side lights in a ch diagonal chase yeah. dodge away just to make the movement so weird after over what is like expected or what's telegraphed after you hit a gauntlet sidelight and cutie was able to extend the stock I, the graph for meg d's survivability compared to cutie's survivability is going to be so fascinating for me yeah, to see after really that game that. uh just because of how long both players went on hit uh for a large portion of that game four that radish and meg d really put on a show in game two with all those team combos that that we're, we're seeing a few of those right now yeah, it, it was an amazing set. Meg D and Radish uh, definitely upsetting Taza here because he's such a Radish hater. And yet Meg D and Radish, Radish ended up making it into the top Don't four. Worry. Right, I'm now a Radish fan. Okay. After all these team combos that uh, he, he's done with Meg D, at this point, I'm oh, just... So, wait, I'm, when we started that set, who did you pick again? I, I didn't, we didn't really pick anybody. No, you picked Cutie and Oh, yeah, dog. I picked Cutie and Dog. Yeah, that's right. You're that's okay. What? <laughs> <laughs> I... <laughs> I enjoy all of our professional North American teams, right? Dude? They're all great. You love to see it. Yes, look at yeah. that. Look at the comparison between Meg D and Cutie there and how... Dude, Cutie lost two stocks in like a fraction of the time that he was alive on that last stock. That was such an incredible run. And then Radish was like... This is the weirdest array of graphs I've ever seen. <laughs> like, Dog is the only one Dog's that looks the only normal. normal. Yeah, yeah, it's like, it's like, I was just playing Brawlhalla, and everybody else was kind of like I, I'm losing their minds. I have no... Yeah, Meg D was hit by... Four moves in the span of two minutes at the very beginning of that game. And then Cutie was hit by zero moves in the span of two minutes at the end of that game until finally that down sig of all things hit him. What a crazy game for. What a crazy set. Dog and Cutie out at fifth. What an amazing placement. And they had some incredible upsets to get this for far. Sure. For uh, sure. But Meg D and Raiders are going to be moving in that top four. And that means, Duke, we've got one more match to decide mm -hmm. the four teams in top four. Will we get all the regional representation? Will we get another South American team? Or will we get a South American team into the top four? Or is it going to be the North American shutout, barring Acno and Blaze sitting on the top side? We're going to find out in just a little bit. I, I, I'm going to be honest. 
I'm not going to be upset either way. Yeah, you uh, you're going to cry. It's like a 55-45 okay. matchup, okay? I wouldn't, like, cry, but I would be like, Ugh. I'd, like, grumble, and yeah. then I'd be over <laughs> okay. it after five minutes. Because the reason with that being uh -huh. is that Java and Fakie have just become my favorite team to watch in North America. Really? I don't think they're my favorite. They're not, like, my favorite team to Period. To, to win the tournament, yeah. But they might be my favorite team. Period. Pretty soon. Okay. Uh, like just because, I mean, and you know this. I've talked to you about how much I love Java's Heimer playstyle since literally uh -huh. like last year. Yes. Uh, when he showed up in that uh, round robin special that yeah. we did, and then ever since then, I've just been a diehard Java fan. Um, Fakie is like kind of the coolest spear player I've ever yeah. watched. Yeah, I mean, awesome. it's hard because like Fiend is like the best spear player I've ever watched, and that has not changed yet. Okay. But maybe it will it after this matchup, right? Might. Like that's what's so like watching Fiend Spear, where he literally invented how the weapon is played. I'm just gonna say that, in my opinion, like the okay. like like Fiend's been carrying Spear long before he was even considered meta in yes. any other region. Um, and then there's Fakie, who's playing Spear with with uh, Java in such a unique way, in the sense that they've got these vertical team combos where he gets the the recoveries down into the pogos and all these things that I've never even seen any team do before. Uh, watching them go head to head here in doubles is the best treat that I could ask for to end today. Uh, and this is just the first day of DreamHack San Diego. Yeah, it's going to be a really good set. Of course, uh, we're going to see Wesley and Fiend. There's Wesley on the screen going up against Java and Fakie. And there's the head-to-head. -head. Of course, a lot more history on the side of Fiend and Wesley yeah. inside their region. Again, long-time competitors. Fakie, definitely the newest blood on the oh. scene. Java's had some amazing performances, not necessarily in twos. Like, I kind of right. know him as a 1v1 player for the and, most part. And that's what's but, so amazing yeah. about this team is that I'm feeling like Java and Fakie is it. Like, that's the Java's finally found the doubles teammate yeah. that, that he needs to be able to get his first top three and he's one game away from getting top four here and imagine if the first medal that this team gets in doubles is DreamHack San Diego that would be such an amazing start to their land year right it because be. we're looking at that and that's zero across the board for both these players here the earnings is a lot higher for Java because he's been playing so well in singles like you said but Fakie on the other hand really making that debut in, in the doubles space Fiend and Wesley, however, have just a, a career's worth of brawl, like years and years of placements here uh, to back them up here. And we saw well, we, we, we saw what that, that experience did for them in the previous set before this. For sure. And of course, uh, we've, we've seen so many uh, matches across today, across uh, just, just day one of DreamHack San Diego. We've got one more match to close out today. That's that final match of Java and Fakie versus Fiend and Wesley to find out which team is going to be the final team in the top four going into championship Sunday. Yeah, I mean, it. the story writes itself. If we can get ourselves a top four with two NA, no, actually, you wrote the story. Blaze and Fiend and Wesley, did I write the story? Yeah, yeah you did, by, by seeding it like this. <laughs> I mean, it got disrupted pretty <laughs> quick. <laughs> like, like the, the seeding got really messed up in like winners round one in like half of the matches. So it's been an interesting result here. Um, yeah, I can't wait to see how this plays out. I really like just realized now that it is it is literally two different playstyles of Hattori going head to head, and they're the best Hattori's playing in the tournament right now. It's gonna That's, be super cool. That is so neat. Um, and then we got Java's Bodvar going up against Wesley uh, on on the Olgrim, and they're really the most unique Bodvar and Olgrim to play doubles. This <laughs> this is gonna be so sick, dude. I can't wait for it can't ask for a better match to close out day one of DreamHack San Diego. Of course, once we hit Sunday, one team is going to be lifting up those trophies, uh, which uh, I think uh, Lovestick's gone around and taken many pictures with those trophies. Yeah, I've been like climbing bridges yeah. in, at the edge of buildings with the He's trophies. gotten some on, nice beauty on, shots with yeah, them. Yeah, on ledges. And I'm like, wow, please don't drop those. <laughs> they did not get dropped. They don't even have you fingerprints on them. They, it's they're, impressive. They're, we're, we're, we took very good care of those trophies despite the precarious situation. You might have seen some of those on the uh, Pro Brawlhalla Twitter. Yeah. He's been, we, we, we've been cranking out a lot of, uh, a lot of awesome content here from DreamHack San Diego. It's a beautiful place. Oh yeah, San Diego, it's, it's, it's been, been amazing. Yeah. And here's Fiend and Wes, all the way from South America here, one set away from top four. The question is, can they get through this team of Java and Fakie? Oh, this relatively young team, these new bloods, but oh yeah, that that the 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 yeah. earnings from Fakie was the evidence that I needed. Yeah. It's like oh yeah, there's that that one good tournament that they had, and now it's just been snowballing since then. You see Fakie right now getting ready. It has been a long day for these players, right? Yeah. Some, most, most, yeah. So most players uh, were here really early in the day. Like mm -hmm. I'm talking about, right when the venue opened at 10 a.m. 
to be able to get all that practice in. Well, of course, uh, it's been a long day, and it's uh, going to get a little longer because we're going to take a short break uh, as we get some things settled out. Looks like uh, having a little bit of issues here. But, of course, we'll be right back with that final match of Wesley and Fiend versus Java and Fakie in just a little bit. We will be right back. One final set remains. The players are ready. They are itching to battle. It's going to be Java and Fakie versus Wesley and Fiend. Controllers plugged in, keyboards plugged in, eyes locked in. They're ready to go, Taza. Yeah, and I'm ready to go with this, too. I, this is the most exciting match for me today, especially with how they've been playing, all the upsets that they've made today, uh, the battles that they had to get to get this far, and the fact that we have, like, this... this, this uh, South America versus North America matchup where we have super unique play styles in this space going against each other. Here we go, Demon Island is faking Java versus West and Fiend. We've got Hattori and Bodvar versus Hattori and Olgrim. Um, uh oh, uh oh. And we might, no have, to we, we might have to double check no the, the, the controllers there. Uh, now that we get right into that. Is it Java or fake? Well, either way, uh, we're going to definitely get a reset on that Holding one. Holding the woohoo we move. Right? That's how you know. I think the South Americans are good. It's the North Americans who are the problem. They are listening to Taylor Swift. Hi. Uh, is that what problem. it's been. Okay. Yeah. You're the. We, you said, oh, you don't, is that a reference? You, you don't listen to I don't Taylor Swift. I'm no sorry. Idea. Yeah, it's okay. There's plenty of. If people she made a jazz, jazz album, I might listen. I don't. That's. That would never happen. <laughs> 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 Probably I still wouldn't listen, to be honest. <laughs> like, 
Swifties <laughs> everywhere. Yeah, 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 I'm in my eras moment right now, Chaza. <laughs> Anyways. But no, it's definitely uh, North America. We're the problematic region. They're trying to ice out the South Americans. Right. As long as we just keep unplugging and replugging in the controller, <laughs> the game will never start. Dude, I've done that before. <laughs> what, are you, <laughs> no, what, what are you doing? <laughs> but we got some highlights. Let's, let's get into it. We got Java and Fakie. Of course, they didn't have tech issues all day just right now, but we've got some highlights of their plays earlier. And again, like you said, oh, it's been all about that Bodvarin highlight. Uh, yeah. Bodvar and Hattori. Yeah, yeah. Let's see. Uh, wait. <laughs> Dude, that's a sick that, Yeah, that was a pretty sick highlight, actually. Oh, recovery there as well. Oh, Java's. Java does this. I actually, like, must have been away when watching that. That was so sick. That was actually an amazing highlight. Team combo here as well. Hey. And Fakie went off the side of the stage. And the gravity, gravity canceled the delight to get the right yes, spacing sir. for that. Oh my. Oh, oh what? Oh, Java and Fakie are winning the tournament. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, they, I think they technically lost to Echo Blaze. It was like game five, though. Yeah. But are you seeing how they're playing? It's been impressive. But also, you know, like Wes and Fiend, they've been playing impressive too. You can't, you can't discount them just yet. Yeah. Yeah. We got Fakie, top left, Fiend, and Wes, bottom right. This is random. I know you're not like a really big jewelry guy. Okay, I'm not. You, by saying not really big, you might as well just be like not. Okay. Yeah, I don't But know I'm just. Think. So I noticed Fiend is wearing uh, many rings, and I can tell you from personal experience, when I'm wearing like rings and bracelets and things, there's times where I'm like, you know what, I'm gonna take this off because it's like, yeah, you got it's, it's 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 throwing off my game, you know what I mean, like with the keyboard and whatnot. But I think like Fiend hasn't been taking them off. He's just like sitting there chilling. He's like, I gotta I gotta look good to play good, IRL. Or maybe just doesn't bother him like a boss. Maybe not. Yeah, I got weak fingers. What can I say? Here's some highlights, though, of Fiend and Wes. They've also been having an, a fantastic day today. No, I play with keyboard. So how does it bother you? Just sometimes, like, it just, like, click do you, do you like Do you, like, use your keyboard flat fingers? Yeah. I actually, I, you know, I play Brawlhalla by uh, just single fingering. And okay, looking. okay, okay, no, that, you, you're, that's, you're just poking the keys? Yeah. Like, like, like how a, I type. Like, <laughs> one, one key at a time yeah. with your index finger, and you're, like, you're, like, targeting it like a laser. You're, like, <laughs> like ah, a, yeah. And you miss D, it, and then instead a, of backspacing it, you D. just start the document over again. Because <laughs> it's like a typewriter. <laughs> Oh uh, no! I was genuinely curious because there's people that actually like no, learn to type I, I, flat. I, I'm, I'm taking typing classes. Okay, so just, it just uh, but you have to take typing classes. I have though. Um, also, of course, it is still DreamHack San Diego. So we do want to remind y'all at home that you can pick up this San Diego merch for Brahala San Diego. Pick up the hoodie. Pick up the T-shirt. It's event exclusive. If you're someone who gets FOMO, you fear of missing out on this sick drip, then make sure you pick it up because it, it, the sale ends Thursday. Yeah, yeah. Check it out. If you want a link just to be able to check out all of Brahal.com, merch, Brahal.com slash merch, okay. where you go. And yeah. it will take you there too, but also QR code. Scan it. Scan it. Pull Use up it. your phone. It, Get a Brahal San Diego just hoodie. Go to the camera app and it'll there's just kind of scan it on nowadays? Well, okay, so I'm, I'm old, Taza A, go ahead. B, but um, the it used to be that like phones, you'd have to have a specific scan it right scanner now. app. Scan it right now. It's on the it. screen. We can see it. Yeah, why would I scan it? Fine, I'll do it. It's gone. I can't do it anymore. Yeah, they saw you reaching for your phone. They're like, nah. -uh. <laughs> Literally, we can't, no. we can't get to do this. Get out of here. I'm just going to look at all of our cool merch. Yeah. I needed to show you how it was done. You, your phone could just, you could just use the photo. Like, you could just That's turn what on I was camera. saying. But yeah. I'm saying that back in the day, yeah, yeah. back when I had to walk uphill, downhill, in the snow, barefoot, we had to pull up a special app Where to look live? at QR codes. You are, you, are you kidding me? <laughs> You've never heard <laughs> that <laughs> phrase? No. Well, so earlier today, <laughs> earlier today, I'm having a conversation with our fellow developer programmer, part of the creed. Okay. And he was talking about how like he'd only ever lived places that snowed. And then I was like, well, what about California? He's like, oh yeah, I guess I lied. Creed's like, a what? liar. He lived then, in Texas. And he also lived in Washington. <laughs> so he just completely lied. He's just and, a liar. But it took like five minutes to unpack that he'd actually. He also stayed with me in Georgia. Yeah, he meant. I guess he meant that he grew up with snow. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, well, I, I mean, I believe that he had walked through snow or whatever. That's why uphill, like, up, uphill both ways. Did you ever live in a place that snowed really bad? Uh, no. No. I, I grew up in Texas. Have you ever seen like? I know what snow looks like. Okay, but like. Yes, like I've bad, been to places where it's not. Like it's like a really bad like. Yeah. Nine, twelve inches of snow. Yeah. I, well, I don't measure. You don't like guesstimate. No. No. Okay. All right. She tells me it's big enough. That's all that matters. <laughs> 
<laughs> Wesley sitting there looking at the screen. He's just right. He's like, come on, let's do this. We're good to go. That's what I'm saying, right? Fakey and Java are also feeling that way. It's been a long day. They're ready to get started with this. I think they're going to try it again, and we're going to get into this game number one. I'm going to be hesitant. I was so ready to go uh -huh. in. It was like my best intro yeah. today. You got to try it again, though. And then he just falls off the stage. Uh-huh. Here we go. You just know, take a deep breath. It's what? a second opportunity for a better intro. You know the only... Three, two, one. Game one, Java and Fakey versus Wesley and Fiend. Let's get into it. Nobody's going to fall. We're getting right on into it as Java picks up the hammer. Fakey with the sword. Yeah, and with Wes on the Ulgrim, Fiend on the Hattori, Fakey matching the Hattori, and Java on Bodvar, we have this really cool matchup where it's like two of the most unique Hattori double play styles that are still in the game. Oh my Ooh, he's gone already? And then, and, then, and then we've got like the two state, like, Previous staple doubles character and current one with Bodvar and Olgrim in the way, but they're not being played the way that you're used to seeing. Oh my god, dude, Java is. <laughs> that three neutral heads? Oh, Java oh, gets it down to get to the save. Off the bounce? Chases speed all the way Fakey? out of the stage. Fake with the oh, double the edge guard. No, the save comes through and they both make it back. West still living, both sweating back to the stage, and West. Gets the D-like ground pound into the ground pound for Fiend. Accidentally stacks up the West, but still so much damage coming on the Java second stock. And there, how long have they been off stage? The Fiend just fell, right? That was yeah. just... <laughs> okay. He just didn't get the tap that he needed for the chase dodge up. And that's going to be Fiend's first stock to fall. Wesley going to fall as oh. well. But should I remind you that Java lost his first stock so fast? Yeah, and he could lose the second st stock just as fast. Fakey goes down. Has to hold on the side of the stage. We know Fiend and West aren't going to let this uh, pressure go down before Fakey manages to get over there. Java turns Java. it around. Okay. Oh, he didn't oh. touch, though, for the turnaround. That's dare. two, uh, two self-destructs so far in this game number one. Uh, falling off the side of the stage pretty quickly there, and Java already taking some damage as Fiend goes up the side here. Fakey trying to make it sure that he can make it back to the stage oh. somehow. Ooh. Interrupts the double D-Light Slayer. Oh, the D-Light coming to the top, and Fiend is just deleted. Now it's an even game. Top of the map, Fakey got the gravity cancel down light into the recovery. Keeps the stock count even. Java needs to survive. So does Fiend if they want to see the oh. final stocks alongside their teammate. And that's what I'm talking about with those down signatures. West loves letting those grip when he's using it like a, a, a light attack almost instead of going for that knockout, just catching people off guard, Fakey. making them wary of that. Fakey doesn't get enough force on Fiend to continue this damage, but it is so close, Duke. Fakey gets the Saren West. They get the team combo on the Fiend, oh. and the D-Light recovery means that one more of those, and Fiend's out of this game one. The neutral light puts Fiend off screen. Wesley gonna fall. The ground pound from Fakey. That spear edge guards have been on point it's all so weekend. It's so fantastic. I know we were talking earlier about that, how Fakey makes the spear ground pound look like the best move in the game again. And he does this like double jump, delayed fast fall spear ground pound that catches people right as they're thinking about drifting back to the stage. Can he do it? Wes does get the knockout onto Fakey. He could get Java here. This would be crazy. Sweating. He's so good at these dares on the side of the stage. He's chasing Java through. Java, I'm almost certain, will stay grounded. Let's see if Wes calls that out. He does. Ooh, caught him with There's the Sair. Calls out uh -oh. Java uh -oh. staying grounded. Can Java make it back? I he think touched. it can happen again. As long as West doesn't, points. as long as he doesn't dash jump Sair, and he continues after Java. Okay, Combo. Team Combo started. That could be oh. it. But the side stick doesn't hit, and West gets even more damage on the fakie. It was double sword, so they had to go for something tricky there because they got to avoid the DI as he DI's up to avoid the end sig. West gets caught by the downlight sider. He's still living. He's sweat beating no, no. though. He, he touches. still touches. And Java dodges way too far down there. Okay, he does make it back. West sweating. He touched. Gets the nair. Bounce off the stage. Still surviving. Avoid the side air goes with the weapon because faking oh, and deny oh. it but the delight cider catches him off the jump and they finally secure the game off what could have been a really crazy comeback there from west it was so close to being a west clutch winning out the 1v2 but fakey caught the jump with the down light as west picked up the weapon spawn and so fakey and java take game number one yeah that was a crazy game one i think decided completely off of the reversal onto fiend off mm -hmm. the top of the stage getting that early delight recovery evening up the stock with java because java was getting deleted pretty fast and then java held on to that last stock and they bring it into game number two with the, with the lead in this set here we go in to game number two like you just said weapon spawns everybody finally picks theirs up and fakey Decides to look for the 1v2, maybe to help out uh, Java against West right now, because Java, again, kind of getting caught out against the South Americans. Yeah, Fakey does that chase dodge directly up. West getting punished by that Sarah recovery. Pogo coming up from Fakey to add some damage onto that combo, and Java can't actually get the landing there. Gets hit, uh, the hammer hit out of his hands. 
And now that neutral light and the D-Light Cider from Fakey, they're getting a lot of double sword combos here. And they're trying to make them work, but we saw the Ooh. DI working a lot there. Just calls them out with the neutral signature. Save go for it again. Ground pound. Java so good. Did you see that? Uses the down light on his teammate to have the momentum forward and then fast falls with the down air to get that edge guard there. What a clever idea coming out from Java. Because he didn't jump, he was able to get into a very unique position that no dash jump, no regular jump would have gotten him into. And they take the lead six to four. Really good positioning. And now the red team gonna try to push this lead as the blue team has both of them in that KO percent. Wes looking for those big swings, those down sigs, those side airs, but Java oh, goes oh, for the, the double dash. He, he got the recovery. Got okay. the save. Java well, and Fakey gonna fall. Down. That was a, that was an interesting interaction of them both like nairing at each other and they're and not the able missing. to touch. Yeah. And so because the one nair would have knocked them back not long enough to get the jump back. All oh, the double delight sliders that in for West. West oh, just good. early recoveries. Fiend trying to keep Java away from Fakey, but that neutral light comes through. Man, Fiend doing so well to cover for West. He's trying to do it. Goes for the edge guard. Java oh, dipping no. low the weapon toss. Fiend. Gets back to the wall safely. Wesley knows he's very damaged. Gonna have to play this a little bit safer as he comes in for the follow-up off of Fiend. Yeah, Fakey there to uh, damage Fiend for hitting his, uh, his teammate. Nice movement. Gets side-aired. Wes and Fakey both recovering. Java so good with the down airs into recovery. He's off stage. He's so crazy. Picks up the hammer. Falls oh. to Sarah. Wes out of there. Now Fiend deep in orange, but not at a point where he would be knocked out by a Sarah just yet. Has to get some kind of revenge knockout to make this even. Might not get the opportunity. Wes is back into this, has the lance in hand. Final stock here for Wes as Fiend does get the recovery, gets the Sarah off the pass from Wes. Edge guard. Oh Ooh, no, Java. Java. With an air. Yeah, having the sword is a little bit better than fighting on arm. And the D-Light recovery will take Fiend down. All right, Java, the healthiest on the screen. Let's see if he can hold on to the stock a little bit longer. That's one Sarah. Doesn't go for the second as Wes calls him out with the recovery, and it's a dead even game once again, Duke. Oh, but Fakey positioning so well, not even getting caught by Wes on the edge guard, and definitely not allowing them to get that team combo set up. Oh, the neutral light into stop side here, into a second stair. Java just goes in for a third, and Wes already in orange now. Yeah, Wes getting chunked there by the big hammer swings from Java. Fiend got some damage put out here. All right, let's see what he can do. Gets hit by that nair from Fakey. The neutral stick calls Wes out, and that disarms him. Side air, neutral light, Trouble. spot dodge. Fiend side airs his, uh, side ah. his way through right into an alley-oop from Fakey. The side stick hits, and Java's looking for that landing. If he can catch yeah, one side air on the Wes, he's out of there. Fiend gets hit by the side light. Can Fakey make it back? Neutral oh, light okay. does stop Fiend from getting the edge guard there, but Fiend gets the neutral air into recovery. Falling side air, Fiend oh. fighting 1v2. Oh, he gets disarmed there. Neutral lights come out. Edge guard opportunity. Fiend gets past the side. He hits both of them. He hits both. Wes. Did you see Wes? He turns to him, covers his mouth. Look at that. He's like, oh, I can't believe that. And so what's crazy <laughs> about the side? He's stick, offended right? for them. So the side stick hits because it connected with one. It, you it get the, the swing blast, on the second yeah. one, and we got to see two different properties of knockback there because of how crazy that interaction was. We saw a little bit about uh, of that from Akno with the Kaya on the down sig. Yeah, there's the swing from the side signature, and it's just enough to knock them both out after they let him slip through. What an amazing comeback there from Fiend. Completely, oh, that, that, dude, that's dude, so crazy. All of his spear damage was that side sig. <laughs> all 32, all 32 of, of that was the spear. He picks up the first spear, he's like, I gotta do something. He side sigs, he goes, oh, I won. And then oh, Wes was like, I can't okay. believe that happened. Like, Wes literally was feeling bad for them. <laughs> all right, they even it up. Three, two, We're in the game three, one, and we've got ourselves a set. Yeah, of course, you could not ask for more. Like you said, Taza, you were so excited for this set, so they got to give you the most of it oh. as a team combo. Oh. Gets it down like the neutral and sick grabs them. one. Oh, man, can they get something else off of that? He goes for the neutral signature, even oh, though it doesn't catch Java. both. Uh -oh. um, it's still Fakey? good just to get one. Pogo's Touches. galore from Fiend, but he manages to fight his way through. He neutralizes the wrong way, and Fiend just hits him for it. Oh, but Java with the turnaround, down light side air. West comes in, tries to get a swing onto him, gets pogoed for his troubles. Top of the map, Java launched Fiend up. Both blue team members in the red, oh. and it's Java with the nair. Oh. There's the recovery. That's two recoveries coming out. The nair from Java and the recovery from Fakey, and that's a six stock to four lead. Wes and Fiend now have to do a lot of damage here because Java barely damaged. Fakey playing anti-air on that platform. And Wes, he's going for these grounded side airs, and Fakey is just spot dodging them and leaning into a punish where he's taking even more damage. 
Wes and Fiend definitely playing a little scared here. You can see them sitting a little bit further back as another team combo comes out. Wes falls out of it, so he's able to get a little bit of a turnaround with that recovery. Sides it hits again. Yeah, Fakey, can he make a pack? Fiend edge guarding here. Nice Nair disarms Fiend. Java beating up Wes in the center of the stage. They are not happy about Ooh. that last game. That D-Light down to come oh. through. Fiend sweeps the board clean with that neutral signature and almost brings it back to an even game if he wasn't one hit away from being at a four stock to two situation. Yeah, this is a, it, it's closer at the very least. Downlight pickup, good interrupt from Wesley. Neutral light connects, Fiend yeah. with the falling side air. Let's see what Fiend can do with the stock. Recovery hits, that's not a great start. One more of those from Fakey, he's gonna go down. Okay, the weapon toss from Fiend opening up. He knows he's got the extra health. Trying to stay out there, hits the stair, chase dodge up, Fakey with the turnaround. Trade out, it's going to still be in favor of the red team. Yeah, but Fiend had such a great streak there that he gets shut down. When that stock oh, goes down, down, down tick from Fakie and the Fiend, though, means that he's already in deep yellow, almost orange. Side air from West means Fakie has to recover high, but Fiend's too focused on hitting Java. Nice. No, the ground pound covers everything. It's a good the move. The team combo into the nair. Him. Java in the orange. Blue team could take him down, falling side air, oh, launches Fakie. It's, it's the down line. Oh, oh, but Java stops it only for West to finish the combo anyways, gets the side air. Now Java is four hits away from going down. And if Fiend uh, and West can get the team Fiend. combo onto, onto Fakie, okay. that's a win. Possibly, but it's so tough. D-Light recovery not going to knock out just yet. Fiend trying to get Java. Oh. Fakie's trying to block oh, out. Down line, he gets them both again. Fiend keeps getting them. The down air spikes Java. He, he makes it all the way back. Fakie making sure that Java can back out of the stage. He does have a weapon. Side light, oh. and he just doesn't go for the down light read afterwards. West cover gets time with the Nair, but he gets Pogo. Pogo. Fiend on the other side. Java. West is gone. He, oh, he, oh touches. he touches. The dodge was such so good. Surviving that, does he get the revenge knockout here? Could fall with the side air. Java could go down. He's sweating. Fakie covers up the recovery. No can Fiend get the revenge knockout? He can't get it. It's the recovery. Now it's Fiend's opportunity to go for another 1v2. That's down it. light catches. Oh, oh he, he drops it. The jump. Okay, drops d Sarah Sair for, for oh, he top four. No big deal. Oh, he gets into the Haymaker, and Fakey loses because of that drop. I swear, Duke, that is going to be oh, so huge. Oh, the the neutral hits. The weapon throw forward oh. means that he has nothing. Weapon spawn comes oh. in. He stares at the swords picked up. Is Fiend insane? Oh. Oh, the side sink misses, and Fakey clutches. What should have been a game one way earlier than that. That was, whoo, that he was, that was so that much was, on that side sig. Oh, oh man. That was the biggest bet and hope it hits and he didn't. I mean, Fakie with the punish. <laughs> I don't know how many Spear D-Light Sarahs I can watch with today. <laughs> I, I we, we got more time. Uh, we, we, we got more. Got, we got more. Set's not done. That's true. Set's that's not true. done, right? It's not done yet. Oh, Fiend came so close to doing it again. Look at this. That's that side stick hits. Fiend's so good at edge guarding. That could have been it. Oh, I can't believe it. Oh, my gosh. Java and Fakie, what is that, one game away now from knocking out the South Americans That's and true. giving us three North Americans into yeah. the top four? And Wesley with the final swap, going to go over to the Orion, hoping this will be the thing to take it to game oh, number five. This is quite the switch. And we were you were talking to me about this before. You were like, okay, Hold it you. looks like he settled on the Ogrim, but why did he settle on the Ogrim? Well, it turns out, as long, I, and I was like, as long as he's got Lance in his hand, That's right. I, I, team I'm fine with it. But uh, here we go. He's brought out the Orion here to team up with Fiend oh, on the Atorian. So far, they've got a great corner guard situation here. Doing fantastic against Jabba and Fakie. Falling with the Nair, West sends him over to Fiend. Fiend tries to respond, but Fakie wake up neutral lights. And that side air means that Fiend's able to get another Sair. Nice burn from West into the neutral signature, and Fakie's off the top. And he's been the, the player that they've had the most trouble knocking out early. That's going to be a healthy lead for the blue team as Fiend comes back, hits that side air onto Fakie, making sure he gets any extra damage he can. Wesley with that dare oh, means he's, he's gone. Jabba with the side air, going to make sure Wesley falls. Yeah, Fiend now on three stocks alongside with Java. Java's spot dodge so good. Stop there though, and Fiend gets down off the top of the stage, and Fakie's tacking on damage to those sidelights. The falling stair, the weapon throw from Java. So much damage just went on to West's second stock. West comes in, picks up the lance, hits a nair. Java only one still sitting on that first stock. Fiend tries to catch a landing, but Java's hammer coming into play. Oh, and he goes for that recovery. Wes has to avoid it, and Fakie's starting to bully Fiend on the left side of the stage. That Nair hits both Fiend and Wes. Java Ooh. reaches forward with the side light. Not damaged enough for that neutral stick to knock out. And Wes now has to get back from the edge here against Java's oh, hammer. We already saw Java succeed with it once. Double edge guard opportunity. Can Fiend do it? Recovery? There's the recovery. 
Fakey's got no dodge, but he touches the stage. Nice use of the platform as it travels to the left side. Gets all the way out to the outside, right side. Java comes back in. Stock count might be even, but Wes and Fiend have the damage deficit. R neutral sig oh. from Fakey. That's a call out. The side air comes through, goes for the pogo, tries to combo into the Sare. Fiend can't make it back to the stage. He'll be sweating pretty soon. And he gets hit by the Sarah as he crosses up Java. It's now four stocks to two, Duke. And if they win this, they win it 3-1 and knock out South America at fifth. Can Wes and Fiend hold on, keep the South American dream alive? Java hitting neutralites. Fiend playing that edge guard. Nice side light nair. Fiend misses the side sig. The end sig takes Fakey down to the final stock. Team combo on the Java. He's got nothing left. Fiend goes high, hits nair. the nair. Another nair. Fiend goes to the oh, D-line side air. Java sits to the right of the Wake stage. Up. They got the team combo oh. on the Fakey. The recovery doesn't hit. Java really close to going down here. Nice down recovery. Her connection. Java almost goes off the top. Oh, nair the nair recovery. The, 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 the reverse nair in the recovery. The ground pound forces the dodge, and Fiend wasn't ready to punish it, but that was such a clutch ground, ground pound there. Fiend so close to going down here, has to hit Java, but he can't aggress. He has to rely on West to get the started. They take oh, the down Fakey, they can bring it to a game five. West out deep, the end sig with the weapon toss. West gets launched to the left side. Fiend's right there next to him. Weapon toss, trying to keep the pressure on to Fakey. They want to take him out. They want the 1v2. Oh, the stair hits Java. Getting more and more damage now. Fakey has oh. so much damage onto him. Fiend and Wes are still surviving. Double edge guard opportunity. Does Java risk it? He goes off stage. No, he fakes it. Dodges back. points. Oh, and Fiend dodges all the way back to the stage. The side sick oh. goes through it. Fakey doesn't punish it. Wes putting out Nairs. The second Nair. The down sick punish. Oh. Stop Cider. Oh. And the recovery from Fakey means that Wes and Fiend go down. And Java and Fakey secure top four here at DreamHack San Diego. Three North American teams, one European team left alive for the top four of DreamHack San Diego, Taza. What an amazing set. Wes and Fiend playing their hearts out, but Java and Fakey, I guess a little, look, a little bit bigger look hearts. Look at how long <laughs> Fakey survived on both of those stocks after going down so, so early in that game four. That was so well played by them. Bringing those highlights of game number one here. That was just such a crazy set. All in all, that was the moment where they got that momentum back where I thought Wes and Fiend had a complete control over the situation. And Java and Fakey end up taking that game one and then just never letting go as the rest of the set travels on. Yes, Fiend and Wes got that one win, but it was after a miracle side sink. Yeah, I mean, so many moments where Fiend had amazing plays where he was able to catch both of the North American team. <laughs> Wes was seriously like, I oh mean, my god. What, what other way do you react to this? Like, just gasp. This is the best spear player in the world. He's, he's my teammate. But no, Fakey ends up uh, coming out on top in this regard. And I'm telling you, this, this set delivered exactly as I was hoping for, Duke. This was one of the most exciting matches that I've seen in a very long time. It was absolutely amazing. And what a way to close out today again. Java and Fakey continuing on. They're going into the top four. Wesley and Fiend, the last South American team, is done for the day. Uh, Sheepy, I know you're rooting for Wesley. I was. I, I was literally right. sitting, once again, just sitting like right over here by the stage, literally right here, and just watching the gameplay with everyone else. And I could hear people cheering, actually for both, you know, Java and Fakey and Fiend and Wes. And I know in chat, though, there's got to be a lot of, lot of love for Fiend and Wes. And honestly, oh my god, that side signature? From Fiend? I didn't even know. On that hood <laughs> I don't think I, West, West I, didn't I, even I, know. Yeah. West so, was kind of like, what that happened? That works yeah. that way? So like, you know, I'm, oh. I don't know, I'm, I, I, congrats obviously to Java and Fakey, but I'm a little heartbroken that, you know, that was, that was the last South American team. Yeah. That was it. So yeah. literally in our top four, four to, uh, champion Sunday, excuse me, we, we, yeah, it's EU versus NA once again. Once again, That's which true. is not a bad thing, you know. I I got I love me some NA, but it's just it's just crazy how today has gone down. Hey, and when it comes to doubles with the EU, Duke and I were talking about it. this is the one game mode that they tend to to have their say, right? And this is a nice change of pace from the Winter Royale, where it was just North America and yeah. South America in that top four. Although I would have liked to be able to have all that representation. And we have the cool story now line now of Java and Fakey possibly getting their first medal at a land, and that would be crazy because we saw that they've got zero gold silvers or bronzes here and they're one placement away from getting on that podium here at dreamhack san diego that would be incredible to see 
Yeah, let's actually try to just recap the last few matches y'all were just commentating on. Just kind of see the journey that literally happened for this last set of matches for top 32 here. I mean, it, everyone, I feel like everyone well fought. I mean, these matches were close. Some of these were domination. I mean, honestly, there was a lot of back and forth. Dude, what do you what do you think of it? What do you it make was of this? A, a brutal day for a lot of people. Dog and Cutie, you got to give them so much props for the upset over Godly and Bozy, that top EU team. And then Wes and Fiend, of course, they took out Knees and Zyner, the team to take out Sandstorm and Boomy. Like, there's so many amazing matches that we got to see just moments ago. And then, of course, Meg D. Radish, they were the ones to take down Dog and Cutie. And then we finally closed out with Java Fakie beating out Wes and Fiend. Like I said, just amazing matches. Yeah, the, the Meg D. Radish matchup against Dog and Cutie was the most remarkable for me because it just was actually really confidently in favor of, of Meg D. and Radish. Yeah. Where we, we saw Dog and Cutie have such an amazing set against Godly and Fozzy, I thought I would go a little bit further. So that makes me worried for our Java fakey storyline of them possibly getting a top three because Meg D. and Radish are their opponents to be able to get in that position. But on the winner's side, like you said, that NA versus EU made an experience versus Acno and Blaze. I mean, depending on when you look at it, that's the best NA team, the winningest NA team versus the winningest EU team, at least with, with recency. Um, yeah, that's going to be incredible. It's yeah, good. Champion Sunday is going to be insane. But before we get to Champion Sunday, because day one is starting to come to an end here, y'all. So. As a kind reminder, you know, just me, Mama Sheepy looking out for y'all. Let's talk about tomorrow, okay? Tomorrow, we're actually just gonna get into our singles competition because doubles, we just flew by doubles. So tomorrow, just singles competition. You'll see some single pools happening, okay? So that's tomorrow, day two, Saturday. Uh, the competition actually begins in the arena at 12 p.m. Pacific time, so... Anybody in the San Diego area, any friends, any family members out there, look, there's still time to swing by what? and cheer for your favorite player, literally in our little Brawlhalla area right here at DreamHack San Diego. So there's still time if you want to make it out here and, and cheer some, some of your favorite players, all right? Um, but y'all, I want to hear just some final thoughts before we, we wrap up Duke. How you feeling? Uh, again, I, every time we come back to an in-person event, I'm always just so happy to be here and be with these players and get to see the competition and the way the competition evolves. It's been an impressive day. A lot of uh, intense things have happened. Of course, fantastic merch going out as well. <laughs> Got to right. remind the people Gotta at home. Got to remind about the merch. Got to make sure you pick that up. That QR code, that's, just scan it. We'll pick Do up my your time. phone. Does honestly, your yeah, honestly, okay, just how's scan it, how it. How does it work? I don't know. Just no, literally, literally just wait, 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 wait. scan the QR code. Have you ever scanned the QR code before? I, I mean, I have to like zoom oh, all you the way zoom? Okay. Thing. You don't have to uh -oh. zoom. Oh, no, Usually, you can just They're moving zoom. They're moving it. Hold on. I look, can't do I got, it. I got, I got it. Oh, wait, I got hold it. On. Wait, I got there it. There you go. Okay. Oh wait, I have to like. Put you have in to my... put in your password. I don't know but why. But look, I look, y'all. This is exclusive <laughs> merch for this event. Brahalda.com slash merch. <laughs> don't miss out. There it is. Oh. And our international friends, we got something for you. You can uh, have flat rate right shipping. There. It's right there. You got it. It's right there. I just scanned the QR code from the desk. He did it. I'm looking at a screen. It's right there. Look at it. Look at that hoodie. I'm going to get the San Diego merch right now, actually. Oh, okay. Make sure you pick it up. Tell everyone at home your credit card information. Oh, yeah, of course. That would be really helpful. And my social and everything else. Yeah, of course. Last three numbers. Address. Taza, how are you feeling about, you know, as we're wrapping up, Everything that no, went great. down today. I, I, there was a lot of moments in pools watching leading up to this where I was like, oh, if only we had infinite amount of time to stream every single yeah. thing that happened over here. But the stuff that we got to see on stream was fantastic. And the teams that we got on top four, I absolutely cannot complain about. I wanted to see made experience versus Zach Blaze for quite a long time. And then the NA matchup down here is literally two teams that I was like, I mean, you you were with me on Springs. I was kind of looking at Megadine Radish and being like, ah, Radish doesn't know what he's doing with a test gun. Now I'm like, okay, he might just be the best test gun in North America at this point. And then Java and Fakie, so close to getting that top three. I could not be more excited about what happens on Sunday. It's going to be great. Yeah, it's going to be a fantastic Sunday for sure. So, y'all, that's a wrap for day one. We saw some fantastic doubles matches today. We have our top four teams that will be competing on Championship Sunday. And y'all, this was just the first day. This is literally just the first day. We're not done yet. We'll find out who will be our final eight singles players heading into Sunday as well. We're going to see that tomorrow in the singles competition. So day two kicks off tomorrow at 3 p.m. Pacific time right here on twitch.tv slash Brawlhalla. Until then, we leave you with the sights and sounds of DreamHack San Diego, day number one. We'll see you all tomorrow. Good night, everyone.